Okay. Well, I want uh, everyone to uh, basically uh, kind of uh, understand that we are now finally going to have myself take over, but I am uh, absolutely so glad that we had our man, uh, Mr. Uh, Daniel Arola, with us. And without him, uh, none of this uh, could have been uh, made possible. And uh, he is the uh, hero, of course, uh, for the night and uh, for uh, all time in so many ways. Uh, so uh, definitely so glad to have been able to have called him and brought him in at the absolute last minute. So, uh, you know, all our love and hugs to our brother in battle, the Kali Maestro, uh, Daniel Arola of Taboo Bros 2. That's the channel he manages. Tell us a bit before I take over completely. Uh, we're just five minutes after five in Pacific Standard Time. And, of course, we're going to be switching to daylight time in all too quickly. I'll tell everybody about that. Um, so uh, don't forget uh, to tell everybody how to find Taboo Bros, too, where to go look for it. All right. Okay. Now, the uh, Taboo Bros 2 YouTube channel, that's spelled T-A-B-O-O-B-R-O-S. Two as a new Roman numeral two with I and I next to each other, but not not the number two. So Taboo Bros Two, that is a resurrection of the original Taboo Bros YouTube channel that ended up uh, getting deleted um, because it got reported a lot due to the content that was uh, that had a lot of Douglas Dietrich uh, videos in it, and uh, they weren't they were, they weren't wanting that to be seen. Yes, that's right. Uh, and that's, Yep. Yeah. And tell us more. Anything else you want to bring to our attention aside from that, please? Go ahead. Oh, man. Memories from that channel. I got to, I mean, I got to know these gang stalkers that you've been talking about on, on, on air on, th throughout the time when that, uh, when that Ted Rubio's channel existed because uh, <laughs> Richard K. Cole, you know, he would always comment, would talk shit. He would, try, he would dodge the point or whatever. So, I just ended up, you know, responding in uh, video memes, you know, really funny jokes. I just kept giving him wisecracks back, you know, not meeting him, you know, at his, uh, at his level of the game, you know, and I just, you know, just kept joking and you know, wisecracking back at him. And he just realized he wasn't getting anywhere with me. He just who, get pissed him off who, even more. Who's the young gentleman yeah. who said that you're a master troll and he meant that in the most positive sense? Tell us a little bit about your relationship with him because I, I'm not quite sure if he's a member of your dojo or not, your, your you know, Kali school that you teach. Oh, that's a... Uh, Ed, oh, Eddie Hyde. Yeah, he's, he's a fellow martial artist. I, haven't, I don't remember if I've actually met him in person. If I did, it would, might, probably might have been in the 90s or so. But... Uh, but we, we have we have uh, corresponded before um, for years on Facebook, and you know he he actually has mailed a, a DVD to me of um, of a Portuguese martial art. This is sick money martial art called Jogo do Pau, and so uh, I I still have that in my uh, I still have that on my shelf. Thanks, Eddie. I still remember that. Anyway, yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he's he's pretty cool guy. He's uh he's one of my conservative martial arts friends who's kind of uh, who's kind of uh, come into light on the. Uh, on the other side of issues. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, um, anything else to let us know before you um, kind of go mute and then we, uh, then I uh, take over? Oh yeah, yesterday I participated in um, in a stick fighting uh, gathering. It, it, it's a it's a quarterly stick fighting gathering that takes place uh, here in Houston, and. Uh, and I had skipped the last two, so for six months I haven't even moved or fought or even sparred, but I have trained and practiced on my own, but I haven't done any sparring. So I gave myself this challenge to see how, how I would uh, share out. Yeah, and yesterday, well, um, it, it, it was like, it, it was like I had, it was just like I had performed just last week. So it was like, oh, cool, I didn't really lose much. So I, was, I kind of impressed myself there. But other than that, uh, yeah, other than that, I'm going back to practice again because uh, <laughs> because I was losing a little bit of wind. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, yeah. there you go. The skills are there. Yes. Yes. Happens with time, of course. And uh, oh, yeah. glad you're keeping in shape and passing on knowledge. And uh, it's very similar to, of course, what you see at the beginning of a season 
in baseball. Uh, you've got someone who's just uh, been through all of the seasons. Uh, that's kind of Daniel Arola with his uh, martial arts school and what he brings to the young people that uh, that he uh, teaches. And um, a shout out to um, our lovely uh, individuals who are here to help us. Ramona Halitha Henry. Um, as I said, she helped me. Yeah, she helped me so much with my uh, issue I was having with my wrist in particular and my uh, arms and uh, my shoulder by sending myself a magnetized bracelet for the wrist, which uh, actually helped with that pain uh, immensely. There's no describing that. Uh, very, very much a treasured individual. I want her to know that what I'll be doing later is kind of sharing the Asian makeup uh, post that she had reshared onto my timeline, and I'll bring it to the top of my timeline by sharing it. I don't have the ability to pin it on my uh, personal friends page, but by sharing it, it'll bring it to the top of the timeline. Uh, I'll add uh, the Momo joke that I had put into the uh, entered into the thread of the commentary before so that uh, that can help in our campaign to uh, basically convert Momo to an object of fun. And uh, that will actually uh, do much to make Momo, believe it or not, a friend to children as opposed to uh, the horror, which uh, they, this, this uh, tulpa, which uh, in and of yourself, to use the gender-neutral descriptive pronoun, uh, in and of yourself, the tulpa is innocent. Uh, the tulpa is being deployed uh, by Michael Aquino and his cultists uh, in direct response to what I've done to destroy their monetization of softcore child porn on YouTube. And uh, all of that, of course, is an attempt to uh, drag my essence in through the muck. Uh, via taking a caricature of myself, contracted through a Japanese artist, and then uh, dragging it through the muck in deploying it as a weapon of terror against children. Uh, to reverse that and actually uh, make something constructive of it has been the aim of my affiliates who have not just pornographized uh, Momo for adults, but actually created wholesome uh, illustrations of her juror, and she actually is portrayed as she, so we can actually use she for this tulpa. Uh, and, uh, and, and basically, um, this has, uh, shall we say, I'll put that up in an album, the wholesome uh, illustrations, and uh, people can see how in that way she becomes an object of fun for children, whereas there's a separate aspect of her for adults. Now, the reason that this is important is because this puts her in any uh, pornographic sense, into an adult setting. And therefore, when she appears pornographized on a child setting, she's instantly recognized, and parents don't mistake her, as they did for two years, for a cartoon character that just looks odd. Momo was floating around and popping up on children's videos, spliced in for about two years, while this tulpa was sedued into the American mainstream consciousness and the consciousness of the Western world. And uh, parents just kept mistaking it for some new cartoon character or puppetoon or Muppet type character that they did not recognize. So this way they became comfortable with Momo being around the children. And then when I crashed the softcore child porn market on YouTube, then she was mobilized and deployed in high gear to destroy children and potentially their families. So all of these actions, of course, have been articulated in past transmissions by myself, the narrative, the context in which all of this took place. Everyone is advised to, uh, strongly advised to review those episodes uh, leading up to this one. And uh, with that, of course, we will um, return to narrative tonight for tonight's episode. We are going to speak of four people in particular uh, in terms of subject matter. Uh, we will go briefly again into the life of Jeff Adachi. This will not be an episode dedicated to him in content, but it will be dedicated to him in spirit. So this will be formally dedicated tonight to the memory of Jeff Adachi, something I did not do while essentially recovering from his assassination with the help of Daniel Arola, 
Justin White and Peter Moon, uh, appearing in opposite order, actually, with Peter Moon's appearance being first with myself, then Justin White's, and then Daniel Arola's. And uh, we will also speak to the subject of Chelsea Manning. Uh, we will speak to the subject of Michael Jackson. And finally, how all of that ties into Donald Trump. Those are the four main people who will be subject here tonight, along with Ju Julian Assange, uh, collaterally. Uh, but uh, mainly uh, those five individuals. You can count them on the number of one hand. And uh, so, uh, all right then. Uh, we'll get started on doing that. And I, um, uh, first, I want to acknowledge, uh, aside from uh, the wonderful help provided to myself by Ramona Halitha Henry, I'm going to acknowledge a care package that was sent to me by uh, my uh, Volcano Crown Princess of the Pacific, the stormy and tempestuous Judith, Judith Agert. And uh, her care package is wonderful, uh, loaded in particular with sweets, and hopefully that's a portent uh, for any uh, attitude she has in the future towards myself. Uh, and, um, of course, always do I maintain uh, the hope for a future appearance by her so she can address some of these specific issues. She has shared with me the fact that the uh, invasion of New Guinea by the Muslim Empire of Indonesia has intensified, uh, been ramped up with a surge, so to speak, a surge deployment, and thousands of new troops have uh, invaded New Guinea, and a uh, massive effort to exterminate the population is underway by uh, aerial deployment of phosphorus. Now, I myself cannot understand why phosphorus has not been outlawed uh, by the United Nations as a weapon of war. Um, and uh, I myself was an expert at deploying phosphorus. Uh, one of the things I can tell you about the horror of phosphorus as an element is it's a burn element. It's an element of fire. It is something that uh, uh, will, of course, set the environment aflame. Uh, if uh, a phosphorus grenade is thrown into um, your immediate environment, uh, you had better fucking pray that you're not on paved environment or uh, a laminated floor uh, that has, say, for instance, linoleum or something that you can't dig into. Because if you're in an environment in the outdoors and there's anything you can toss up into the air while digging like an animal, uh, such as sand, such as soil of any sort, any particulate matter you can toss into the air must be tossed all around immediately uh, if you've got no running option because that will um, help consume the oxygen and damper out the ability of phosphorus to do its damage. Uh, but uh, when elements just a... And by the way, I'll ask uh, Daniel to go mute at this point. If you could go mute from this point forward, Daniel, that would be deeply appreciated. If you can, um, uh, you know, if you wind up getting a, uh, just a droplet of phosphorus on yourself, um, you have to um, literally take a knife and cut that off of your flesh uh, because otherwise if you simply bandage over it, uh, you can remove that bandage hours later and the phosphorus would have burnt through uh, your limb uh, that that speck that fell upon or your torso. Uh, I mean, it'll burn its way to the other end like a bullet, uh, like a ballistic cartridge uh, that, uh, that enters one part of the body and then exit with a gaping exit wound. It's not the entry point of a bullet where the majority of damage is done. It is the exit wound. And the exit wound is going to be orders of magnitude larger than the entry wound for your average uh, ballistic projectile, your average bullet. So too with phosphorus. Phosphorus will burn right through your body. It'll burn right through the bone. It'll burn right through everything uh, that's in between. Meat, bone, flesh and tendon, everything. Will, will be burned by that phosphorus as it burns its way out the other end. Uh, so I've seen phosphorus scars on individuals. Uh, they, they are horrific. Um, they are uh, deformative for life, uh, unless, of course, extensive plastic surgery is even applicable. And, uh, of course, I got expert enough to deploy phosphorus where people thought I was just flicking my fingers. And uh, it was almost a magic trick of sorts, a optical illusion uh, where I would set people aflame. And I uh, never did that to anyone who didn't deserve it three times over. Uh, but uh, it's one of the most horrible ways on earth to die. Uh, and uh, burning alive either uh, immediately or slowly, uh, it's, it's uh, something that should be outlawed uh, as a weapon of war for deployment uh, by the United Nations. If, it's, if that's not already happened, if it has, you know, 
let me know. Uh, people can do the research for me. I do my best, of course, to uh, forget such topics. Now, of course, uh, speaking of war, it is daylight saving time tonight, which I actually was reminded of by Judith Ager, uh, bless her heart, and uh, it is, of course, wartime. Um, this is something that people can reference, a uh, old post, uh, well, a, a recent post uh, that was uh, basically a reposting of an original post by George Knight, our uh, dear brother in battle, who actually shapes tonight's narrative, who actually shapes tonight's uh, um, subject of Michael Jackson. And uh, I have reshared that post on Daylight Saving Time. And uh, basically, I will read that post to you now, uh, as writ uh, by our man George Knight. In the 1930s and 40s, we had women who were telephone operators who literally jacked into a booth circuit system phone lines to connect calls, literally physically used to jack in phone lines to connect calls. This is where we get the term and phrase, making connections. Whilst the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration uh, was extant, he established a Federal Reserve phone tax on your phone bills. Beginning of World War II, this was implemented then, initiated to discourage the population of the people from making unnecessary phone calls during wartime. This was to prevent the one from the female phone operators from being overwhelmed from the stress of millions of calls being made during time of war because family members were ringing each other constantly to check safety of their loved ones all during the Second World War. This federal tax has never been retracted since the time of cessation of prosecution of belligerent hostilities. The term wartime was changed to daylight saving time. Today, France, Britain, and the United States are still on daylight saving time. This means we are all still on wartime, and all of us still pay that tax-regulated bill on all our phone bills, including mobile bills. This is because we, the Anglo-speaking former allied nations, except for the former Soviet Union, are all still legally at war with the thousand-year Reich in exile. If you look at your phone bill, you will see that tax code and bill still on there. Most other countries don't have daylight saving time. No one wants daylight saving time. But if you are a former allied nation and you are still all paying a wartime tax on all your phone bills, uh, it's easily verified through one's own research no one is consciously aware of this, but it means Britain, France, and the United States are still in World War II, legally still prosecuting World War II under uh, purported conditions of ceasefire. Uh, this is a fact everyone is ignorant of, just like Communist China and the Nationalist Republic of China are still legally at war, and no one, under, uh, no one consciously thinks of that in the West like the Russian Federation is still legally at war with the Empire of Japan, and no one recalls that in the West. In 1945, no peace treaty was ever signed by any government diplomat from the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiter Party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Uh, you can look that up yourself. The only ceasefire was signed by military generals in the field of combat. A peace treaty between nations was never signed at any location on the continent of Europe or otherwise uh, by any governmental party member of the Third Reich because FDR did not recognize the Third Reich and the Empire of Japan, claiming them to be renegade empires, rogue regimes, uh, criminal states. So FDR said the United States would not contend with criminal elements and they must be annihilated, exterminated. He never recognized the Third Reich as the legitimate government of Germany. So the goal before his death was to exterminate them. You cannot sign a peace treaty uh, with an entity you do not recognize as the legal government of a nation, and therefore the only result can be, logically, total genocide. All of this was officially stated before by FDR himself prior his death, on the 12th of April in 1945, his assassination, actually, and uh, which, of course, he richly deserved, and it was an assassination orchestrated by the Axis powers, particularly, the, uh, most specifically, the Third Reich, uh, before Adolf Hitler uh, passed on the surface world as an uh, extant entity, himself transferring himself via the Aryan exodus into Unterland. 
uh, and all of this before Truman came to office. All of this is a fact. Uh, it's also a fact, by the way, that Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels had a massive party in the Führer bunker on the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt on his assassination and their success in that operation. Uh, so at any rate, definitely uh, very appreciative of George Knight bringing up the fact that daylight saving time is hot garbage. Yeah, we've got to get rid of it, and we've got to get rid of four fucking time zones. That's an uh, anachronism from the days of rail and railroads uh, and a much larger United States in the sense that it took much longer to get anywhere. Uh, at the time of travel, literally, it, space and time are contiguous. They're, space and time interact with each other inextricably. So when you're moving through space, you're moving through time. This is why astronauts don't age when they return to an Earth that's decades or centuries into the future. That's the uh, basis for many science fiction films, is the astronaut coming back to an entirely different planet. Well, that is why when you initiate interstellar travel, you're going to have to initiate time travel in order to maintain empire, or empires would on an interstellar level, be unable to exist. So uh, travel in space uh, at that great a distance would mean you would have to agree to rendezvous in time. So time travel and space travel at the interstellar scale would be inextricably linked. So too, in terms of time, when it takes time in a rail line uh, via a steam locomotive to get across the vastness of the American frontier, that time required four time zones. At that time, we are now in an age of instant communications and travel, which is far faster than the days of the age of rail. We do not need four fucking time zones. Two time zones in the United States are fine. East and West, and uh, eliminate daylight saving completely, get us off wartime, uh, and in essence, declare peace with the Reich, and we will be fine. Uh, of course, you have a vicious Jewish lobby uh, that wants no peace with the Reich, wants total annihilation, so they mobilize you for war against the Third Reich eternally to fight their war for them, uh, which is, of course, the Jewish pattern. Other people fighting their wars for them uh, in the days since World War II. Uh, matter of fact, it was a joke among the Jewish diaspora during the time that they declared war against the Third Reich back when Adolf Hitler became a Reich's consular. Prior to his being Fuhrer or dictator in effect, uh, he was simply legally elected Reich's consular. And so when he was elected Reich's consular, immediately the Jewish diaspora worldwide declared war on Germany on March 24th, of 1933. That's when World War II started. And the joke among the Jewish diaspora was onward Christian soldiers, because they knew it would lead ultimately uh, by trying to annihilate the German people, starve them to death uh, at the time of the Third Reich's uh, not even being formed. Uh, at that point, Weimar was still the legal government Adolf Hitler was simply consular of the Weimar system of government. And, of course, the Jewish diaspora forced the Third Reich into being because of Adolf Hitler's need to declare an unlimited state of national emergency when the Jewish diaspora forced all nations or lobbied all nations of the West to declare sanctions on Germany. And that was when Germany transitioned from Republic to Reich. That was the decisive force of circumstance that prompted Germany's transition from Republic to Reich and Adolf Hitler at that point from Reich's consular to the Führer, the leader. So uh, all of that is indeed a Jewish war. It's still a Jewish war. When you're watching Glorious Bastards, the Jews show you themselves fighting your war, but that's a psychotic fantasy. And that psychotic fantasy of the Jews fighting your war and killing all the Nazis themselves is an orgasm fantasy, a delusion, a perversion of reality, fake news that you, white trash pieces of shit, you self-loathing, German-descendant, American bastards, 
and bitches, all you pieces of shit that fill this biological landfill called North America, all you Euro rejects, all eat that shit up in your worship of the Jew and actually buy that shit. Think history happened like that. And then you're willing to go out and play your video games and kill Germans all over again. You hate yourself so much. You white trash pieces of shit hate your white background so fucking much. You hate yourselves as white people so much that you want to go out and scapegoat the German people and you go out and shoot German people in video games and annihilating them is not enough. All you want to kill are Nazi zombies. So it's not enough to just kill Germans. You have to unearth the bodies, dig them up, and kill them again. That's how fucking sick you white trash pieces of shit are. That's how much you loathe yourselves. You loathe yourself so much that when you white trash pieces of shit go on mass shootings, the overwhelming majority of people you kill normally are white people, breeding age white people. And then you say you're doing it all to make America great because your man Trump ordered it. So anyhow, that's World War II. We're still in World War II. However, the war with the Empire of Japan is over and the Empire of Japan won. Now, one of the people investigating this is Peter Moon, and Peter Moon was looking for the August 8th episode that I finally brought to him, the Nagasaki bombing episode. That's when I spoke to the Emperor's speech at length. I will republish that episode, a link there to via the subchannel Dietrichology within the Douglas Dietrich channel, and that will give other people the ability to listen to my analyzing the Emperor's speech in excruciating detail. Uh, and how that took place uh, as indicative, of course, of Japan's victory against the United States. Uh, so totally perverted by the Americans. You might say, how were they able to do that? Let me describe to you in microcosm, on a microscope slab, what happened with a Jap trash piece of shit, a race trader in the United States, how he interacted with your reality, and how you redefined that so that you have a totally different memory of this interaction. I'll do that in the next few minutes, but before I get into exactly what happened with this Japanese collaborator uh, named David Fry, I will speak to what Peter Moon said about the uh, Nagasaki bombing episode, which when I had uh, relayed the link uh, there too on the Dietrichology subchannel of the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel, he uh, had not yet reviewed it at the time he responded to my relaying him the link via private messages on Facebook, but here's what he said. Thank you. I will review. I was watching on Amazon Prime a three-hour documentary on Japanese war threats of World War II, and they started off with the firebombing balloons and talked about many things you do, say that they put their inept spin upon it. The narrator sounds like he was from the 1940s or the 1950s, but it could also be a modern attempt to neutralize what you have put out because it touches on so many points you had brought up. It is so dry, however, that it cannot compete with your data. Uh, now, by the way, a shout out as well to Jonathan Warrington, and uh, I do promise uh, to our hero, the Grand Magator, who I recommend everyone go to the Maggot channel, I do promise to get to Brexit uh, in this last coming week. We are coming up on a Brexit catastrophe, and uh, it is uh, the Brexit apocalypse is due to happen, uh, you know, March 29th, and so we're entering that last week when everybody in Britain uh, prepares for uh, a, a horrible time. Uh, so he uh, brought to my attention uh, a number of issues uh, concerning uh, various, uh, shall we say, subjects. And he brought to my attention some stuff about Alex Jones. Uh, now, the reason all of that, uh, <laughs> all of that is uh, so pertinent is because another individual told me about Alex Jones recently, feeling that he is somehow exploiting, uh, for lack of a better word, my materials. And uh, so I want to thank uh, Jonathan Warrington for joining in this campaign uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to bring this to my attention. Anyhow, he also brought to my attention a uh, Joseph uh, Wayne Matheny uh, of Chicago, Illinois, 
who uh, sold his, uh, he's a serial killer who sold his victims as barbecue. So, oh my God, there is a genuine basis for the, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise in terms of that particular uh, spin. Uh, the original, of course, uh, indi- the individual who uh, was the inspiration for Texas Chainsaw Massacre was Ed Gein. He did not, um, oh wait, he did. He did take his victims and actually turn them into kind of a venison. And uh, he, 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 he gave them free to neighbors. Uh, I, I remember um, there was this one individual I was talking to who was investigating the case as just purely academic level. Uh, it was in the criminology course at City College of San Francisco who was bringing up Ed Gein uh, saying that um, he sold uh, the meat of his victims who were all female uh, to uh, his, uh, his neighbors in, in, in the uh, area. Of course, this was a highly rural area. His neighbors were comparatively far away, uh, but nevertheless, they got from him these samples of meat that they all devoured that turned out to be his victims. Of course, he was mostly a, the ultimate transvestite. He wasn't dressing in women's clothes. He was dressing in their skins. Uh, leathering them, of course, and then uh, taking the meat and turning it into venison. Uh, I corrected him, of course, and told him, of course, that Ed Gein had never sold any of the meat. He was giving it away for free, at which point um, the person I was in conversation with insisted, well, he was building up a clientele. Uh, Well, there you go with that. Uh, So um, there's no horror that can be dispelled by that humor. (laughs) But uh, at any rate, um, so now that we've kind of made a promise to Brexit, Sometime in the very near future, in which uh, Brexit is going to dominate uh, the, a transmission, it won't be tonight. I want to give a shout out as well to the lovely Omblism. Omblism uh, has mentioned what an in- infinite loss the Jeff Adachi killing is, and uh, that a public memorial was held in San Francisco. Now, I'm very angry about this, not, not at all, but at uh, the fact that this public memorial was held, and there was really no information given out about it. Uh, and it could be the family didn't want too many people there, uh, but uh, it uh, is, I suspect, the city and county of San Francisco is covering up the assassination of Jeff Adachi and doesn't want much attention drawn to him. And uh, that, of course, brings us to Jeff Adachi uh, for the next several minutes. Uh, so, and the parallels, of course, uh, between his life and mine, uh, and of course, uh, in a very real sense, uh, my responsibility for his death in the sense that his affiliation with myself brought his assassination about. Uh, and that, of course, needs to be contextualized in the narrative of why uh, good men die, and yet it's still worthwhile with the millions of children whose life I've impacted by preempting their exploitation by the same people who were exploiting them on YouTube, uh, the bellgap.com crowd, uh, the Aquino cultists of uh, that, of course, have all joined together to give a thumbs down, all uh, five of the motherfuckers who can also fit on uh, counting the fingers in one hand. And uh, they gathered together for tonight's transmission. Uh, in uh, they, Three of them are one person. Three of them are Rose Dio, who simply uses her three Rose Dio channels to provide three thumbs down. So uh, there's only three of them when you see five. Uh, that's how they uh, multiply their appearance. So these individuals I've exposed in my latest transmission. Uh, we will continue to expose them. And, of course, they are the kinds of people that you get out of the U.S. military and the hangers-on. Uh, only one of them even claims he was in the military. Uh, that's uh, Richard K. Cole, of course. And uh, the, his real name is Randy Allen Kramer, or that's one of his aliases. And also, his actual name is Stuart Allison, or at least that was his stage name he used in, prop, like in, in pornography when he, was, uh, when he was dealing with kids. So um, all of these people will be exposed uh, constantly uh, as life goes on, and um, that's the life they chose. So um, when it comes to Jeff Adachi, let's uh, catch you up a little bit on what his life was about. And uh, now um, he does mention that uh, uh, our, our executive producer, before I go into uh, the life and times of Jeff Adachi, uh, Pavel Provara does mention that two accounts are RKC. He lacks the ability to manage three or more likely is not allowed three. So Richard K. Call has two accounts 
and uh, Amber Rose Dio has three, so all together they are five people. So yes, it's just two people then, it's just two people uh, that put the five thumbs down on uh, tonight's uh, live transmission. Uh, and uh, so they are a couple now, uh, and uh, they deserve each other. So that brings us to a far more deserving person in the positive sense, uh, Jeff Adachi. And of course, he is painfully, obviously, Japanese American one of the last Japanese Americans left in the United States, a true unicorn, uh, made him stand out like a sore thumb. And the most important thing you can understand about what it's like to be an Asian Pacific Islander American is there is no infrastructural protection for you. We'll go into protective infrastructure when we speak of the child molesters throughout this transmission. So give me just a second here to uh, grab some water. Mm. Now, although the more than 100 attorneys in Jeff Adachi's, the late public defender, Jeff Adachi's San Francisco offices, he had over 100 attorneys working for him. And all, though over 100 attorneys that worked under Jeff Adachi still appear before San Francisco's judges every day. Jeff Adachi was willing to challenge the jurors and the judiciary by name. Last September, for example, he sought to have Superior Court Judge Ethan Schulman removed from a complex murder case against a tenant's rights attorney, arguing that the judge expresses bias against Latino persons and has exhibited racial insensitivity. Now, in 2017, the year before yesteryear, Adachi took on um, local judges and the state judicial council over their opposition to eliminating California's cash bail system. He described the council as a bloated policy-making body that be totally out of touch with the people most affected by bail reform and said the judge's opposition was the height of arrogance. Nonetheless, presiding judge Garrett Wong, obviously a Chinese American, on behalf of the court, issued a statement on the death, the assassination of Jeff Adachi, that the late public defender for San Francisco was a tireless advocate for all San Franciscans and passionate in his pursuit of justice in our city and county. Now, police officers and public defenders are natural adversaries. And Adachi was happy to accept that role. Back in 2014, over 200 public defenders and their supporters held a hands up, don't shoot protest on the steps of San Francisco's criminal courthouse in reaction to police shootings all across the United States. Now, Adachi himself stated at the time, on record, that as public defenders, it be our responsibility to ensure that there be justice for all in the courts. We be here to say that our criminal justice system has no credibility when it fails to hold police officers accountable for the killing of black and brown peoples. Adachi's calls for state investigation of San Francisco municipal police officers who sent racist and homophobic texts, his exposure of officers of their stealing from rooms in residential hotels, and his charges that officers be much more likely to stop and arrest African American, one of um, very few friends on the San Francisco Police Departmental Force. Now, Adachi was a regular target in the San Francisco Police Officers Association Union newspaper, which often accused him of being anti-police. His death has not healed those rifts. Adachi himself, while among us, acknowledged 
He was all too willing to speak out when he saw something that offended the well-honed sense of justice he had built up during his decades as a public defender. Now, I can tell you just the month before last, the month before yester Menzies, after he had been sworn in for his fifth term in office, after running unopposed, he being the only elected public defender in the entire state of California, Jeff Adachi himself said that that particular day when he entered his fifth term had left him speechless, which, of course, he said, as I often do, that he never normally was. So in that sense, he and I can never stop talking. Only now I speak for he, I speak for the dead. Because that same sense of justice made Jeff Adachi a hero to the people he worked with and those he represented. Our black African-American female mayor, the mayoress of San Francisco, London Breed, issued statement on Adachi's death, and she spracketh that the public defender always stood up for those who didn't have a voice, had been ignored and overlooked, and who needed a real champion. London Breed herself was there when Adachi was sworn in in January of this year, saying she first met him at the housing project where she herself had grown up in when he was visiting black clients. The lawyers in Jeff Adachi's office always knew he had their backs. Nikki Solis, a deputy public defender, has said that Adachi was one of the most compassionate, fierce, fearless, dedicated agents for social change the city and county of San Francisco has ever seen. He broke the mold, not making decisions based on political expediency, but on simply what was right. Tal Clement, an attorney in the office, is quoted as saying that at his core, Jeff lived and breathed public defense. And he was visionary in reimagining and implementing the work that a public defender's office can do in support of justice and our indigent clients. For Adachi, the role of his office went far beyond the courtroom. And he spent years trying to keep people from ever needing a public defender. In 2009, he received the Program of the Year Award from the California Public Defenders Association for his Children of Incarcerated Parents effort designed to help provide children of a parent in prison or jail with supplies that would help them attain a better life. The Bayview MAGIC program, it was an acronym all in caps, M-A-G-I-C. That was established by Jeff Adachi, via which he helped, starting in 2004, to provide annually low-income students with enough school supplies and family services to manifest an effort in keeping them out of the juvenile justice system entirely. But it's the people in trouble who remember the help Adachi was always willing to provide. Jeff Adachi brought social workers into the public defender's office to help people getting out of prison. And he founded the Clean Slate program, which helps people expunge their criminal records where possible. Chanel Williams, a City College of San Francisco trustee, who'd be running for District 5 supervisor, called Adachi both a mentor and a friend whose offices helped her turn her life around after she became involved in the juvenile justice system for petty theft and drug offenses. I quote as she, and she says, he was always standing up for those that were trapped in the system and trapped in cycles of incarceration. For people who are low income, 
and don't have the resources. Being able to have an advocate like that was nothing short of a miracle. Jeff Adachi, I have confirmed, is survived by his wife, Mutsuku, and his daughter, Lauren. That I've sourced from the public defender's office. So I know now that he had one child. We never spoke of his children when he and I spoke. We never spoke of them because he always wanted to bring up as little as possible about his family on our secured lines of communication. Of course, no matter how secure our lines of communication were, they obviously were not secure enough. In the new cell phone that I've just been issued, I walked into the bathroom in the dark, uncomfortable enough within my environment, where I walk throughout my flat in the dark during the night when I'm sleeping and just happen to get up. And yes, there are times lately when I've had to sleep at night because I had to pay my bills in the daytime and do a number of things, such as go down to the state building in San Francisco to get my phone activated. All these things could only be done in open hours. I had to sleep during the night in order to get these the responsibilities tended to in the daytime. So there's plenty of times when I'm forced to sleep at night, which I do not normally prefer. My diurnal dysrhythmia demanding uh, for myself that I sleep through the sunlit hours on any normative basis. But times have not been normal. And when I sleep at night, I do wake up in the dark and I just go straight to the bathroom through a hallway. I have no problems navigating in the dark. When I walked into my dark bathroom, I saw that the light was on on my new cell phone for the camera, and the camera was on. Now, why they're filming a dark bathroom is beyond me, and they're welcome to watch me while I'm taking a crap or taking a leak. If that's what gets them off, such as how it is, I've lived the Truman Show all my life. This sort of thing has happened to me as long as I can remember depended on what kind of technology was available at the time, one way or another, I've been tapped. And eventually, this brought about the death of Jeff Adachi. And yet, information on services for his passing were entirely unavailable when I was checking into them on the weekend that I brought his assassination to everyone's attention. So I'm rather irritated to find the notification of his public memorial held in San Francisco, as was brought to my attention by Owen Blizon, no fault of her own. But it helps to bring about the perspective on just how hidden, how controversial he's become in death, even though he was controversy on life. His death is super sensitive enough where there was not the public dissemination of information that a normal person in his position would have had concerning rights of his passing. So that was disappointing, but at the same time, probably for the best that I not arrive, I might have encountered personally his wife and his child and that just would have been too much for myself. So I want to thank Ramona Halifa, Henry, for providing a Guardian article on the criminal justice reformer Jeff Adachi as a model for America. And we will move on from that particular topic on everyone's understanding that it wasn't enough that they killed Jeff Adachi. They tried to kill his character, tried to kill his reputation. This wasn't just a physical assassination. It was worked in tandem with a character assassination. And that's why there was an IUR, which I'm painfully familiar with as a public informant. An IUR is acronymous for an intentional unauthorized release. That was conducted by the San Francisco Police Department concerning the records of his death, in which, of course, it was exposed that he was in company of a Russian prostitute slash assassin, as she's more recognized in the underworld circles. And 
this woman known as Katarina and peddled by the media as Catalina brought about his demise. She almost certainly distracted him when he was ambushed and injected with what killed him. The syringes were taken over, of course, with her to an apartment that was not his, where a landlady registered as a Republican claimed she lent it to him so he could fuck a prostitute. And the syringes were scattered all over the apartment to incriminate him and ruin his reputation, along with cannabis-laced gummies, alcohol, and then, of course, she held the emergency respondents for three hours before he was delivered to a hospital to make certain he was dead by, I shit you not, she almost certainly engaged them in some kind of orgy to keep them occupied. By the time the police were called, of course, all of the drug regalia and paraphernalia, all of that was released intentionally in a report that prompted a protestation of hundreds of people in rain over the San Francisco Police Department intentionally sullying his name. Now, to find a silver lining in this tragedy and travesty is, of course, natural on my part as someone who must forge ahead when the man who is going to make my movie gets taken out. And the best that I can say about this, not something I would have wanted, be that, of course, this doesn't sully my relationship with the San Francisco Police Department. Because the San Francisco Police Department, in general, is not going to affiliate my name with Jeff Adachi. And therefore, the protection I receive from the San Francisco Police Department is not going to be divested. So I can count on continued support in the security realm from the San Francisco Police Department, and that's appreciated. And that relation is not going to be troubled. But that brings us to the parallels in personal experience between Jeff Adachi and his nemesis, the police, and my nemesis, the military. Jeff Adachi's expositions on the police department did not lead to the San Francisco Police Department in any way, shape, or form participating in his assassination. But they were more than happy to release information that would damn his credibility after he died. In my case, of course, the United States military has no ability to directly impact myself or attack myself. And yet, Michael Aquino personally dispatches dedicated gang stalkers to do so. So when I've dealt with these miscreants, these criminals, throughout my career as a public informant, probably the most frustrating and disgusting experience that I can have while contending with trying to expose what I do to the general public, it'd be the stupid people in the public who may as well be directly assaulting myself, asking questions that are beyond offensive. Questions like, has anyone in the military seen what you've seen? This is like someone who's been involved in the mafia, and that's exactly what I've been involved with when it came to the Asian underworld. Let's say I became a public informant exposing a Western-style mafia, like La Cosa Nostra. Let's say I was a former hitman for La Cosa Nostra, and I exposed the kind of life I led. 
And I say, oh, these people do this, they do that, bringing up, of course, all of their underworld activities. How would you feel in that position if some motherfucking idiot asked you, has anyone else ever seen in the mafia what you've seen? It's something, of course, no one else in the mafia is going to talk about because they're sworn to silence in a cult of violence, in a cult of, shall we say, murder incorporated. And I definitely know that if some former hitman in the mafia were asked such a question, he would be in awe of the idiocy involved in such a question. There is no point in asking such a question. It is offensive on the face of it. And then, of course, we have well-intentioned people like Peter Moon, an investigative author, who, of course, as far as I'm concerned, we're in the processes of initiating work together. And he, of course, is exposed in his investigation to ignorant people or malevolent people who provide him the asinine conspiracy theory that be provided to many people investigating what I've experienced that, well, there's elements in the military that are against everything that Douglas exposes. In other words, there's light workers. There's light workers in the military who want to take it back from the Aquino cult, the Aquino influence, the legacy of satanic chaplaincy. Now, that is beyond offensive as well, in its ignorance. That's like saying that when you go into a prison, which is, of course, exactly what the military is, these are people who would otherwise be in jail. Not just jail, but serious detention. Felony levels. These are people who are totally unemployable because they could never find honest work. These are criminals. So when you investigate the United States penitentiary system, just as you're going to find what Jeff Adachi stood against, innocent men who get convicted, therefore you do find good men in prison, far more of them than there should be. You're going to have good men in the military. My father was one of them. The man who raised me, my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, blessed be his name. Good men, good women, individuals. It doesn't go beyond that. There's no union of falsely convicted individuals for your United States penitentiary system. There's no representation for these individuals as a group. And yet there should be. But there be not. So too in the United States military. And to say that there's light workers orchestrating a counter response to the legacy of satanic chaplaincy in the United States military's branches of service, all of them, is like saying there's good prison gangs and there's bad prison gangs. There's light worker prison gangs. It's that ridiculous. When you go into prison, people congeal. They ethnically enclave. You're going to have all of the whites in various prison gangs similar to the Aryan Brotherhood. You're going to have all the blacks congealing, ethnically enclaving into black prison gangs. And, of course, the Latinos are the best organized of all. And for all intents and purposes, the San Francisco or excuse me, the United States penitentiary system is simply an extension of the operations of MS-13 and various other international Latin American gangs. Moving north, speaking in 
Nahuatl, the ancient Aztec language to each other behind bars. Just as the Aryan Brotherhood communicates in what they call Viking, a kind of bastardized runic. So, all of these gangs, none of them are light workers. They are just ethnically enclaved criminals of malevolent intent, gathering for their own preservation, survival, and prosperity as much as can be had within and without the prison system. There's no good prison gangs. So too in the military, there's no good factions in the military. It is a penal system for criminals, and there's no good gangs. There might be individuals in the wrong environment, and they have to prove themselves worthy of one's respect when they get out of that environment. That's the curse of being convicted falsely. Whether one is innocent or not, by the time you've spent years in prison, you are no longer what you were before you went in. You have been corrupted by the environment of necessity. So if an innocent man, a good man, be falsely convicted, when he emerges, he's going to have to prove to you he hasn't become a homosexual predator. So to a good man coming out of the military, my father proved himself worthy. Anyone you encounter from the military needs to prove themselves as well. Most of them can't and are not worthy of your respect, your time, or your sympathy. Now, all of this, of course, brings us to another post entered by George Knight about Title 38 of the U.S. Code, which is law as established by Congress, not some petty federal regulation. It is law. And that, of course, is cited whenever I bring up the fact that World War II didn't even enter legal ceasefire until... December 31st of 1946, well after the circus ceremony on the battleship Missouri. Now, George Knight posted that saying that he had been conducting reconnaissance into Belgab.com, where people go to trade their child porn and share their experiences in predation when they're not shitting and pissing all over Douglas Dietrich, dissing the D because he ruins their fun. And George Knight saw them all using racial expletives, Jap, Nip, etc., to speak about World War II and how they won it and the battleship Missouri and all this shit. And, of course, what else would they do? But what it shows us is the ultimate nature of any American, black trash, white trash, brown trash piece of shit, anyone dumb enough or malevolent enough to insist they won World War II are the same kind of people who deal in child porn. If someone says that America won World War II and a surrender ceremony was held on the battleship Missouri, they are technically, of course, breaking the law. So as I said, it's not some petty federal regulation. It's laws established by Congress, national law, that World War II did not end on the battleship Missouri. There was simply a cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities. Prior ceasefire. And ceasefire wasn't legally recognized until December 31st of 1946. And then, of course, peace treaty wasn't signed with the Empire of Japan until 1950-fucking-1 and didn't go effective until 1950-fucking-2. So when you have that level of historical denial, it goes hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly with child predation. These are the same people that exploit the military mafia and all of the people who erupt the human offal and dung that just spews out of the military machine in the trade and propagation of child porn 
Of course, these are the people who are going to be insisting America won World War II against Japan. Not only could they technically, though no one will enforce this, technically they could be arrested for saying the battleship Missouri was a legitimate ceremony, since it's illegal to say so. Title 38 is a law. It's like Holocaust denial. You could go to jail for denying the Holocaust in Europe and in Canada and the, throughout the English-speaking Commonwealth of Nations. So, too, you could technically go to jail for claiming the battleship Missouri hosted a legitimate surrender ceremony when the emperor himself was nowhere to be seen and all the Japanese representatives present had no samurai swords to turn over to the Americans. And an illegal American flag, satanic, backwards and upside down, was on display for everyone to see while this circus ceremony went on under its image. All of this renders a sick joke to even the concept that this was a legitimate surrender ceremony. And yet the American criminals who hang on that are the same people who trade and propagate child porn. It makes perfect sense. If someone comes up to you and ever even pretends the battleship Missouri ceremony is legitimate, you can bet your sweet ass they jack off to child porn. That's the kind of person who needs that kind of lie in their life because the only thing these people have is their delusion, their myth of World War II. So when it comes to this crime, the crime of claiming America won World War II, when it comes, first off, we're still legally at war with the Third Reich, and of course America lost the war to Japan, which is why America had to do away with this Department of War and establish a Department of Defense, which is why America has never been able to legally declare war ever again, because the Japanese said you will never declare war ever, ever again. And America has not. It cannot. It lost the fucking war. That's why I had to get rid of its Department of War and establish a Department of Defense. And yet the Americans project all this onto Japan and claim, oh, the Japanese can't declare war ever again. The Japanese have a Japanese self-defense force, not an Imperial Japanese Navy or Army. This is the insanity of the American mind. Reality inversion. It's the reality of the criminal. And that brings us to dedicated gang stalkers and collaborators like Pete Suzuki, the Jap trash piece of shit who initiated all the discussions about the Emperor's speech. An individual who claimed, oh, my father was there and heard the speech and said it was a surrender. When you can go to Pete Suzuki's timeline, he lists himself as P-E-A-T-E -E or some weird ass variant on the name Pete spelling. He always changes his name because, of course, he's a criminal and a piece of shit and, like Richard K. Cole, has multiple aliases. So this criminal, Pete Suzuki, changes his name Pete to Pete Hiro Suzuki. Back in the old days, he spelled Suzuki with Roman V's, Roman U's, actually, which look like V's in the anglicization. So it was like S-V-Z-V-K-I but it's the Latin U, Pete Suzuki. Here's this son of a bitch, a Jap trash collaborator with the United States. And this guy, of course, his whole family and their fortune was based on the Japanese constructed biofax simulacre, which they did not create. They're not craftsmen. They're barukamen, they're trash. They would sell or traffic such slaves Slaves, though not animate in the conventional sense, still possessive of a learning arc equivalent to that of a developmentally disabled child, possessed of the ability to be hurt, to feel pain. They would sell such to the Department of Defense and to child predators in places like Florida, where you have an entire city in Florida. You can look this up. Do your own research. There's an entire city in Florida that is home to nothing but convicted child predators. The judges, the doctors, the police, the mailmen, 
everyone in that town in Florida is a convicted pedophile. And they satiate their loss with Biofax Simulacra from Japan, traded by the family of Pete Suzuki for decades now. So the dolls for the molester's village wasn't enough for him. He's pioneering his future with cybernetic propagation of a detraconic tulpa, the Momo figure, created by a Japanese craftsman, but mobilized by Michael Aquino for monstrous purposes. And this same individual claims, oh, my father heard the emperor's speech and said it was a surrender. And if you go to his Facebook timeline, you can look at his contemporary photos. Contemporary. Not historic. Not something from his past. And his motherfucker's in his 30s. Now, like I said, I'm 53 years old in Asia, which adds a year before you're born. They count your time in the womb as life. I'm 53 years old in Asia. I'm 52 here in the United States or anywhere in the Western world. And my parents were the age of most people's grandparents. The closest thing I have to Amanda Jarris, my Maki benefactress, her grandfather was born the year my father was born, 1919, the year after the great global plague of the American Army flu that killed 100 million people worldwide and changed the course of human evolution. Those children born, like my Maki benefactress's grandfather and my own late and sainted father, the man who raised me. Those people who were born that year were immune to the flu. They were born with an innate immunity or higher level of tolerance. Or they would never have been born at all. The American Army flu changed the course of human evolution, killing more people in a single year than died in a hundred years of the Black Plague killing more in a single year than half a century of death from AIDS, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which has killed millions and millions, tens of millions throughout Africa, the third world, and the developed world as well. So these elderly people ancient, by today's standards, who heard the emperor's speech, gave birth to children at the absolute latest, like myself. When I was born, my father was pushing half a century of age himself. And of course, my mother was 45 years of age, pretty much near the age where, give it a bit longer, and she would have been postmenopausal and unable to give birth at all. So this guy says his dad was there. When he's in his 30s, he says an out-and-out lie and nobody questions it. All of the white trash pieces of shit just give him a thumbs up because he's saying something they want to hear. That's the kind of collaborator that I despise that is represented by a Jap trash piece of shit named David Fry. Another Barukaman reject who collaborated with the U.S. government. Arrested, convicted for drug abuse, was ordered to work his way out of a lifetime in prison after the three strikes law, took him off the stage as an extra on the stage of life. After he busted three times in a row, he was facing prison the rest of his life. But the government offered him a way out if he infiltrated the United States Militia Corps. Now, there's a friend of mine on Facebook named Jason Patrick. Jason Patrick was part of the occupation of the Maller National Wildlife Refuge. You know, when those badass militiamen took over an unprotected bird sanctuary. On January 2nd, in the year 2016, armed militants, armed, mind you, seized and occupied the headquarters of the Maller National Wildlife Refuge in Harney County, Oregon. Maller spelled M-A-L-H-E-U-R. And they continued to occupy it until law enforcement made a final arrest on February 11th, back in 2016. 
Now, everybody found these people laughable because of the Jap trash piece of shit who came to become their face. He got online and made certain to make them look as stupid as possible and discredit them. Got up there supporting ISIS, claiming, of course, he was pro-Hitler out of any sense of context. So everybody, first thinking they were from the Deep South, called these people y'all Qaeda. But of course, since none, none of them were from the South, which I kept pointing out, people started calling them vanilla ISIS. So social media mocked these gunmen who proclaimed themselves a self-styled militia. And in that sense, they came under a completely different type of fire than they expected. Like the way to deal with the topa, humor emasculated them, rendered them impotent. Humor rendered them powerless. People couldn't stop mailing dicks to the Oregon dummies. The armed anti-government militia that took over that Oregon wildlife sanctuary and pretty quickly began asking supporters to send them supplies got a bunch of dildos instead. I mean, most of you won't recall their list that they set out in public for what they needed. It was the one that had three different brands of cigarettes as well as both Miracle Whip and mayonnaise. Talk about a white trash joke. I mean, these are the kind of people, when you shoot them and bury them, you stuff them in a mayonnaise jar before you take them out to the backyard and dump them in a hole. Well, of course, it turns out people did begin sending them supplies. Some people sent stuff that was on the list, but most everybody else decided to send some things that weren't on the list, namely dicks, lots of different kinds of dicks, dildos, gummy dicks, you name it. Now, personally, I find that to be a thoughtful gift. Dicks are great when they're going to the people who basically are walking pricks. But, of course, that militia felt a little differently about it. Now, interestingly enough, if you were to look up on any public source, the bathroom wall of Information Intercourse, Wikipedia, who the leader was of this group, Wikipedia claims it was Ammon Bundy, who had participated in the 2014 Bundy standoff at his father's ranch in Nevada. Now, other members of the group were loosely affiliated with non-governmental militias and the sovereign citizen movement. But I can tell you, Ammon Bundy, for whatever reason being given the credit, was not the last leader of that militia. That dubious honor went to Jason Patrick. Jason Patrick was the last man in charge before everything went to shit. Uh, well, it went to shit from the beginning. It was shit from the beginning. It was a sewer of shit. But before it all went into the septic tank, Jason Patrick was the man in the final flush. All of this brought down by David Fry as the infiltrator, the Jap trash piece of shit government collaborator who ruined it from the beginning and made certain it would never get off the ground. Now, Jason Patrick is lucky to be out alive. He's lucky to be out at all. And I think he's probably happy that the credit's gone to Ammon Bundy. He probably wants this part of his life forgotten. And how it ended is where we get into the revision of history that in a microcosm reflects so perfectly World War II. That Oregon standoff ended after 41 days with a very melodramatic surrender. I'm not going to say dramatic surrender, melodramatic. The four holdouts in the armed occupation of that federal wildlife refuge in Oregon surrendered with the last protester repeatedly threatening suicide in a dramatic final phone call with mediators before he gave up. And that's when David Fry, the Jap trash piece of shit collaborator, ended the 41-day standoff by misrepresenting himself as last man standing. 
So you've got this 27-year-old Jap trash piece of shit, 27 years old at the time, named David Fry, who stayed behind for over an hour and told supporters by phone he had not agreed with the other three white guys to leave the Maller National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Oregon. And that call was broadcast live on an audio feed posted on the Internet. Now, during that phone call, Fry said, I'm actually pointing a gun at my head. I'm tired of living. Until you address my grievances, you're probably going to have to watch me be killed or kill myself. Now, he sounded alternately defiant and tormented during this rambling final call, veering from rants about the federal government to his thoughts on UFOs. He surrendered after taking a final cigarette and a cookie and asking his mediators to shout, Hallelujah! Authorities could be heard over the phone line telling him to put his hands up before the call disconnected. Harney County Sheriff Dave Ward called David Fry a very troubled young man at a news conference several hours later. Federal authorities at the time confirmed that the refuge was going to remain closed for several weeks as agents secured what was now considered a crime scene and scoured it for any other potential fugitives or explosives because the protesters had informed authorities that they had left behind booby traps but did not say whether the trip wires and other devices would trigger explosions. And materials to create explosives were indeed found on property. Now, I found that out from one official who spoke on the condition of anonymity. Now, David Fry himself, this little Jap trash piece of shit, who wound up cooperating with the federal government as a penetration agent because of his lifetime he was facing in prison with the three strikes or outlaw. He arrived at the occupation within the first week. He was not part of the original militia takeover. And at that time, he told Oregon Public Broadcasting, OPB, that he was inspired by Finicu. Now, at that time, I didn't know what the fuck Finicu was. I had never heard of it. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. And it turned out it wasn't an organization or a term that meant anything. It was a name. The name of Robert Lovoy Finicu an American spokesman for the militia group Citizens for Constitutional Freedom who had seized and occupied the Maller National Wildlife Refuge in the state of Oregon. And, of course, he was someone who ultimately died. He died, of course, because he was shot reaching for a firearm during his arrest. That's how it was reported. Now, we can go into the controversy around that some other time. But this was your typical cowboy, and I mean cowboy, who in no way, shape, or form represents anything that occurred or would somehow impact the life of David Fry. David Fry was obviously assigned on that particular man who was considered the greatest threat by the U.S. government, and that's why Finnecum was the first man to die. If he hadn't been killed by the police, David Fry was supposed to be the man to take him out by shooting him in the back, stabbing him in the back, in his sleep, doing something to him when he wasn't looking. David Fry couldn't be counted on to do that with any sense of hope of success, though those were his standing orders. So the authorities had to take out Finnecum themselves. So David Fry became instead the person to sour the public against the protesters. He became one of the first and one of the most outspoken of the protesters, posting frequent, oft-angry rants all over social media. 
So you've got this skinny, bespectacled, half Jap Ohio native from military family, of course. That's where the intelligence connections came in. Who was expressing outrage when dealing with what were obviously minor criminal offenses from his past, that if there hadn't been a three strikes law, would have been a total non-issue to anyone in the world. And in a YouTube video from September, Fry can be heard saying he refused to pay fines for smoking marijuana on a river and not wearing a life jacket before he set fire to a debt collection notice. Now, Fry's own father told OPB, the Oregon Public Broadcasting, that his son had also screamed at a police officer who had pulled him over for broken taillights. The elder Fry said his son was bullied in high school because of his Japanese heritage. Well, you know, that didn't stop men like Jeff Adachi from becoming men of accomplishment as opposed to a piece of shit. Now, one of the things I posted before I went on air was a reference column in which a wonderful lady, and I'm going to give a shout out to this wonderful woman. Uh, she's a person, of course, who's been a follower and a friend of mine on Facebook uh, forever. And uh, her name was, oh my God, uh, Rebecca. Now, I'm trying to remember her name, Rena Weatherelt. And the grandma named Rena Weatherelt, she was someone who was asking me about David Fry and what my opinion was of him on the basis of this column that metamorphosized David Fry into an American patriot hero. Now, patriotism be the last refuge of scoundrels for a reason. So what I'm going to do is read unto you in context of everything I've already told you about David Fry. I'm going to read unto you how he's remembered by the alternative right. Thanks to the influence of Daryl Hamamoto, the Aquino cultist who tried to ambush myself on my own radio program. Now, of course, he couldn't, as a Jap trash piece of shit himself, speak for David Fry because that would seem too obvious two Japs trying to support each other. So he convinced a J.R. Morphonios to write a Morphonia column glorifying David Fry. So this J.I. Morphonios, surname spelled M O R P H. O-N-I-O-S, Morphonios being an incredibly humorous name as it rhymes with phonics, kind of. It's, it, it, it's alliterative with uh, Morphony. I mean, it's, it's so fitting. And, of course, he wrote this in the End Times News Report. And the title of his column was David Fry, an American Patriot. So think about what I've just articulated in context of how David Fry was revised and revitalized for the alternative right. And here's what Morphonios wrote in his Morphonios manner. Several weeks ago, I first heard the name David Fry. I had been doing some research on Ammon Bundy and the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom. When I learned that the 27-year-old from Ohio had traveled out to join the others at the Mallor Wildlife Refuge in Oregon, I was intrigued. I ask myself the same question that now be on the mind of many other Americans. Keep in mind, this was uh, right, right after the surrender when this guy got his cookie and a cigarette. David Fry got his cookie and a cigarette and turned himself over after raving about UFOs and shit. <clears throat> this man said he asked the question, who is this fearless millennial kid who is taking on the federal government fighting to end the corruption? David is half American and half Japanese. On his paternal grandmother's side, his roots reach all the way back to the American Revolution. Major John Cessna served at Valley Forge with General George Washington. Major Cessna's daughter, Rachel, married Thomas Hemming, another patriot to have served with General Washington. Thomas and Rachel named their son Richard George Washington Hemming. 
And a heritage of patriotic service to America is also found on David Fry's paternal grandfather's side, United States Marine Corps Sergeant Isaac N. Fry, who fought in the Civil War and received a Medal of Honor, is also purported to be one of David's ancestors. His maternal mother's side of the family were samurai in the area of Hoku City in Yamaguchi Prefecture, Japan. Bush Sodomitsu was the last of the samurai in his mother's family lineage once the samurai class was eliminated during the Meiji Restoration period. One of David's great uncles, Robert Leo Hemming, a United States Marine Private First Class, was killed in action during World War II at Saipan on July 24th in 1944. David is surrounded by noble men who have done their duty to the United States of America, including his grandfather, a retired Marine Corps major, his uncle, a retired Marine Corps gunnery sergeant, his father, a retired Marine Corps gunnery sergeant, and his brother, a United States Marine Corps staff sergeant presently serving on active duty following his recent return from duty in Iraq. David Fry's bloodline includes a long line of patriots and warriors. Standing for freedom is in his DNA. This heritage leaves him little choice but to fight for what be right. His name was chosen by his father as both a biblical and American heroic namesake. While David of the Bible fought the dreaded Goliath, David Fry fights against a Goliath of his own the federal government. Fortunately, David's presence at the wildlife refuge did not end as Davy Crockett's did at the Alamo. Instead, David was able to walk out bravely with his head held high, knowing that he was the last man standing against the federal government at the refuge. As David prepared himself to depart and fearlessly submit himself to federal agents, he wondered aloud why more Americans, who see the great problems facing our country, are not taking a principled stand against tyranny. With the grip of the federal government continuing to tighten around the throats of American citizens, I cannot myself help but echo David's query. America, where are you? And when are you going to take a stand? This is the revisionist history that the alternative right misrepresents as the legacy of the little Jap trash piece of shit sniveling for a cookie and a cigarette while threatening to off himself that I expose to you as the factual narrative. That's how warped your perspective of World War II is and your perspective of the Empire of Japan during World War II be by the alternative right in America, the same people who thrive off the exploitation of children. Indeed, David Fry himself could be considered just another example of child exploitation of a little prick kid who was simply a little older than most of the boys they butt fuck. So this pathetic individual is now a hero of the alternative right. And yet when it comes to men like Jeff Adachi, they die without dissemination of information on public services for their passing. I myself can accomplish what I've done and there be no statues for me because we're not the yellow niggers who cooperate with Whitey in his exploitation of everyone else, but most particularly, is young. Now, when it came to trying to promote Momo, the caricature of myself, as the big bag of boogie girl, as I said in perfect Japanese, Pete Suzuki had wrote out, this is L, on the app calls that went out to kids. L in Japan is their version of LOL. Laugh out loud. They don't do an LLL. They just do L for laugh. So when he says this is L, that's Pete Suzuki's out. He's covering his ass so he can say it's all a joke when kids kill themselves. 
And that's why I bring your attention to the school holiday warning that was issued by Nine News out of Australia. There's no way I could get the video independently off YouTube. I couldn't extricate it from the column. So the only thing I could do was provide you a link to the column about Momo in which that Channel 9 News out of Australia was providing a school holiday warning, not about Momo, even though it's embedded into a column about Momo. It's not about Momo at all. That school holiday warning is about child predators all over the net. And the reason they had to provide that warning for Australia in particular, and when you watch that video, it's nauseating. You watch that video and you see people teaching kids how to eat shit. Now, I'm not talking about metaphorically, like, teaching kids just to take it. I'm talking about, literally, you'll see someone plucking shit off of a toilet and eating it. Telling kids, eat shit. So, why do they have to do this in Australia in particular? Issue these warnings against people who are trying to teach your kids to eat shit. Because Stephen Outram lives in Australia. And Stephen Outram, the man who sponsors all of my dedicated gang stalkers, in his allegiance to Michael Aquino, is the man behind the cyber predation. At the bottom of the well, at the bottom of the septic tank. So all of that, of course, brings us to the subjects that I'm going to have to cover concerning real, genuine government persecution and the child predation of celebrities protected by the government. Now, shout out to Garrett Mead, who I saw with us tonight. Garrett Mead said, I listened to the latest Alex Jones and Joe Rogan podcast, and it sounds like Alex Jones was using your research. I don't know. That's just what it seemed to me. Well, of course, I'm not a researcher, Garrett. I'm a public informant. I don't do research and dig things up. People who do that are just people connecting pieces of a puzzle. And more often than not, they can't get it right. They're outsiders looking in. They don't know what context to put the puzzle pieces in, so the puzzle picture they get is fragmented and distorted. I, on the other hand, am an insider looking out. And that's why it's to my attention that Alan Lilly, who will be on with myself on a transmission shortly, maybe even the next one, I'll talk to him, if not before Wednesday, then sometime before Sunday. He'll be on one of those two transmissions or the one after that. But Alan Lilly, of course, published on my timeline a post about Chelsea Manning. His editorial introduction was simply this. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Our priorities be so fucking backwards. And in response to that, our man Daniel Arola put up a meme in which he quoted myself. And I will read to you that quote. Julian Assange never leaks any information concerning Russia. I was asked by a young lady on Facebook, I don't know how they haven't closed this guy down already when he lives in a cabinet in Kensington in the Ecuadorian embassy. How can people not shut this guy down? And I said, it's because he's sponsored, supported, and secured by the Federalnaya Shmuzba Bejno Pejnosti Rosikskoy Felasi, the Russian Federal Security Service. This was clarified by a Madam King, Claire King, a hurricane survivor. She said in 2003, where she was part of an underground forum, where underworld hackers like hang out and chat, and Assange was already infamous and a chatter back then. And she said that Assange had taken a position as a covert Russian operative to avoid being prosecuted in other countries. That's why he never likes any information that would compromise the FSB the Federal Security Bureau, and that's because he's an agent thereof. And, of course, he was raised in a cult known as the family in Australia. Shanti Naikatan. And that's a Asian Indian word in Vedic for the kindly ones. It's also the name of a town on the Indian subcontinent where the cult originated, and it be formally known as the Shanti Naikatan Park Association. 
but it's really known as the Great White Brotherhood, as in white supremacist. So Julian Assange is an Australian white supremacist. He was part of a New Age group where they bleached their skin white, Michael Jackson style, bleached their hair white, and of course, they were under the leadership of a yoga instructor named Anne Hamilton Byrne. Now, I, of course, was contemptuously referencing her as a yoga instructor. That not just what she was, she was much more than that. She was a psychiatrist. So let's go a bit into this bleaching Michael Jackson style before we go into Chelsea herself and her ultimate situation she's in now because of this cult, Shetty Nikaton, the kindly ones. The family is a controversial Australian New Age group formed in the mid-1960s literally around the time I was born, under the leadership of Anne Hamilton Byrne. Her hyphenated name is Hamilton-B-Y-R-N-E. You can look her up. Around 1964, the year after my late sister was born, when Mr. Raynor Johnson was hosting regular meetings of a religious and philosophical discussion group led by Anne Hamilton Byrne at Santi Nakatan, his home at Fernie Creek in the Dandadong Ranges on the eastern outskirts of Melbourne. Also connected was a series of weekly talks he gave at the Council of Adult Education in Melbourne entitled The Macrocosm and the Microcosm. And their group purchased an adjoining property, which they named Shetanakaton Park, in 1968 and constructed the meeting hall, Shetanakaton Lodge. The group consisted of middle-class professionals. It's been estimated that a quarter were nurses and other medical personnel, and that many were recruited by Johnson, who referred them to Hamilton Byrne's Hatha Yoga classes. Now, all these members mainly lived in nearby suburbs and townships in the Dandenongs, meeting each Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday evening at Chanted Nikaton Lodge, Crowther House in Olinda, or another property in the area known as the Great White Lodge. Now, in terms of their religious claims, the family teaches an eclectic mixture of Christianity and Hinduism with other Eastern and Western religions on the principle that spiritual truths be universal. The children studied the major scriptures of these religions and also the works of fashionable gurus, including Shri Chimnoy, Meir Baba, and Rajneesh. The group had an inner circle who justified their actions by their claim to be reincarnations of the apostles of Jesus. The basis of the family's philosophy was that Anne Hamilton Byrne was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and a living God. Jesus was said to be a great master who came down to earth, and the group believed that Buddha and Krishna were other enlightened beings who similarly came down to help humanity. Hamilton Barron was regarded as being in the same category as these great spiritual teachers. One adopted daughter, Sarah Hamilton Barron, later described the group's beliefs as a hodgepodge of Christianity and Eastern mysticism. And then there was New Haven. Now, during the late 1960s and the 1970s, right after I was born, New Haven Hospital in Kew, Australia, was a private psychiatric hospital owned and managed by a Marianne Villemek, a Shanti Nikaton member. Many of Marianne's staff and attending psychiatrists all became members. Many patients at New Haven were treated with the hallucinogenic drug LSD, lysergic acid, a psychedelic. The hospital was used to recruit potential new members from among the patients and also to administer LSD to members under the direction of the Shanty Nakaton psychiatrists, John McKay and Howard Whitaker. One of the original members of the association was given LSD, electroconvulsive therapy, and two leukotomies. 
you know them in the United States as lobotomies throughout the 1960s. So members were literally surgically lobotomized to create zombie followers. Now, rest assured, that psychiatric hospital got closed down in 1992. This was around the time I was having the Presidio military base shut down. And Aquino was facing troubles all over the world. That year, a new inquest was ordered into the death of a New Haven patient from way back in 1975. After new facts emerged that his death had been due to deep sleep therapy. That inquest heard evidence concerning the use of electroconvulsive therapy. LSD, and all those other practices at New Haven. And the New Haven building, unfortunately, was later reopened as a nursing home. Although, I understand it has no connections to its previous owner or uses. But that brings us to Kai Lama. Anne Hamilton Byrne acquired 14 infants and young children between about 1968 and 1975. Some were the natural children of the members of the family. Others had been obtained through what Australians call irregular adoptions, arranged by lawyers, doctors, and social workers within the group by individuals who could bypass all the normal processes. In other words, these were child sex slaves trafficked illegally. The children's identities were changed using false birth certificates, or deed Paul, as they call it in Australia. Deed, as in the deed, a dirty deed being done, D-E-E-D, and Paul, P-O-L-L. Deed Paul enabled all these children to be given the surname Hamilton Byrne. They all legally became the children of Anne, who they were told was God. They were all dressed alike, even to the extent of their hair being uniformly dyed bleach white. The children were kept in seclusion and homeschooled at Kai Lama. This was a rural property, usually referred to as Up Top, at Taylor Bay on Lake Aldon, near the town of Aldon, Victoria, in Australia. They were told that I and Hamilton Byrne was their biological mother and knew the other adults in the group as aunties and uncles. They were denied all access to the outside world and subjected to a discipline that included frequent, very severe beatings, sometimes to the point of near death, off for little or no reason, and total starvation diets. The children were frequently dosed with psychiatric drugs, Aquino told me they were dosed with, specifically, anatensol, diazepam, haloperidol, largactyl, mogadon, serapax, stalazine, tegretol, or tofranil. The haloperidol was particularly popular because it was a placidity drug. That way, Aquino told me, the kids just took it, no matter where you stuck your cock. They took it in any orifice and didn't even really feel it. Now, in reaching adolescence, they were compelled to undergo an initiation involving a near-fatal dose of lysergic acid. While under the influence of this LSD, the child would be left in a completely black room, totally dark, alone, apart from visits by Anne Hamilton Byrne herself or one of the psychiatrists from the group. Julian Assange is a direct product of this cult recruited by Michael Aquino. He was put to use when the war was 
raging between the American Army and the Central Intelligence Agency, centered on the Pakistan and Afghanistan areas. The American Army was very angry with the CIA for its drone bombing attacks on Pakistani targets. They were upset because the CIA used army bases to launch attacks against suspected Taliban targets, even if they were inside Pakistan, and even if many civilians were killed in these attacks. The reason for the army's anger was that the CIA personnel used army bases to launch the drone attacks and even worked in army uniforms, United States army uniforms, while doing this. The senior military commands were being blamed by the Pakistani government for the killing of civilians, when in reality the United States Army had nothing to do with those particular crimes. Several pages of copies of cables to Washington's Pentagon that were leaked by Chelsea Manning exposed the fact that how sharply the Army had protested, even to levels as high as the President himself, about this and had been ordered by the officers of the executive to let the CIA do as it pleased. This went very badly with the generals, and that was when they began a clandestine war against the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, the man who held the biggest grudge against the CIA was a man who was no longer part of the Army, officially. He was Michael Aquino, and he was now in the NSA, the National Security Agency. He was consulted by the U.S. Army, and he had them use any number of tricks, but the most effective deployment was of his primary asset, Julian Assange, who was made the head of a counteroffensive. Julian Assange was Australian and considered to be a brilliant hacker, he had been arrested for getting into sensitive sites in Australia, finding other children to traffic for Michael Aquino's multi-millionaire sponsor, Stephen Outram. Because of his involvement with child trafficking, Julian Assange was sent to prison. And yet, Michael Aquino was able to bail him out for international security reasons. So from 2002 through 2006, Assange was redeployed by Michael Aquino to the University of Melbourne, where he became recruited by the United States Army DARPA program, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, in a program designed to hack into communist Chinese military computer sites. What Aquino was really trying to do was redirect the program so they could hack into the Dietrich hologram in Taiwan. Well, they couldn't do anything about Taiwan, but they were very successful with the CHICOM hacks into the Chinese communists. That's when, with DARPA assistance and support, Assange set up WikiLeaks as a vehicle for launching counterattacks against chosen army targets. Now, what was unknown to the U.S. Army was that Aquino had connected Julian Assange, through the satanic cult of Alexander Dugan, directly onto a first-person link with Vladimir Putin. So while the United States Army didn't recognize Julian Assange was a double agent working for Russia, under the satanic manipulation of Michael Aquino, Assange was assigned to work with other DARPA people, Chinese dissidents and defectors like Wang Don, Wang Yaokai, the founder of the Chinese Democratic Party, the CDP, or Zhao Chen, who had become the director of the China Internet Project at UC Berkeley, right here in my greater San Francisco Bay Area Metroplex region, the University of California at Berkeley. And then there was Rashi Nongyal Kamsetsang, a leading Tibetan exile. All of these were mobilized by Michael Aquino, especially the Tibetan, because the Tibetan, you see, wasn't your average Tibetan Buddhist. He was the Tibetan version of a Satanist, a black hat lama. When the CIA blocked any attempt to move themselves out of American army bases, 
The senior military people in the Pentagon opted to thoroughly discredit both the Central Intelligence Agency and the Department of State, whom they concluded was also blocking them under direction of the head of the Department of State at that time, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. So to discredit both the CIA and Hillary Clinton State Department, they resorted to Julian Assange and his WikiLeaks and extracted and sent to him many thousands of very sensitive secret cables. Then deals were made with major news media, and we all, now we all know that the release of these secret cables created the so-called Arab Spring, with revolts breaking out in Arab countries throughout the Middle East, as orchestrated by Michael Aquino's own co-author of his book Mind War, General Paul Valeri, a pundit on Fox News, the propaganda arm of the Trump White House. Paul Valeri said he wanted to create an American Spring, as well as an Arab Spring, because he wanted to change governments, regime change just like has had happened through his disruption of the Arab world, which was by no means accidental. In the first place, many of the dictators and their intelligence systems had the active support of the Central Intelligence Agency and the Department of State. So the United States Army was increasingly out of sorts with the state of Israel because of Israel always wanting America to fight their wars. The Americans were being forced by the state of Israel under the Barack Hussein Obama administration, into fighting a war with Iran, solely for the benefit of Israel. And the United States Army knew its troops were being systematically destroyed by fighting useless, politically motivated wars, and that this Israeli-sponsored, machinated war with Iran would finish their morale off completely. It would destroy the United States Army. So it was very clear that disrupting Israel's alliances in the Middle East the Israeli Bismarckian Concert Nation, or Concert of Nations, had to be destroyed. That was the specific goal of the Satanist, the Aquino co religionist and cultist, General Paul Vallely. They were very successful in this project. And now, almost all Central Intelligence Agency assets are destroyed. And Israel's in a very precarious strategic situation, or at least was, until the best president Israel ever had, Donald Trump, was placed into office by Vladimir Putin. But for a time being, it looked like Israel could potentially disappear off the map with the situations that took place in both Egypt and in Turkey. And the regime changes that brought about dictators in both those nation states that were no longer playing to the Jewish tomb. All of this should make it very clear unto all of you that the young Bradley Manning was an innocent pawn in a larger game and could never have found or sent on her own, she being a man at that time, his own, the tens of thousands of secret cables to anyone. Many of them never went through his intelligence station but because he was deemed an unstable and possibly suicidal person by the United States Army. It was felt that by ruthlessly tormenting him, he would commit suicide and that he could posthumously be blamed for everything, with Assange being entirely cleared of the responsibility for stealing the cables. But that brings us to today. That brings us back to the Manning, her story, her history, her story, raped so much that she decided to become female. The military is a prison. What happens to men in prison? If you're not alpha, you're bottom. Now, Bradley Manning was an example of a good man in a bad place. Bradley Manning 
simply wanted to be a clerk, simply wanted to serve in a bureaucratic position within the United States Army on behalf of his constitutional republic. When he found himself in a situation that was hell on earth, with all the big bully boys pinning him down and fucking him up the ass, Then he went and decided, I'm being raped so much as a bottom bitch. I may as well become a woman. And when he decided he was going to express himself as being female, then, of course, that was part of what the U.S. Army exploited to disadvantage him, to discredit him, to claim that, of course, this is just some transvestite with a problem who can't man up like the men who rape him do. Now, in 2010, a decade ago gone by now, Manning was convicted of leaking secret United States documents and served seven years in military prison. Not civilian, but military prison prior to being released. Now, Chelsea Manning be imprisoned again. This time for contempt of court. Misreportedly for refusal to testify for a secret grand jury against Julian Assange. That's how it's misreported. It's as misrepresented as the idealization of that jab trash piece of shit, the collaborator of the Allies, David Fry. Who, as I said, in my column under Rena Weatherald, had I met David Fry on the field of battle in World War II, one of us would have killed the other. And I know for a fact the person who would have died would not be me. So, when it comes to this misrepresentation of history, I think I'm free at this point in history to share with all of you something that will no longer be a threat to my surrogate son's security. No one is ever going to find out, not at this point in history, not for some time to come, who my surrogate son married. So no one's going to know his new last name. And of course, back when he was a girl and serving as my professional escort, he never really had a last name. His family was something he truly left behind. When I purchased her off the street, back when she was 14 years old, from her pimp so I could try to turn her over to social work authorities who had nothing to work with because she had no ID, no birth certificate, no legal background. Her biggest danger at the time was deportation, only no one knew where to. There was no nation she came from since she was born here. So the United States was stuck with her as a non-citizen paying no taxes with no past or no future. She was taken in by my underworld connections and allowed to practice her profession as a prostitute, saved up enough money ultimately for her sex affirmation surgery to become a boy around the same time that I became a public informant on revolutionary radio under the controlled opposition of Michael Aquino's buck boy Mike Ringley. Now, at that time, she began a correspondence with a public informant in prison who had become a role model, a kind of hero to many people in the alternative lifestyles movement of the lesbians, gays, queers, transgenders, bisexuals. Many people looked up to Bradley slash Chelsea Manning. Now, an interesting point here. 
When I took her off the street, the young girl who was to become my surrogate son, of course, had a handle, a first name which everybody used. It was Elizabeth. Now, over the years, as we grew to love each other, I would have married her had she not had to do what she just felt compelled to do by the condition that so many of us can never understand gender dysphoria. When she became a boy, his name became Edward. Now, if you ever look up our girl Manning, that lady wasn't always, of course, going by the name of Chelsea Elizabeth Manning when she was in the army as a man being broken into a bitch. Her name at that time was Bradley Edward Manning. So this correspondence, while our man Manning was in prison, led to him taking on my surrogate son's name and my surrogate son taking on his. An intimate enough communication where Elizabeth became Edward and Edward became Elizabeth. So I'm not lying when I say I'm a bit closer to Our Lady Chelsea than most. Chelsea is now Chelsea Elizabeth Manning, taking on the former first name of my surrogate son. That's her middle name, whereas my surrogate son took on the former middle name of Bradley Edward Manning as his first name now. And that's why this is a situation that's so close to me. When I produce the illustration, the graphic for tonight's program, depicting, representing Chelsea Manning as she is today, I've represented her with bruised and bleeding lips if you didn't notice it the first time, look at my graphic again. Look at it closely and you'll see the bruised and broken lips. Because, of course, I fear for the torture that Chelsea may suffer now, as she has historically suffered in the past. As I speakest these words unto thee, my fellow public informant, Chelsea Manning, He's in a jail cell. Former Army Intelligence Officer Chelsea Manning, who was released from prison in 2017 after serving seven years on charges of violating the Espionage Act, be back in jail. The government took Chelsea Manning into custody Friday of last week for contempt of court after she refused to testify in a closed-door grand jury hearing related to WikiLeaks, the site to which she be alleged to have sent classified documents in 2010, taken into custody on her refusal to comply with a subpoena to testify in front of a grand jury against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Now, the silence of mass media about former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning being thrown back in prison indefinitely on International Woman's Day, no less, last week, be beyond shameful. Now, WikiLeaks itself, infamously, beware Manning published the document she stole from the United States military when she was an Army private. At the time, the file she leaked and WikiLeaks published all cemented Julian Assange's reputation as this vital supporter and enabler of whistleblowing. Of course, I have exposed 
the machinations behind that and now Assange be recognized as a decidedly less idealist figure by anyone retaining but a modicum of sanity as Julian Assange himself be dementedly raging around the Ecuadorian embassy in London where he's lived since 2012 and now apparently Manning's testimony be wanted to probe Assange's pivotal role in the Democratic National Committee League though the details of that case itself be under seal now, the WikiLeaks investigation has been going on for years, and in secret. The Australian and United Kingdom governments have confirmed they were entirely unaware of this investigation's existence. Its very activities were only inadvertently revealed last year when prosecutors in the Eastern District of Alexandria accidentally disclosed that Julian Assange, an Australian holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for six fucking years, was facing unspecified sealed criminal charges in the district. It was United States Eastern District of Alexandria Judge Claude Hilton who ordered Chelsea Manny to be sent to jail immediately for contempt of court on Friday last week after a brief hearing in which Manning confirmed she would not answer questions. She told the judge she would uh, accept whatever you bring upon me. What Manning was objecting to was the secrecy of the grand jury process by insisting she had previously revealed all that she knows at her court-martial. Now, the judge was unmoved and ordered the former Army private to stay in jail until she agrees to testify or until the grand jury concludes its work. Now, Manning's attorneys have asked the judge to agree to home confinement because of health issues she has. The judge responded by saying United States Marshals could deal with her health issues. Prosecutor Tracy McCormick told the court that the marshals have assured the government her medical needs can be met. Now, in a statement before Friday's hearing, Manning said she invoked her first, fourth, and sixth amendment protections when she appeared before the grand jury in Alexandria on Wednesday of last week. She said she had already answered every substantive question during her 2013 court-martial and was prepared to face the consequences of refusing to answer questions on the same subject again. I will quote as Chelsea Manning verbatim. She said, I will not comply with this or any other grand jury imprisoning me for my refusal to answer questions only subjects me to additional punishment for my repeatedly stated ethical objections to the grand jury system. The grand jury's questions pertain to disclosures from nine years ago and took place six years after an in-depth computer forensics case in which I testified for a full day about these events. I stand by my previous public testimony. I will not participate in a secret process that I morally object to, particularly one that has been historically used to entrap and persecute activists for protected political speech. Now, Manning has already served years in prison, often in solitary confinement, and enduring treatment described as torture before being tried and convicted in a court's martial and then jailed for 35 years. Despite undergoing a sex affirmation surgery, a sex change in the vernacular, the United States Army continued to house her in an all-male prison subject again and again, to the repeated rapes she had been subjected to while serving active duty in your armed forces. Several court actions were required, many of them instigated by the sponsorship of the man who married my surrogate son before the United States Army finally agreed to a sex change operation and a switch to a female prison. After seven years of her term, the president himself, Barack Obama, commuted the remainder of her sentence. Manning's attorney, Moira Meltzer Cohen, said she believed jailing Manning be an act of cruelty given her medical issues and asserted Manning's one-bedroom apartment would be sufficient manner of confinement. Outside the courthouse, about a dozen protesters that I know of rallied in her support. And on International Women's Day weekend Friday, Manning's attorney, Moira Meltzer-Cohen, described the court's move as an act of 
cruelty. And under the Department of Justice's persecution of Manning, B, simply judicial cruelty. It deserves our full attention. Mostly because this is not her first time in a United States prison. Chelsea Manning spent nearly seven years in American confinement. First awaiting trial and then post-conviction after a guilty plea on 22 counts relating to leaking material to WikiLeaks. And all too often, we brush past that fact as a mere statement, a sentence of biography, or a background trivia. Let's dwell on it for a moment. From the release of the first material leaked by Chelsea Manning as Bradley in 2010, we as the world's public got an unprecedented view of the United States military and foreign affairs. You all saw what people asked me. Did anyone else see what you saw in the U.S. military? Yeah, there was a young man being raped repeatedly who saw what I saw. And he released what I saw in a video titled Collateral Murder. Where the rest of you general butt fucks in the general public could finally watch firsthand both the shocking callousness and the casualness of the crew of a United States armored helicopter, armed and armored, a U.S. Apache as it gunned down a group of suspected militants, which included two Reuters journalists who were killed in the attack intentionally so they could not report on the U.S. military's atrocities. And minutes later, we see the same crew of the same armed and armored helicopter Apache launch a Hellfire missile against the home without even bothering to wait for a pedestrian couple, a mother and her child, simply walking near the house to pass out of range. And then you, the general public, asking if anyone else ever saw what I saw in the military mafia, were confronted with material in nearly 90,000 leaked documents from the Afghan conflict, revealing similar abuses on a far larger scale, including even the existence of Aquino's own Task Force 373, a satanic death squad revealed to have killed civilians and even Afghan police officers on its mission. A similar cache of documents from Iraq, this time nearly 400,000 of them, revealed the huge civilian death toll of United States operations in country shedding new light on so-called escalation of force incidents, a military euphemism for checkpoint shootings, and oh, so much more. Over 250,000 United States diplomatic cables showing how the United States used its soft power overseas, revealing corruption amongst U.S. allied governments, and how the United States spies on its allies as enthusiastically as its enemies. Middle Eastern power plays, and all the more, that caused open rebellion throughout Northern Africa and Southwest Asia in what became known as Arab Spring. And a final cache of documents relating to Guantanamo Bay showed what a hollow lie claims be that only the worst of the worst were sent there, detailing how senile men suffering Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease, literal Alzheimer's in their 80s, were dispatched to Guantanamo Bay, along with taxi drivers and other blameless civilians who found themselves shipped halfway around the world, abducted from their native lands, and incarcerated without trial to be ritually abused in satanic fashion, inclusive sodomy and oral rape on a daily basis, multiple times a day. For revealing these things to the world, which the United States government has repeatedly publicly acknowledged caused no physical harm to anyone in the U.S. military itself, was never a threat to forces in the field because it was not militarily relevant information when you expose atrocities against civilians and satanic ritual against infants and the mothers who died protecting the children. Sometimes ripped from their bellies by bayonet. 
For this, Chelsea Manning spent nearly seven years in jail. Until Barack Hussein Obama commuted her sentence as one of his presidency's final acts. And now she'd be back there again. This time, she'd be in prison for refusing to testify at a grand jury hearing, clearly intended at seeking prosecution of Julian Assange and possibly others involved in WikiLeaks for its work publishing those cables I've just articulated. Only someone blinkered by the minutiae of legal procedure, which technically allows such incarcerations to compel testimony, could fail to see the staggering injustice at play here. Manning be being persecuted for needlessly, for failing to play a part in a show trial to a grand jury which does have no need whatsoever of her testimony. Julian Assange, be, as has been publicly stated in outlets across the world, a terrible housemate, an egotistical prick, and a misogynist who deserves to face proper judicial procedure, as he should have in Sweden. And Julian Assange also be, when it comes to covering his ass legally, a complete and total idiot. If the United States wants to prosecute Assange, they do not need Chelsea Manning's testimony to attempt it. They have her electronic chat logs with Adrian Lamo. Yes, that's his name, L-A-M-O. And Lamo be the so-called journalist who turned her in to the authorities. As well, the United States government have their own records from that investigation. They have Chelsea Manning's extensive testimony from her 2013 courts martial. They have the evidence of a WikiLeaks volunteer close to Assange who became a paid FBI informant. Thanks to the running habit of WikiLeaks sources to end up caught by authorities, they even have records of Assange working with hackers in 2012 to connect to a server being operated by the FBI itself. Dragging Chelsea Manning in front of a grand jury, then, be simply prosecutorial overreach. An overzealous and vindictive act aiming to punish her again for an act which many rightly see as one of heroism. And one which even its most ardent critic could not call a selfish or violent crime. But the whole prosecution be a dangerous one. You do not need to be an admirer of Julian Assange to believe pursuing him in this way be a challenge to a free press and a free society. Indeed, that's the exact perspective that the Department of Justice and its then Attorney General Eric Holder took when this prosecution was last active. Seeing no way to prosecute Assange without opening the door to prosecute The Guardian, The New York Times, and others involved in publishing the Manning leaks, the prosecution was shuttered. The threat to the freedom of the press, protected by the Constitution itself, was too great. Why? Under Putinista puppet President Donald Trump, then, has it been reopened? It'd be impossible not to conclude that the very consequence the Obama administration feared be precisely the one the Trump White House wants. The president himself, Donald Trump, hardly a friend to the free press, now threatens its existence in a way far more consequential than temporarily throwing out a loudmouth correspondent from a press room. Pursuit of Julian Assange in this manner would be the act of a thuggish and vindictive government and a banner moment in the decline of United States press freedom. Needlessly jailing Chelsea Manning in the pursuit of that show us just how small the leaders of the United States have become. So Chelsea Manning be in prison and the United States media will come to regret not making this bigger news. Now, why exactly, really, in light of all of the misrepresentations of history that I presented unto you, why, really, factually, it's Chelsea Manning. Why was she fighting her grand jury subpoena? Because she was showing how federal grand juries be unaccountable tools of repression. Chelsea Manning was subpoenaed to appear before a federal grand jury and give testimony on March 5th this year, just a work week ago. As a public informant, she filed a motion to quash the subpoena. And as such, she risked, just by doing that, 
just by that act alone, incarceration under the coercive operations of the federal grand jury system. For Manning, the threat of further imprisonment be, as I've articulated, a most particularly brutal one. Because beginning in 2010, when she was arrested, court-martialed, in prison, and tortured for exposing some of the worst crimes and brutalities of the Iraq and Afghan wars, not to be released until 2017. From that moment forward, she was subjected to degradation and abuse, forced to sleep naked, entirely naked, because they said she would use her own underwear to hang herself or kill herself. She was allowed no clothes, and she was allowed no blanket because they felt she could hide something by which she could kill herself under blanket. So she slept totally naked in bed every night with no blanket cover and was forced to be naked throughout the day amongst the company of men who allowed their own clothes and their own dignity were allowed to brutalize and rape her at will for seven years. Given the secrecy of federal grand jury procedures, we cannot know with any certainty to which potential case the subpoena even pertained or what Manning would have been asked. But since it was issued in the Eastern District of Virginia, we can make the informed speculation that it related to inadvertently disclosed charges filed under seal against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in that same district. The New York Times has reported that there were multiple reasons to believe that the subpoena be related to the investigation of Mr. Assange, including the district where the subpoena was issued and the assistant United States director or attorney that requested the subpoena who himself be tied to the Assange prosecution. And another Assange associate, David House, told the Washington Post that he testified before the grand jury as well. House himself said it was all related to disclosures around the war logs, this being a reference to the Iraq war documents that Manning released and WikiLeaks published. But Chelsea Manning's decision to fight her subpoena, however, be no question of protecting Julian Assange. I can tell you this. Chelsea Manning being a pen pal at the absolute least to my own surrogate son, I can tell you in utmost confidence that Manning knows Julian Assange to be a satanic cultist and a villain on the world stage. So Manning's decision to fight her subpoena be in no way, shape, or form an intent to protect this son of a bitch. Nor was it to obstruct valid government investigations into federal crimes. Chelsea Manning's challenge is an act of resistance against government repression and in defense of a free press. It should go as San saying that there were the grand jury related to the prosecution of Assange for revealing government secrets. With this, so this would have profound implications for the First Amendment and the media, which the Trump administration has consistently demonized and threatened. So the decision to subpoena Chelsea Manning in itself should be seen as a punitive act from a hostile administration. President Donald Trump himself has made clear his desire to see the public informant behind bars. Within the first days of his presidency, Donald Trump tweeted that Chelsea Manning was an ungrateful traitor who should never have been released from prison. With a grand jury subpoena, the government has found a way to expose the public informant to reincarceration. Therefore, in that brief statement released by her support committee, Manning herself has said, and I quote as she verbatim, I object strenuously to this subpoena and to the grand jury process in general. We've seen this power abused countless times to target political speech. I have nothing to contribute to this case, and I resent being forced to endanger myself by participating in this predatory practice. Now, as a former Department of Defense research librarian, which my dedicated gang stalkers, as in assigned, not dedicated in terms of any just cause, but assigned and paid for by the pedo predatory Stephen Outrim in the name of his personal god, Michael Aquino. I can tell you that despite whatever they say 
I did work for the federal government. And you know I know my stuff. More than officially recognized bureaucrats could ever tell you. I can assure you as a former Department of Defense military research librarian that federal grand juries are some of the blackest boxes in the judicial system. Closed to the press, the public, and even attorneys for those who have been subpoenaed. The process be ripe for nefarious state abuse. For decades, federal grand juries have been abused to investigate and intimidate activist communities. From the late 19th century labor movement to the Puerto Rican independence movement and black liberationists of the last century to environmentalists, anarchists, and indigenous rights fighters more recently in this century. And I've lived through two centuries, the 20th into the 21st. I am a living embodiment of history myself. And I say as unto the prosecutors and other authorities, deploy grand juries to map out political affiliations while sowing paranoia and discord. It be impossible to see the subpoenaing of Chelsea Manning, who gave exhaustive testimony at her courts martial and took full personal responsibility for her leaks, as anything but punitive. And the consequences for grand jury resistance be so serious as to be nigh indescribable. Individuals who refuse to cooperate can be held in civil contempt by a court and imprisoned for up to 18 months, the length of the grand jury. It's the sort of incarceration, like lengthy pretrial detention, that give us lie to the notion that our justice system runs on due process and just punishment. Facing no criminal charges, a witness should not, by law, be punitively imprisoned for refusal to comply. Yet that's exactly how resisting a grand jury can play out. Grand jury resistors be jailed for contempt on the explicit grounds of coercion. If they agree to talk, they're released. Or if it can be evidenced that they will never talk and the coercive grounds for imprisonment be undermined, the jailing be shown to be purely punitive and a judge can be compelled to order their release. Now, civil rights attorney Moira Meltzer Cohen, who be representing Manning in her effort to quash the subpoena, has stated, while the federal grand jury purports to be a simple mechanism for investigating criminal offenses, it can be, and historically has been, used by prosecutors to gather intelligence to which they are not entitled, for example, about lawful and constitutionally protected political activity. So there be the grimace of ironies, most ultimately in Manning's case, that the purported purpose of a federal grand jury be to act as a safeguard from the improper motivations of government. We need not support Assange personally to understand that his prosecution for publishing Manning's leaks would expose news organs who also publish the documents, like The Guardian, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, to the same liability. The precedent that could be set for state repression of journalism is beyond description. I cannot even go there. It's impossible to see the end point. Your free press will die. You will be under Donald Trump forever. Manning's challenge to the grand jury subpoena thus exposes that, as shown during her court's martial, the whistleblower, the public informant, that she be, understands the monumental First Amendment issues at stake in the prosecution of those who would expose government wrongdoing. In statement, Manning Support Committee, that goes by the hashtag Chelsea Resists, I will quote as they verbatim, they say, Chelsea gave voluminous testimony during her court-martial. She has stood by the truth of her prior statements, and there be no legitimate purpose to having her rehash them before a hostile grand jury. By employing these tactics against her, the government be using a roundabout method to further punish Chelsea for her past actions, adding to the seven years of trauma, imprisonment, and torture she has already endured. The fact that it is Chelsea Manning who must once again bear the weight of the government against herself and risk more jail time 
be a stinging injustice for an activist who has already endured so much for exposing vital and damning truths. And that, of course, brings us back to Trump and WikiLeaks. As Michael Cohen has exposed, Trump had advance notice on WikiLeaks email release per the Democratic National Committee. Though Cohen be blasted by House Republicans as a liar, Trump's longtime fixer suspects, but cannot prove, so they claim, collusion with Russia. Now, Michael Cohen testified before Congress on Wednesday, February 27th, making an explosive series of assertions based on his work as President Donald Trump's former personal lawyer, all while facing scrutiny over his own repeated past lies. Now, once a person lies, they claim he's always a liar. That's how Michael Jackson's defenders and attorneys are portraying his case against the documentary exposing he. Now, among Cohen's assertions that Trump was involved in other catch-and-kill agreements in addition to the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, that Trump reimbursed Cohen for these hush money payments, that Trump himself was aware of the infamous 2016 Trump Tower meeting between campaign officials, including his own son and son-in-law and Russians. Cohen, at one point during the hearing, said, people who follow Mr. Trump blindly will suffer the same consequences I'm suffering now, falling into the pit of his bottomless corruption. Now, all of Cohen's testimony is plausible, and not a word of it has ever been contradicted, let alone refuted. And we've got Donald Trump's longtime personal attorney and fixer telling Congress that Trump had advance notice of damaging emails obtained by Russian intelligence operatives and published by WikiLeaks in the run-up to the 2016 election. All coming forth during a wide-ranging testimony before the House Oversight Committee in which Cohen offered a detailed account of his role in the Trump Organization, providing evidence that may yet leave Trump exposed to additional legal jeopardy. Willis also providing additional ammunition to the White House Democrats, the House Democrats, I mean to say, considering, of course, impeaching the president. And Cohen's long-awaited testimony came as Trump was having dinner with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Vietnam, where the two men were meeting in a high-stakes attempt to make progress on last year's vaguely worded declaration to rid the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. And while Cohen's testimony offered some new details about Trump's knowledge of the Russian campaign to meddle in the 2016 presidential election, partisan wrangling dominated much of Cohen's appearance, with Republicans attempting to undermine Cohen's credibility by branding him as an inveterate liar. Now, in his most detailed accounting to date of the Trump camp's ties to Russia, Cohen exposed that Trump oversaw an initiative to build a Trump-branded tower in Moscow well into the 2016 campaign. Cohen also said Trump was tipped off by the political operative Roger Stone that WikiLeaks was about to dump damaging emails stolen from Democratic political operatives and that the president may have been forewarned about a 2016 meeting between his son Donald Trump Jr. and a Russian attorney promising damaging information about then-Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now, despite being under a gag order imposed as part of his trial on obstruction of justice charges, Roger Stone disputed Cohen's account in a statement to reporters. See, because he's Trump's butt boy, he's allowed to speak. But they take someone like Chelsea and they put her in jail. Roger Stone runs free as a cockroach. And Cohen, who of course is in prison, said he had no evidence to indicate that the Trump campaign had colluded with the Kremlin effort to meddle in the election, but he knew that was the case. Now, in the summer of 2017, when reports emerged that Trump campaign officials had met with a Russian attorney offering damaging information on Clinton, Cohen confirmed that he recalled an unusual incident from June of the year before 
when the meeting took place. Donald Trump Jr. walked behind his father's desk. And when he was behind that desk, Cohen recalls that in a low voice, Donnie Jr. said, the meeting is all set. And Trump responded, okay, good. Let me know. And Cohen says that interaction was indicative that Trump was aware of the meeting ahead of time, noting that nothing of significance happened in the Trump family business without Trump approval from the Donald himself. So the Trump Tower meeting with the Russian attorney, Natalia Veselnitskaya, and the question of whether the president had any advanced knowledge thereof has become the focus of special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. Trump told Mueller that he did not know about the meeting ahead of time. Now, Cohen freely discussed most aspects of his work on behalf of the Trump organization, yet he's remained mum on his recent communications with Trump and says that the communications are the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation by prosecutors in New York. So Cohen asserts he's aware of additional illegal conduct by the president, but that he cannot provide details about that behavior on basis ongoing investigation. Which be why Cohen has pleaded guilty to campaign finance violations, lying to Congress, and tax fraud charges in the Southern District of New York, and why he'd be cooperating with prosecutors. His testimony on Wednesday of last week provided the most concrete evidence to date that prosecutors in New York are continuing their investigation of Trump's business activities and those of his lieutenants. Now, Cohen has long been a pivotal figure in understanding the bizarre relationship between the Kremlin and Trump world. The dossier assembled during the campaign by the former British spy Christopher Steele alleged that Cohen traveled to Prague to meet with Russian intelligence operatives. But Cohen denied on Wednesday that he had ever been in the capital of the Czech Republic, from whence, of course, sources my own executive producer, Pavel Pravara. Instead, Cohen has described the proposed real estate project in Moscow as a potentially massive windfall for the Trump organization, and has testified that Trump asked his lawyers about the project half a dozen times between January and June of 2016, whereas Trump has repeatedly said that he had no business projects in Russia while he was running for president. Now, lawmakers have also delved into Trump's payments of hush money to women with whom he had affairs, payments that Cohen helped arrange. Cohen provided a copy of a $35,000 check signed by Trump himself Well, president, that partially reimbursed Cohen for paying off one of the women. Another $35,000 check provided by Cohen was signed by Donald Trump Jr. So Wednesday of last week, Cohen sought to rehabilitate his shattered reputation by coming clean. But Republicans abused much of the hearing to undermine Cohen's credibility as a witness, pointing out that he has pleaded guilty to lying to Congress, and lambasting he for his consulting work on behalf of foreign companies. But Cohen gamely sparred with his Republican critics and offered a warning for the president's defenders, saying, the more people that follow Mr. Trump, as I did blindly, are going to suffer the same consequences that I'd be suffering now. So while the drama played out on Capitol Hill, Trump was in Hanoi, for his second summit, Kim, and at dinner with the North Korean leader, the president was asked by a reporter if he had any reaction to Cohen's testimony, and Trump simply shook his head. But this all goes back to WikiLeaks being a Russian front. So you've got this putative transparency group serving as a connection between Moscow and your puppet president's associates, that's becoming ever clearer. Now, then-presidential candidate Donald Trump, back in October of 2016, he actually went on record before a crowd in Kinston, North Carolina, saying, 
You know, they like to say every time WikiLeaks comes out, they say this is a conspiracy between Donald Trump and Russia. Now, that idea at the time was considered self-evidently ridiculous with all the Republicans saying, give me a break. And yet, here we are, barely two years later, and the fact of WikiLeaks serving as a medium for Russia to boost the Trump campaign is no longer plausible. It's pretty much accepted as entirely probable. Now, I know it for a fact, but for some time, Everyone else knows there's been substantial evidence of Russia's involvement in attempts to influence the 2016 presidential election and to hurt the Democrat Hillary Clinton's presidential bid from an elaborate trolling and astroturfing operation to simple theft of emails and outright hacking. But until recently, the connection between those Russian efforts and Trump allies has remained somewhat obscure and even speculative to the taxpaying electorate. But recent developments have started to flesh out the picture. Russia used WikiLeaks as a conduit, witting and malevolent, entirely knowing in what they did. And WikiLeaks, in turn, has all too evidently been in touch with Trump allies. The key remaining questions be what WikiLeaks knew and what Trump himself knew. And to me... Those are rhetorical. Now, according to a draft document from Special Counsel Robert Mueller's team, which be investigating Russian interference in the election itself, the reactionary author Jerome Corsi, regular guest on Coast to Coast AM under the Satanist pundit, Mr. George Nori, a keno cultist to the bone, publishing books like Worker in the Light, which would more appropriately be entitled Slacker in the Dark, books that never sell, so undersold that he gives them out for free on Coast to Coast. His friend Jerome Corsi tipped off Roger Stone, another Trump friend and former political advisor, that WikiLeaks would release a swash of emails hacked from Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. That kid, the tip came in August, and it was weeks before the October release. Jerome Corsi himself has provided the document to NBC News and then several other news organizations. And still, as per his practice, Mueller has not commented. But according to this document, Stone, who be identified as person number one, wrote to Corsi in late July 2016, telling him to get to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Assange had already been holed up for years, and obtained the Clinton emails that WikiLeaks had. And that document exposes that Corsi forwarded the note to an individual identified as Ted Malloch, surname spelled M-A-L-L-O-C-H, a Trump ally, who has also been interviewed by the special counsel's team. And per the document, of course, he replied to Stone in August. Mm. Now, I quote is Jerome Corsi in his response verbatim, wherein he says, Word is, friend and embassy plans two more dumps, one shortly after I'm back, second in October. Impact plan to be very damaging. Time to let more than Podesta to be exposed as in bed with the enemy if they not ready to drop Hillary Rodham Clinton, whom he refers to as HRC. That appears to be the game hackers are now about. Would not hurt to start suggesting HRC old, memory bad, has stroke. Neither he nor she well. I expect that much of the next dump focus setting stage for Clinton Foundation debacle. So here we have admission that they are spreading absolute bullshit that Hillary Rodham Clinton is somehow sick, which is so pervasive, so universal, that I've got actual Facebook friends who are very supportive to myself who are still buying into this shit. Even Peter Moon is buying into the shit that Hillary Rodham Clinton 
has CJD, Troisfeld Jacob disease, otherwise known as Mad Cow. And by that point, we're going beyond senile dementia into outright zombie condition, which is so preposterous. It's beyond even dignifying with a response. So what I have to emphasize to either Peter Moon, a great man otherwise, of course, or any of my friends on Facebook like Gregory Straussbaugh, great guy, what I have to emphasize under them is what is the point of this when Hillary Rodham Clinton has already confirmed she is not going to be running for office again? That this loss, wherein she won the popular vote by an overwhelming landslide, one of the greatest landslides of political victory in American history, no less, fell over three million popular votes, only to lose because of the Electoral College, which should have been done away with, which should never have been established. She's been so devastated and demotivated by that. She is not running again. Why are you people even concerned with propagation and promotion of this absolute bullshit? Turning a sewer of shit about her health. An info sewer that you guys are digging through. Stop playing with shit. You're going to catch ringworm. So... When it comes to this, there is no point for what these men are buying into. And it has to do with the same kind of logic as the character assassination of Jeff Adachi. It's not enough to physically kill a person. You've got to destroy their legacy. It's not enough that they hacked a puppet into the presidency when Hillary Rodham Clinton should legitimately be your president. They have to destroy her while she's still alive by destroying any capability of anyone to have confidence in her just as an individual, as part of their desire to destroy all women and defame all the female gender. All of this is so parallel to the attack that Richard K. Cole as Gunner 65 made against my former executrix producer, Laura Lee Solomon, who after two suicide attempts and her severance with myself completely, Richard K. Cole was still attacking on YouTube because he wasn't satisfied that her suicide attempts had failed. He kept saying, why don't you try killing yourself again, cunt? Come on, bitch. Where's your balls? Drop some balls, bitch. Kill yourself again. Make it work this time. That's the Marine Corps man for you. Oh, yeah. Never give up. If you were in the Marine Corps, go fuck yourself. That's the kind of faggotry that produced David Fry, and you saw what a Jap trash piece of shit he was. That's the kind of shit that produces white trash, like little dicky cunt Cole attacking women when they're down. The same man who bragged on Belgab.com about poisoning on killing all her cats. This is what Aquino is left with. And since Aquino couldn't take over a first world developed nation like the United States, Aquino was left installing puppets in a shithole sewer of white trash turds called motherless russia and motherless fucking russia be brazenly behind the hacks into computers at the democratic national committee as well as a phishing operation that penetrated podesta's email account private sector investigators hired by the democratic national committee concluded that russia was behind the 2016 hacking Later, a new report released by the Director of National Intelligence reached the same conclusion. Now, it took 
until July of 2018 to get an indictment from Mueller's team offering the most detailed accounting of why Russian intelligence was the culprit for the hacks, detailing how Russia passed the emails to WikiLeaks through a persona called Lucifer 2.0, a play on Golgotha in Port Monta with Lucifer, G-U-C-C-I-F-E-R, a regular alias online of Michael Aquino. And still no trial has been held. But that brings us back to Corsi himself. Corsi told Mueller's team that he had not gotten in touch with Assange, which the document itself exposes. The document I quoted exposes him in a lie, and that constitutes lying to investigators, a federal crime. Of course, he told investigators that he understood Stone to be in touch with senior members of the Trump campaign. And Stone, this longtime political operative, initially a member of the Trump presidential campaign before he departed in the summer of 2015, that same Stone remained in touch with the Trump camp. And his friend and former business partner, Paul Manafort, served as Trump's campaign chairman during the summer of 2016. Manafort signing a plea agreement with Mueller's team in September. But the special counsel, in a filing last week, stated that Manafort had violated the agreement by continuing to lie to investigators. Which is the claim that Manafort, of course, denies. And yet, it's all these lies the obvious has upheld. WikiLeaks awareness in receiving hacked emails from Russian agents. Now, Julian Assange, long denying Russia as the source, instead throws out an Aquino psyop tactic of disinformation to distract by implying baselessly that Seth Rich, a DNC, a Democratic National Committee employee, whose 2016 murder in Washington remains unsolved. He claims Seth Mitch was the source of these leaks from the Democratic National Committee. Now, the reason Assange does that is because he's directly operating under orders of Michael Aquino and Vladimir Putin, respectively, because Vladimir Putin and Michael Aquino cooperated on the assassination of Seth Rich for no other reason than that he would be used as the fictitious source by Julian Assange because in his death he could no longer speak for himself. Imagine being killed for no other reason than that. That's how much life means to the satanic cabal that runs your American empire by your puppet president installed by Vladimir Putin who be but a puppet of Michael Aquino. And Assange himself has a long relationship with Russia, sharing contempt for the government of the United States, and especially Hillary Clinton, with the Kremlin, for whom he operates. And even while Russia's authoritarianism and suppression of free expression be obviously at odds with WikiLeaks' stated principle, it's been so noted in a New Yorker profile published in 2017 by Rafi Kachaldurian, that Julian Assange has tended to view Russia as this great counterweight to American empire. And the New York Times concluded in August of 2016 that WikiLeaks' actions benefit Russia and only Russia. Not to mention that Assange himself hosted a show on RT, Russia Today, the Kremlin-affiliated propaganda network. So Assange himself is a paid propagandist for the Russian media machine. For those who deny Julian Assange is a Russian asset, it's the same as those who deny that Michael Aquino is a Satanist or that Michael Jackson 
Be a pedo predator. It's at that same level of reflexive reality denial that we'll be dealing with that phenomenon throughout this transmission. Now, just last week or the week before, The Guardian reported that Manafort had visited Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London in March of 2016, around the time he joined the Trump campaign. Now, Assange originally entered the Ecuadorian embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden on sex crime charges. So let's not forget, he's a sex predator. And even after those charges were dropped, Assange has refused to leave. Asserting he's worried the United States would have him arrested and extradited. Now, over the more than six years of his residency, Assange's relationship with Ecuador has completely frayed. That country rightfully cut off his internet assets late in the 2016 election due to his interference in American politics. So more recently, Assange has sued Ecuador, supposedly for violating his human rights by cutting off communication. But, of course, a recent development in the United States has buttressed Assange's fears via that inadvertent disclosure in a completely unrelated case wherein a federal prosecutor wrote that Assange had been indicted under seal. Now, the United States government asserts Assange's name was incorrectly placed in the filing. And it's still not yet clear what Assange might be charged with or whether the charges would stem from Mueller's probe or something else. Now, while this has been personally catastrophic for Chelsea Manning and will be universally catastrophic for all freedom of press, the more immediately consequential questions be what Trump knew about the back channel of the WikiLeaks and when he knew it. Now, Roger Stone himself has repeatedly changed his story to authorities about his communications with both WikiLeaks and Trump campaign officials. And Roger Stone has also pushed the Seth Rich conspiracy theory based on assassination conducted by the Aquino cult in direct combined operations with the Russian Federal Security Bureau. Now, Trump told Mueller in written answers, written answers to questions that Stone never told him about the talks with WikiLeaks. But, of course, there were other channels. George Papadopoulos, a Trump campaign foreign policy aide, was told that Russia possessed emails that would be damaging to the Clinton campaign. Manafort, Donald Trump Jr., and Jared Kushner did indeed inarguably incontrovertibly meet with a Russian attorney in June of 2016 after being told that Vladimir Putin backed Trump Sr. and that they could expect dirt on Hillary Rodham Clinton, though all parties claim no information was ultimately exchanged. Trump also told Mueller he didn't know about that meeting, though the White House itself has repeatedly changed its story about that. Still, Trump continues to deny any connections between his campaign and Russia by now, there still be enough evidence to treat this as seriously as anything else Trump says, which is to say, with the presumption from the inception that it's complete and utter bullshit. There be not, at this point still, any public information that openly connects the president directly to Russian interference in the election, but all emergent evidence to date evidently supports that Trump confidants were given forewarning about Russian moves designed to hurt Clinton and boost Trump. And that WikiLeaks was the middleman that made it all possible. So the smoking guns be sitting out in the open. And, of course, Roger Stone's own indictment would have packed more of a wallop if his ties to WikiLeaks hadn't been obvious since the 2016 campaign. 
I mean, make no mistake, Special Counsel Robert Mueller's indictment of Roger Stone is a big deal. It's just that it would be a bigger deal if the Trump campaign hadn't so brazenly conducted its dubious dealings for all the public to see in real time. This is exactly parallel to Michael Jackson and his open abuse of children on stage, in the public eye, for all to see, with all of us. Well, not I, but all of you. The majority, other than a few, of a studentist denying what was going on right before their eyes. So Stone's indictment coinciding with his early morning arrest in Florida a few weeks ago and a raid of his New York apartment. All that lays out how Stone, a longtime friend and associate of Trump's, served as a conduit between the Trump campaign and WikiLeaks. Stone was an early member of Trump's 2016 team and had been involved in Trump's previous flirtations with runs for office. But he left the nascent presidential campaign in August of 2015 and yet remained in contact with Trump campaign officials. And after WikiLeaks released Russian hacked emails from the Democratic National Committee in July of the year before, the year before yesteryear, back in 2016, you had the indictment telling us that a senior Trump campaign official was directed to contact Stone about any additional releases and what other damaging information WikiLeaks had regarding the Clinton campaign. Though that indictment doesn't make clear who that official was or who directed him or her. But that's what began months of communications between Roger Stone and WikiLeaks using two intermediaries who appear to be the conspiracy theorizing reactionary writer Jerome Corsi, friend of George Noy of Coast to Coast AM, and the radio host Randy Credico. So using information apparently gleaned through the two, Stone accurately forecasts subsequent WikiLeaks dumps of emails both to Trump officials privately and in public tweets and comments. In 2017, when Congress began investigating Russian interference in the 2016 election, Stone tried to cover up all of that. That's what Mueller charges. Stone told the White House Intelligence Committee that he didn't have any relevant documents, which, of course, turned out to be false. He disclosed using Credico as an intermediary to WikiLeaks, but not Corsi. He said he never asked an intermediary to communicate anything to Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks head, and he said he'd never discussed with the Trump campaign any communications he's had with WikiLeaks. All of these claims turned out to be false as well, as Mueller has so conclusively documented with writ communications. And Stone also tried to persuade Credico to lie in his sworn testimony, making reference to the Godfather Part Two character, Frank Pentangeli. Critico replied, you should have just been honest with the House Intel Committee. You've opened yourself up to perjury charges like an idiot. As a result of all of this, Mueller has charged Stone with obstruction, six counts of making false statements, and witness tampering. Mm. Now, responsibly, in damage control mode, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders has asserted that this has nothing to do with the president and certainly nothing to do with the White House. Yet the indictment makes clear the close connections between the Trump campaign and the behavior involved. And Trump has also praised Roger Stone publicly for saying he would not testify against the president. Testify about what? Now, what was revealed in the indictment as it came out most recently? That aspect of it, which has been released, has already partially made clear via a draft document from Mueller's team that Corsi leaked to the press in November, which sketched out many of the communications between Stone and Assange via Corsi and Credico, all that was going on. Yet, much of this was known, known to all of us long before that. 
just like everything we knew about Michael Jackson before this documentary made it indefensible, made it undeniable. I mean, Stone took remarkably little effort to conceal his communications with WikiLeaks during the campaign. On August 8th of 2016, and that was like, um, you know, the date of the Nagasaki bombing in Japan time across the international dateline. I was, of course, speaking on Revolution Radio around that time. Still. And that was when Roger Stone, speaking to a Republican group in Florida, said, I actually have communicated with Assange. I believe the next tranche of his documents pertain to the Clinton Foundation. But there's no telling what the October surprise may be. And four days later, during an interview, Roger Stone again said he had been in touch with Assange, but added that he was not at liberty to discuss what I have. And in two interviews on August 16th, he again boasted about communications with Assange via a mutual acquaintance who'd be a fine gentleman. And on August 21st, Roger Stone correctly predicted the leak of the Clinton campaign chairman, John Podesta's emails, tweeting, trust me, it will soon be Podesta's time in the barrel. And on August 23rd, on Critico's radio show, Stone said, we have a mutual friend, somebody we both trust, and therefore I am a recipient of pretty good information. He twice tweeted semi-cryptic teases in the days before an October 7th WikiLeaks dump as well. And during that same period, Trump was denying that he had any knowledge of what WikiLeaks was doing, while at the same time praising WikiLeaks extensively. So in October of 2016, in Kinston, North Carolina, that's when we had Trump saying, you know, they like to say every time WikiLeaks comes out, they say this is a conspiracy between Donald Trump and Russia. Give me a break. And even then, it was widely known that Stone was a friend of Trump's, and Stone boasted openly about staying in touch with the candidate. Anyone paying close attention to public information would surmise that Roger Stone was feeding information from WikiLeaks to the Trump campaign, and there go, therefore, to Trump himself. Now, implausible deniability, paired with incriminating public statements, be a common theme for the Trump campaign with regard to Russia. The Russian empire be a spectral presence in the latest Mueller indictment. In the July 2018 indictment, Mueller laid out evidence for how Russian government agents hacked emails from the Democratic National Committee and Podesta and provided them to WikiLeaks even back then. The latest filings this year, just last month, towards the very end of it, show us how WikiLeaks communicated them to the Trump campaign. Yet, even back in the days when all of this was just being noticed, it was widely known that Russia was responsible for the hacking. A private contractor hired by the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, had blamed Russia then. And by the end of the campaign, Trump was also receiving briefings from United States intelligence, pinning the attacks on Russia. And despite all this, Trump continued to equivocate about blame for the hacks, suggesting they could have been the work of China or somebody sitting on the bed that weighs 400 pounds, obviously thinking of Stephen Outrin. Now, even if Trump officials hadn't been told directly by WikiLeaks via Roger Stone that the emails came from Russia, they should have known. And that's because Trump was publicly courting Russia in plenty of other ways. He repeatedly praised Vladimir Putin on the campaign trail and discussed the benefits of a stronger Russo-American relationship. Trump downplayed the importance of Russia's annexation of Crimea from Ukraine in an act of international aggression, suggesting he himself wouldn't object as president. Trump hired Paul Manafort who is widely known to be close to the Kremlin. The most dramatic example of Trump communicating publicly with the Russians came in July of 2016, on July 21st, when the Republican National Convention concluded. And on July 22nd, WikiLeaks began releasing emails. And in response to that, the senior Trump campaign official was directed 
to get in touch with Roger Stone to set up the back channel. And on July 27th, Trump held a press conference in which he publicly called on Russia to release emails hacked from Hillary Clinton. To quote as Trump himself verbatim, by the way, if they're hacked, they probably have her 33,000 emails. I hope they do. They probably have her 33,000 emails that she lost and deleted because you'd see some beauties there. I will tell you this, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that be missing. Now, Trump aides insisted he was speaking in jest. If so, Moscow never seems to have gotten the joke. That same day, Russian hackers first attempted to hack Clinton's emails on direct orders issued publicly from Donald Trump. And as the public learned through the Mueller probe and press reports, there were also extensive contacts between the Trump campaign and Russia that were not public. The aides, George Papadopoulos and Carter Page, were both in contact with Russian officials. In June of 2016, Manafort, Jared Kushner, and Donald Trump Jr. all met at the Trump Tower with Russian attorneys whom they expected to provide damaging information about the Clinton campaign. And the Trump Organization, via Michael Cohen, was also in contact with the Russian government about building a tower in Moscow with plans to give the penthouse itself to Vladimir Putin as a personal gift. Even as Trump was publicly denying have any business in Russia at that time. And yet so much of the communication between the Trump campaign and Russia, all of it occurring in plain sight, Stone boasting about his contacts with both Trump and Assange, Trump puffing Putin up and disputing Russian involvement in hacking, Trump calling on Russia to hack Clinton's emails, and Russians attempting to do so the very same day. It turns out to have been a perverse tactical genius to all of this. The public and the press, conditioned by the Nixon tapes, have been searching for a smoking gun that would prove that Trump's behavior was either illegal or worthy of impeachment. Yet because so much of the most shocking behavior happened in public years ago, it all seems like old news. It's unclear what else Mueller might reveal before his probe concludes. But in the meantime, the smoking guns are sitting out in the open. Right where they've been smoking since the summer of 2016. And that's how it is with the documentary of Michael Jackson. Nothing revealed we don't already know. Now that's when we got a comment from George Knight on a post published by Daniel Arola, in which Daniel Arola was speaking about alternative media being Russian propaganda spoken in English. Quoting myself directly, showing that anti-vaccination posts on Twitter came from Russian trolls and bots. And that's when George Knight entered a comment in thread of that very post saying, very important question regarding the late Michael Jackson, latest documentary, Leaving Neverland accuses Michael of performing sexual relations eroticized with two boys. Wade Robson and James Safechuck. Was Michael Jackson a pedophile? Conducting child sexual abuse? I only believe what Douglas says because he never lied about anything. All he says can be verified and documented. Thank you, Douglas. Blessings and gratitude forever in your name. God bless you, George Knight. And that's when my executive producer and CR, my communications representative, Pavel Pravara, answered George Knight. I'll quote his tea. When you hear the testimony of the two men, as they now are, it'd be really difficult to conclude they'd lie now. It's especially tragic when people know the history and details of the MJ trials. I mentioned the leaving Neverland testimony to Douglas, and he says there'd be more to consider than Michael Jackson. And I thought of what has been publicized about Michael Jackson's childhood and the treatment and pressure by his father. By the way, not exactly quoting D.D., he'll express his views when such be a propos. Now, there'd be two radio stations in Quebec, still quoting Paul here, Paul Edward, Pavel Trafara. And he says, there are now two radio stations in Quebec that have stopped playing Michael Jackson's music at the request of the audience after Leaving Neverland came out. 
Admittedly, I have done the same. Really difficult to listen to Michael Jackson singing about truth and justice when he misled and lied. However, the larger context and circumstances will need to be considered, including the relationship with his father, as well as Michael Jackson's fight with Sony, the trials, etc. Not as an excuse for Michael Jackson's actions, but further understanding of what occurred. I'd like to know how this be affecting people's perceptions of their world. Thanks for bringing this up, Mr. Lang, and to Douglas's attention. It needs to be discussed because the pedos would and will attempt to weaponize Michael Jackson's molestation to legitimize pedophilia. Michael Jackson's public stardom guarantees it. And, of course, uh, I have responses before me from Daniel Arola. And uh, he says, I doubt I'll be ready to let go of what little bit of Michael Jackson dances moves that I still remember just yet. Even though I've been uh, retired from dancing for over a decade now, I grew up on Thriller when I was a kid in the Philippines. Filipinos are known for hosting impersonation contests involving the mimic of popular celebrities from Johnny Depp and Captain Jack Sparrow to Bruce Lee, and Michael Jackson contests have always been one of the biggest hits there. And so he goes on about that, and uh, that's fine. And, of course, uh, our man uh, George Knight responded, of course, uh, to Pavel and uh, brings up the father's relationship and what now. Um, Anyhow. Uh, I will now tend to this subject. It'll carry us to the top of the hour, and it'll bring us into the hours after that. And it'll probably take a good two hours after break to cover Michael Jackson. But we can't start with Michael Jackson. To take us to the top of the hour, we have to cover a protege of Michael Jackson and Donald Trump and the Clintons. Jeffrey Epstein, the convicted sex offender who be friends with Donald Trump and William Clinton. So I have to explain how a money manager to the super wealthy used his collection of famous friends to avoid a prison sentence for molesting young girls. Jeffrey Epstein should have gone to prison for life. The money manager was accused of sexually abusing dozens of underage girls at his Palm Beach mansion between 2001 and 2006. He ultimately got just 13 months in a county jail, thanks to a deal signed by Alexander Acosta, then the United States Attorney for Miami, and now President Donald John Trump's Secretary of Labor. Now, On Thursday last week, a federal judge ruled that Acosta's team broke the law by concealing the agreement from over 30 girls who accused Epstein of abusing them. Now, Epstein himself has insisted that any encounters he had with his accusers were totally consensual and that he believed every single one of them was 18 at the time. Now, this reminds me of my fangirl, Lainey Shea, who was talking about R. Kelly, the rapper, being illiterate so he can't check girls' IDs. I guess we'll have to conclude the same about Jeff Epstein. Now, the story about how Epstein got such a light sentence doesn't involve illiteracy. It involves people, names, who was involved, and the master class in the power dynamics that have been exposed by the hashtag Me Too movement, but have yet to truly change. When authorities began investigating Epstein, he assembled a team of private investigators, literally detectives, to dig up dirt on the girls who accused him and the police and prosecutors working on the case. Then he and his team of powerful lawyers, including Alan Dershowitz and Kenneth Starr, were able to convince prosecutors to go easy on him despite disturbing allegations by a growing number of girls and young ladies who were now women. Now, according to Axios, Dershowitz is still advising Epstein, saying he's called me a couple of times about legal issues because I'm still technically his lawyer. Now, Epstein was most proud of his quote-unquote collection of famous friends, inclusive William Jefferson Clinton and Donald John Trump. And there's long been speculation that these very friends have participated in Epstein's abuses. 
But because Epstein himself has been able to avoid harsh punishment and minimize publicity around the details of his case, he's also been able to keep details about anyone else who may have been involved out of the public eye. The fact that Epstein be free today be a reminder that the American justice system has long been all too willing to ignore the words of women and young girls, especially when they accuse a wealthy and influential man. It's a reminder that those with enough money and connections, from Epstein to Harvey Weinstein, can manipulate the legal system to serve their own ends. Now notice both of those motherfuckers are pure-blooded motherfucking Jew. I mean, so Jewish. It like it looks painful. They've got noses like macaws, and they look like caricatures out of a Third Reich propaganda poster against Daz Yudin. But despite the fact that there is a Jewish factor in this, the more wide-ranging lesson to take home be how all of this shows how one powerful person can protect not just himself but anyone who might be connected to him, all while exploiting those who be completely powerless, at least comparatively speaking, in terms of orders of magnitude of their ability to manipulate the levers of society around them. Now, Jeffrey Epstein is now 65 years old, and he's one of the most powerful money managers in the world. At least he was up until his 2007 indictment for sex crimes. After working at the investment bank Bear Stearns in the early 1980s, he founded his own firm, J. Epstein and Company, in 1982, advertising his services for those with assets worth over one billion United States dollars. And he was soon managing billions of dollars in client assets. By 1992, he owned the largest private residence in Manhattan. For tax purposes, he's run his business from the island of St. Thomas in the United States Virgin Islands since at least 1996. And near that island, he owns an entire island himself. He owns the island of Little St. James. Now that island, Little St. James, is also home to Epstein's foundation, the Jeffrey Epstein the Sixth Foundation best known for donating 30 million United States dollars to Harvard University for the establishment of a mathematical biology and evolutionary dynamics program with the underwritten intent to produce young girls that possess tongues that can work in stimulation of a sexual recipient yet do not aid in speech. In other words, the breeding of mute females that will never be able to speak about what's been done to them. In a 2003 Harvard Crimson article on Epstein and his gift to the university, Jeff Epstein be described by Harvard luminaries, including Alan Dershowitz, who would later represent him when Epstein was accused of sex crimes in 2007. The very year my late and sainted sire, the man who raised me, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, died. At that time, Jeff Epstein the sixth was described by Alan Dershowitz as brilliant and one of the most pleasant of philanthropists. Well, if I were given money to bring young girls into this world, breed chicks who couldn't talk. I guess I'd be saying the same thing had I those proclivities. In a 2002 New York Magazine profile that I was reading around the year my father died, Epstein was described by even those closest to him as mysterious with many of the sources of his immense wealth remaining largely unknown, and with one acquaintance even comparing him to the Wizard of Oz, implying that there might be less behind the curtain than appearances would otherwise dictate. Now, I dug that old article up 
I'm going to read verbatim the quote that stands out most to myself. Epstein is said to run 15 billion United States dollars for wealthy clients. Yet aside from limited founder Leslie Wesner, his client list is a closely held secret. A former Dalton math teacher, he maintains a peripatetic salon of brilliant scientists, yet possesses no bachelor's degree. For more than 10 years, he's been linked to Manhattan, London society figure, Ghislaine Maxwell, daughter of the mysteriously deceased media titan, Robert Maxwell. Yet he lives the life of a bachelor, logging 600 hours a year in his various planes as he scours the world for investment opportunity. He owns what is said to be Manhattan's largest private house, yet runs his business from a 100-acre private island in St. Thomas. Seest another prominent Wall Streeter, he is this mysterious, Gatsby-esque figure. He likes people to think that he is very rich, and he cultivates this air of aloofness. The whole thing is weird. Now, Michael Strom, surname spelled S-T-R-O-L-L, who sued Epstein over a failed business deal in the 2000s, the aughts of this century, told New York Magazine the year my late and sainted father died, 2007. At that time, he said, everybody who's at Epstein's friend thinks he's so darn brilliant because he's so darn wealthy. I never saw any brilliance. In fact, I never saw the son of a bitch work a day in his goddamn life. Anybody I know that is wealthy works 26 hours a day. This guy, Jeff Epstein, plays 26 hours a day. And yet... Jeff Epstein was also an accumulator of famous friends. Maybe that was his work. And his connections would later prove extremely important as he attempted to defend himself against allegations of child sexual abuse. He gained some measure of fame in the early aughts, the 2000s, for flying President Bill Clinton, actor Kevin Spacey, and comedian Chris Tucker to Africa to tour AIDS prevention and treatment project sites. Clinton would go on to fly multiple times on Epstein's private plane in 2002 and 2003. That's according to flight logs obtained by Gawker back in 2015. Gawker, as you might know or remember, was shut down by Peter Thiel. Gawker also obtained before it shut down by Peter Thiel. And it also published Epstein's address book, which included politicians, actors, and celebrities. It's for one of these reasons, Gawker was considered such a threat to the elite. Peter Thiel, of course, supported Donald Trump, helped make Donald Trump president. It's Peter Thiel's gay lover, the transgendered Jared Kushner, who runs American Empire today in collaboration with motherfucking Russia. Now, in 2002, Epstein described his famous friends as a collection of sorts. To quote as he directly, he said, I invest in people, be it politics or science. It's what I do. Now, Epstein was at one point spending 20 million United States dollars per year to subsidize a group of scientists and their research on topics ranging from Tibetan monks to altruistic behavior. He was also good friends with Donald John Trump by then, who described Epstein to New York Magazine in 2002 as someone who enjoys his social life. Now, Epstein's connections to Donald Trump or anybody be crucial to understanding his story. They may have helped him get a lighter sentence in 2008, but they're important for another reason, too. His friendships with famous people have led to speculation that they, too, most notably Clinton and Trump, have participated in his abuse of underage girls. But because Epstein was able to keep all the details of his prosecution quiet, a kind of federal jury, a grand jury of his own, so to speak, it's impossible for the public to know exactly who else be involved in his countless crimes. By protecting himself, Epstein has been able to protect all of his famous friends as well. What's he protecting? The fact that much of Epstein's social life, which Trump said he so enjoys, involves very, very young women. I mean, the last girl 
who said he kept tickling her with all of his fingers, including the big thumb between his legs. That girl was so young that when she was sighted walking around with Jeff Epstein, she was still swinging her teddy bear. And at that time, Trump was saying openly and publicly, I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. He's a lot of fun to be with. Oh, yeah. It's even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do. And many of them are on the much younger side. Oh, tell us, Donna. Come on, Donna. Tell us what it's all about. When she's so small, your penis literally can't fit. I mean, that's got to be a blast. Now, in the 2007 New York Magazine article, Vandy Flair columnist Michael Wolf described flying on Epstein's private plane in the 1990s, saying Epstein was followed onto the plane by, how shall I say this, uh, by three very small girls who were not his daughters, who were, you know, something like eight, nine, maybe 12. Who knows? But they were all model-like. That reminds me of that young girl in the beauty contest who got killed. I can't even remember her name now. And, of course, I think, what the fuck state was that? Arizona. A uh, young girl model killed. Let me see uh, if I can remember her. Jean Benet Ramsey. That's it. Jean Benet Ramsey. These. Uh, imagine a, imagine a bunch of Jean Benet Ramsey coming into a plane with a guy like this. Now, Vanity Fair columnist Michael Wolf, let me quote him again. Epstein's never been secretive about the girls. At one point, when his troubles began, he was talking to me and said, "What can I say? I like young girls." I said to him, "Maybe you should say I like young women." Yeah, ooh, yeah, these are the ladies. I mean, I'll tell you something. You know what comes of this? Now, back in the day, when my parents were still alive, and my gang brother, Beaver, was paid by myself to help in their care provision. And we had to just not drive them all over the place. We also had to drive and pick up stuff for them. And I remember a lot of times we would pick up comfort food for them from places like the In-N-Out Burgers, which has its own TV channel. I'm not shitting you. There's, there's an In-N-Out Burgers TV channel. You can look this up here in California. And In-N-Out Burgers franchise was at the time right next to um, the strip joint where the girls serve you uh, the hot wings and shit. What the, what the fuck was that called? I'm going to have to ask my boys here. Um, hey, you guys, back me up. What's the what, what, what's that uh, chicken wings place? Hooters. That's it. Hooters. Yeah. There was a Hooters that at the time was right next to In-N-Out Burgers in San Francisco in the Fisherman's Wharf District where all the tourists hang. Of course, that didn't last long because who the fuck needs a Hooters in San Francisco? I mean, no, it's not that everyone's gay. It's that... We got strip joints. We've got adult entertainment. So who the fuck needs a Hooters? Hooters is for places where there's no strip joint, where there's no adult entertainment ongoing. So you had a Hooters in San Francisco, and it was funny in and of itself, mind-boggling, just a mystery as to why people were going there that I saw going there. I mean, In-N-Out Burgers has an all-glass kind of patio fair where we go inside you can still see outside waiting on our order at in and out burgers which takes a while because there's so many clientele in and out burgers is not necessarily in and out but it's worth the wait it's fine good food good enough for myself i enjoyed it wonderful people um one time they gave us a wrong order they made certain that i was able to come back and pick up a right order for free for my parents along with anything else i wanted at the time it was wonderful Great people. And here they are next to Hooters, 
And I was looking out the window and seeing the Hooters like collage, just a collage of female body parts all slapped together to attract men. You know, tits, ass, lips, hips, lips, hips, tits, ass, coy eyes, you know, to come hither look when a woman's batting her lashes. I was like, what does that remind me of? I've seen it before, but I, I can't place it. What, where have I seen that before? That kind of collage. And Beaver says, oh, you see it in all the serial killer films. It's the collage you'd see on a serial killer's wall. I say, that's it. That's what that is. Woman's body parts all slapped together in a collage. Just boobs and butt and lips and tits and tits. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. And then still you see old grandmothers going in with their grandchildren. I'm like, why the fuck would an old grandmother bring her underage grandchildren into an area where they're served hot wings by a bunch of women with plastic tit dressed in hot shit, hot pants and shorts that glitter and shit. And, and then we'd see guys taking the daughters in and shit, young daughters, like, you know, underage girls that are, they're bringing in, Hey, let's go to Hooters. I mean, like I wouldn't take my daughter into a Hooters. What the fuck are they trying to teach their daughter? I want you to be like this girl. I want you to walk around the house half naked and serve me food. That's what I want to raise my, this is my role model for my daughter. I mean, this is what's, you know, anyhow, aside from all that, I turned around and there was a young girl. How do I describe this? Obviously well underage. We're talking about somebody like 12. Jean-Bedet Ramsey type. Sitting in the In-N-Out Burger with her granny across the table from her. And I had turned around from the collage of lips and hits and tits and shit. Along with Beaver, who was just following my own gaze. So I turned around and looked at her. And she had overheard the discussion Beaver and I were having. And she winked at me and gave me this coquettish little come hither with her finger. And licked her lips. And made this motion of jacking off a penis. I said to Beaver, did you see that? Now, we've been involved with the underworld all our lives. Beaver's a man who's killed men. He's put men down at point blank range. And this was the first time in my life I'd ever seen him shudder shuddered like <sighs> and I said it's not her fault he said someday it will be but this is what happens to young girls who are exposed to the Epsteins of the world and wind up working at Hooters And it was finally in 2005 where Hooters started in Florida that a woman reported to Florida police that a wealthy man had molested her stepdaughter. And that tip led Palm Beach detectives to investigate and they identified multiple girls who confirmed that Epstein had abused them. The case was eventually referred to the FBI and in 2008, after years of investigation and legal wrangling, Epstein pleaded guilty to charges of solicitation of prostitution and procurement of minors for prostitution in a deal with federal prosecutors. Now, according to the court and police records, which I myself have reviewed, Epstein routinely had underage girls brought to his Palm Beach mansion where he paid them to give him massages. And during those massages, he off subjected the girls to sexual abuse, asking them to touch him while he masturbated, touching them himself, and sometimes having intercourse with them. Then he would offer them money to find him more girls, which some of them did, finding recruits at malls and house parties or slumber parties, pajama parties. Imagine bringing a girl home to your home so she could sleep over with your daughter. And in this sleepover, you later find out she recruited your daughter to go meet Epstein. 
Now, this is what led Joseph Ricari, the Palm Beach detective on the case, to conclude that Epstein was essentially operating a sexual pyramid scheme. Detective Ricari identified about 80 women who say they were molested or otherwise sexually abused by Epstein, and some accounts suggest the total number must be orders of magnitude higher. It probably runs into, at the absolute least, as speculated by the Palm Beach Detective Department, 800 women. And that's in Florida alone. Now, Courtney Wilde, who says she recruited over 100 girls for Epstein, alone by herself, told Detective Brown, he told me he wanted them as young as I could find them. Fresh out of the crib. He wanted as many girls as I could get them. Like a baby factory, it was never enough. He just didn't want to change their diapers. And in response to lawsuits by some of these young girls, Epstein said that they had all consented. As if he had no comprehension, you cannot consent when you're under 18. That they had all consented to the acts alleged. Oh, these acts are just alleged. They're just accusations on you. But whatever it was, they consented. And that at the time, he believed each and every one of them was 18 years of age. And, of course, in all the cases, the effects on the girls was devastating. Now, Jen Lisa Jones, who confirms Epstein molested her when she was 14 years old, told Detective Brown, you can't ever stop your thoughts. A word can trigger something. For me, it's the word pure, because he called me pure in that room. And then I remember what he did to me in that room. And I was never pure again. So Brown writes, the woman who went to Jeffrey Epstein's mansion as girls tend to divide their lives into two parts. Life before Jeffrey and life after Jeffrey. Wilde was a 14-year-old middle school student and cheerleading captain when she met Epstein. She later became addicted to drugs and served three years in prison on drug charges. One woman who said Epstein molested her was found dead of a heroin overdose last year, leaving behind a young son in her suicide note that she said was a direct biological son of this Jew motherfucker and the kike is so cheap that Epstein wouldn't even pay for raising the son of a bitch. Billions of dollars, and he wouldn't give her any money to raise the child he produced. Now, the FBI had prepared a 53-page sex crimes indictment for Epstein in the year my father died, 2007, that could have sent him to prison for life. Instead, this kite cuts a deal with Alexander Acosta, then the United States Attorney of Miami, which allowed him to serve just 13 months. Not in federal or state prison, but in a private wing of a Palm Beach County jail. His own wing. And you know what? They had to contract construction workers to build it for them almost overnight with its own hot tub. I'm not shitting. And Epstein, beyond that, was granted work release to go to a suitably comfortable office for 12 hours a day, six days a week, despite the fact that the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department prohibited work release for sex offenders. But this guy's Jewish, you see. He lives by God's law. And according to a Jew-worshipping Protestant, a Jew can fuck your kids, and he's not a sex offender. Because, you know, it's like divine insemination. That kid that led to that woman killing herself with an overdose, he's like Jesus. He's half God. Though his cheap-ass father wouldn't give him any money to uh, realize his divine potential, poor son of a bitch. And Epstein's deal 
called a non-prosecution agreement. I like that. Non-prosecution agreement, an NPA. It granted immunity to any potential co-conspirators. Meaning that if any of Epstein's powerful friends were involved in his crimes, they would face no consequences. That's what freed up Donald John Trump and William Jefferson Clinton. And Acosta agreed that the deal would be kept secret from the victims, preventing them from showing up in court to try and challenge it. So all this is part of your secret government, federal grand jury. It's based on that system of unaccountability and total impunity. A lawsuit set for trial in Florida State Court in December of 2018 was expected to bring more details of Epstein's crimes to light. Some of Epstein's victims were slated to testify for the first time in their lives. But on December 4th of last year, Epstein reached a last-minute settlement in that suit just before jury selection was to begin. However, a ruling on February 21st this year by federal judge Kenneth A. Mara gave those who reported abuse by Epstein some hope. Mara, whose surname is spelled M-A-R-R-A, ruled that prosecutors under Acosta violated the Crime Victims' Rights Act by hiding the non-prosecution agreement from over 30 young girls who confirmed Epstein had raped them. The judge did not overturn Epstein's plea deal. Instead, he gave prosecutors 15 days to work with the victims, now in their 20s and 30s, and their attorneys to arrive at a settlement. It's not clear whether that settlement could include further prosecution for Epstein. But Brad Edwards, an attorney who represents Courtney Wilde, told the Herald, this is a huge victory. But to make Epstein's victims suffer for 11 years, this should not have happened. Now, for a time, Epstein was markedly forthcoming about some of the allegations against him. In one communication with Palm Beach Police in 2005, his attorney said, Mr. Epstein is very passionate about massages. The massages be therapeutic and spiritually sound for him. That'd be why he has had so many massages. And he emphasized the fact that Epstein had even donated 100,000 United States dollars to Ballet Florida purely so that dancers could also have massages. While he was asking them to turn over the young girls in ballerina dresses to help him get some massages too while they were wearing their ballet outfits. He wanted them to stand on their twinkle toes all the time they worked his crotch, which was so stressed, so tense, it was stiff as stone. I mean, this made it into print. This is, this is his attorney's defense. Just like that. The good Lord told me that if I thought evil thoughts, I'd turn to stone. And it must be true, because I'm getting mighty stiff. Watching those chicks do that ballet and pirouette. Now, despite the severity of the crimes this kike has been accused of, Epstein has avoided any consequences whatsoever thanks to his wealth and connections. He was able to hire a team, including private investigators, Dershowitz and Starr, famous for his investigation of Bill Clinton, of all people. And Epstein's investigators and lawyers worked to both discredit and intimidate the young girls who came forward, many of them now young ladies. And he discredited it as well, the authorities working on the case. Now, after that case got referred to the FBI, Epstein's team mounted a year-long assault on federal prosecutors, investigating both them and their families, looking for personal peccadilloes that might disqualify them from investigating his case. All of this exposed by a 2011 public statement by Acosta himself. In other words, Acosta issued, during the very year my late and sainted mother, Diana Zujin Lynn Dietrich died, the year 2011, a statement confirming everything I'm articulating. None of this would have been possible without Epstein's substantial fortune. But his relationships with other powerful people also played a key role. Epstein's plea agreement refers to unspecified information he supplied to federal investigators. It's not clear what that information was. But Brown notes in reports that he's writ that Epstein was a key federal witness in the prosecution of two executives with Bear Stearns, 
the investment brokerage that failed as part of the 2008 financial crises. Epstein had at one time been an investor in a hedge fund managed by those very executives, so it's possible that his knowledge about other wealthy men has helped to keep him out of prison. And those executives were, of course, eventually acquitted themselves. Ultimately, Acosta caved under the pressure. He and his team not only allowed Epstein to avoid a long prison sentence, but also worked with Epstein's lawyers to make certain the case was kept as quiet as possible. All told, this extensive reporting that I've assembled paints a picture that's all too common. A rich and well-connected man manipulating the legal system to protect himself. The entire account recalls the case of producer Harvey Weinstein, who, according to the New Yorker's Ronan Farrow, hired an army of private investigators, including ex-Mossad agents, agents of the Israeli intelligence, to track actresses and journalists in an international effort to suppress sexual harassment and assault allegations against himself. So anyone who says there's not a Jewish conspiracy to fuck you over, you can go fuck yourself. Because Epstein's deal with prosecutors did more than just protect himself. By granting immunity to potential co-conspirators, he let any friends or associates of himself who also participated in his abuses avoid any consequences as well. And over the years, speculation has swirled about which of Epstein's famous friends have committed sex crimes on his properties. And it was during the 2016 presidential race, then-Republican National Committee Chair Rance Priebus hinted that William Jefferson Clinton was involved. When you hang out with a guy who has a reputation like Jeffrey Epstein, multiple times on private jets, on weekends, on trips, on places at least where it's been reported, not very good things happen. It would be good to know what our former president was doing. This is what Rance Priebus told Bloomberg. What does that tell us about his boy, Donald Trump? Because also, during that 2016 race, a woman going by the name Katie Johnson sued Donald John Trump, saying he had raped her at one of Epstein's properties when she was nine years old. She later dropped the suit because she said her home was invaded by a bunch of men speaking Hebrew who put her down and gang raped her until she agreed to drop the suit. Now, it's hard for the public to know how to evaluate these assertions when so little about Epstein's crimes have ever come to light. Thanks to pressure from his lawyers and acquiescence from prosecutors. Epstein's money and influence have protected not just Epstein, but anyone who might be connected to him. A disturbing example of power perpetuating itself. The girls and women who reported abuse by Epstein, meanwhile, were markedly powerless. Most of them came from disadvantaged families, single-parent homes, or foster care. Many of these girls were one step away from homelessness. Their youth and poverty have made it easier for Epstein and his recruiters to lure them in with promises of cash. Easier for investigators to intimidate them. Makes it easier for prosecutors to discount or disbelieve them when the time came. In Epstein's case, be also one of all too many instances in which victims of sexual misconduct be ignored or brushed aside when they come from marginalized groups. Women who have come forward to say that singer R. Kelly abused them have faced a similar kind of erasure. Kelly has been accused of creating an abusive sex cult, a very, very young woman, whom he allegedly isolates, brainwashes, and abuses physically and emotionally. Girls and women are routinely seen as unreliable narrators of their own experiences, inclusive abuse, and it typically takes testimony of many women for a powerful man to face any consequences. Exactly, Gretia. Young female athletes have been reporting abuse by Larry Nazar. Surname spelled N-A-S-S-A, 
are the United States of America gymnastics team doctor who was sentenced up to 175 years in prison earlier this year for abusing well over 100 young athletes since 1997. For more than a decade, officials at Michigan State University heard on a daily basis young girls claiming he made them bleed, fucking them before they even had their first period. Oh, where he worked. And the officials at Michigan State University, MSU, did nothing. Nothing. It took a groundbreaking investigation by the Indianapolis Star, the brave testimony of dozens of survivors, and perhaps the growing strength of the hashtag MeToo movement to finally bring Nazar to justice. And meanwhile, for the woman who say Epstein abused them, the justice remains elusive. Epstein spends most of his time on his private island in the Virgin Islands, He's registered as a sex offender there and in New York, but not in New Mexico, where he also has a home. Anna Costa, who helped Epstein serve his time in an office rather than a prison cell, and measure it in months, not years, oversees Trump's Labor Department, which be responsible for, among other things, preventing human trafficking. That's why he was placed there, so the human trafficking could be expedited. And then these Trump-sucking cultists say Trump is breaking up the pay ring. You can all go fuck yourselves the same way you fuck your daughters. The same way you fuck your sons. God damn you white trash pieces of shit. I'm sick of living in this sewer with you. You make me sick. And still there be no evidence. That any of the powerful men accused of abusing girls along with Epstein have ever been prosecuted. But at last, Judge Morrow's ruling in the case has intensified calls for a Department of Justice investigation and scrutiny of Acosta's role. Senator Ben Sass, a Republican of New England, surname spelled S A S S E, in the wake of this ruling, has said the Department of Justice should use this opportunity to reopen its non-prosecution agreement so that Epstein and anyone else who abused these children be held accountable. And Michelle Licata, surname spelled L-I-C-A-T-A, who asserts she was molested by Epstein at the age of nine, has stated that the ruling is a step for justice. But she's also said... They should see if they can prosecute him for something. I mean, really prosecute him. Instead of giving him 13 months where he's been allowed to come and go as he pleased. Now, we'll be back after break. Break will be 10 to 15 minutes. You stay right here, and when we return, we'll talk about the culture of the Lost Boys and how leaving Neverland leaves no room for doubt about Michael Jackson as a serial predator. I'm going to go mute now. Be back in 10 to 15 minutes. You stay right here. Or rather, use this opportunity to relieve yourself and get yourself some refreshments as I'm going to do. Be back. Pavel, you take over. It's yours. I'll let you know when I return. Okay, I am back. It's uh, 20 minutes after the top of the hour. Hope everything's uh, well. I noticed a written message from my executive producer uh, that we are back up live, uh, which is fabulous. I'm not quite sure. Does that mean we were off? <laughs> I'm certain everything is fine in that regard. And uh, uh, hopefully we're recording now, so I'll wait for a written message from himself uh, that we are recording, and I will also um, look forward to a written message from uh, any one of you out there as to how we're sounding right now. Uh, so do please uh, let us know how quality of audio is coming along. We are live and recording. Thank you, uh, Paul Provar, my executive producer, without whom none of this could happen. Uh, he's been very patient with myself. Uh, our grand uh Ramona Halitha Henry, is turning in for the evening because she works for a living. Uh, we're lucky to keep her till midnight, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, Dear Lady, of course, uh, is the closest thing we have to a chat room monitor on, on my closest thing to a chat room, my personal friends page. And, of course, is now taking off for the, uh, 
for the time being. And uh, I mean, there's only so much of this anyone can stand. Uh, so aside from all of that, of course, I uh, wish to thank uh, all of you who are still with us or have rejoined us again uh, as, uh, how shall I say, as um, reassured as I am by my executive producer, always good to hear from those who are listening in. And uh, if nobody says anything, I'll just go forward talking, which is what I'll start doing now. Okay. Um, first, we'll address the issue of culture. And uh, I have never seen a culture like the United States other than, well, actually, I've seen cultures like the United States. <laughs> and they are in uh, Southwest Asia more than any other place, the Levantine, what Americans call the Middle East, uh, particularly the House of Saud, uh, but uh, it, to a lesser extent, um, some other Arab nations. But mainly in the House of Saud is where I see exploitation of young boys. And uh, so I cannot help but reflect on those cultures. When I saw the documentary uh, that uh, premiered on HBO entitled Leaving Neverland, which be a devastating indictment of Michael Jackson. Uh, now, of course, I'm going to refer as I am want to do uh, in a manner of Michael Jackson inclusive, his middle name. Uh, and I often include this with people because uh, it's my training. Uh, it makes it easier, of course, to find them when you're dealing with many, many names in a registry, a levy, as we call it in the military, of uh, various personnel. So I will refer to Michael Jackson as Michael Joseph Jackson, which is his full name. And uh, I want to bring that to everyone's attention because it will probably help you in the future uh, just to learn to speak to people uh, about people by their full name, at least in an introductory fashion. So this new documentary leaves no room for doubt about the King of Pop's abuse of children. And, of course, I'm going to have to speak to the people who are not believing, leaving Neverland. Because for them... Michael Jackson's star power hasn't dimmed even after damning new expositions of child molestation and pedophilia via this HBO documentary. Uh, and, of course, the Leaving Neverland documentary provides a detailed exploration of Michael Jackson's abuses while hinting at what happens when faith and fandom get blurred. So, Leaving Neverland is a disturbing but all too familiar tale of abuse excused by wealth and celebrity. And while I've exposed to you in the last or opening, the first segment of this transmission, how wealth renders a man nigh impervious, celebrity is also in and of itself a kind of infrastructure. So the Michael... Jackson expositions bring degrees of turmoil to other celebrities and has elicited or prompted, incited degrees of turmoil from Paris Jackson, Corey Feldman, and Oprah Winfrey, respectively. Now, Corey Feldman's new perspective, several days after leaving Neverland premiered, he being Michael Jackson's longtime friend and defender, even Corey Feldman has said he can no longer ignore the horrendous claims, as he described as they. And Oprah's Neverland reckoning has come to pass. Oprah believest MJ's accusers. Uh, Winfrey sat down for an hour-long discussion with Michael Jackson's accusers after the second half of HBO's Leaving Neverland aired. Now, one of the great collective lies in recent years has been the varying degrees of shock displayed by the media and public as stories of the hashtag MeToo movement have garnered headlines, as if the conditions described in the various accounts of abuse were something not widely known or even tacitly rationalized by audiences around this planet. The truth about casting couches and scummy entertainment executives has been an open secret for many, many decades. I may as well say forever. The truth be that many, many people have decided to still buy the music 
and go to the movies, even after singers beat the shit out of their girlfriends and directors rape young girls. And the truth be, many communities still cheer, defend, and protect individuals connected to everything from sexual assault to murder, as long as touchdown and championships occur. So, celebrity is its own safe passage, to a great extent. The lie a lot of people want to tell themselves be this. We didn't know. It's the same lie the public desperately tries to cling to, even as they push to the back of their minds the uncomfortable knowledge of carrying around smartphones built with slave labor and wearing clothes sewn in sweatshop conditions. At the end of the day, there be a history of normal, everyday people valuing their creature comforts more than any concern for the hows or whys of where those comforts be coming from and the character of the individuals who bring those comforts to them. <clears throat> now, many recent documentaries have looked back at major scandals of the 1990s and early aughts, the zeros of the 2000s, with the cultural zikis of the time largely coming across as cringeworthy in how it handled things. Amazon's Lorena dissected how the John and Lorena Bobbitt cases became an instance where the media snickered at the thought of a sliced off penis more than it analyzed the effects of spousal abuse and rape. After lifetime surviving R. Kelly documented decades of sexual assault allegations against the R&B singer and the tepid responses from colleagues in the entertainment industry and authorities, prosecutors issued a 10-count indictment late last month alleging Kelly sexually abused four victims, three of them between the ages of 12 and 14, over a span of a dozen years. And in this context, HBO's Leaving Neverland be a devastating recounting by James Safechuck and Wade Robson of their sexual abuse by Michael Jackson, whom they met when they were just nine and five years old, respectively. The most fascinating aspect of the four-hour program be how their families were seduced into letting small children sleep in a grown man's bed, and whether these testimonials will for some be the damning confirmation of the long-standing child molestation allegations against Jackson himself. Now, Michael Jackson has been accused of molesting children multiple times, and each time his legacy survives. He settled with his first alleged victim out of court in 1993, and then went on to conduct one of the biggest global music tours in history two years later. Now, in 2005, he beat the charges levied against him in a widely publicized trial, stemming from a second set of allegations. When he died four years after that, his funeral was watched online by over 31 million Americans and attended in person by a who's who of famous musicians, politicians, actors, and athletes. Jackson was dead, but his music and the adoration of his fans would live on forever. Maybe the most beloved musician in history, a genre-jumping global icon, he was too big to fail. HBO's documentary, Leaving Neverland, could finally change all of that. Now, over four hours, in two parts, that documentary painted a damning, completely credible case alleging a long pattern of child sexual abuse perpetrated by Jackson. Two men, Wade Robson and James Safechuck, allege in harrowing interviews that after Jackson befriended them when they were children in the 1980s, they were sexually abused by the pop star. The two men's experiences be eerily similar. Both were groomed and spoiled by Jackson, who showered them with gifts, vacations, shopping trips, and most important of all, his attention. They were invited for extended stays with or without family members to Jackson's massive, isolated, Southern California property, Neverland Ranch, 
where they'd sleep in the same bed as Jackson. And soon, both of them said, Jackson taught them how to masturbate, showed them graphic pornography, and engaged in sexual acts with them, including kissing, fondling, and oral sex, all just for starters. Robson was seven, and Safe Chuck was ten, when they confirmed the abuse began. And I'm surprised Jackson waited that long. Now, Jackson sent faxes to Robson, expressing his love for the young boy, whom he called Little One. The pop star called the boys home every day for years, and the two would talk for hours each and every time. And as Jackson got closer to Robson, the boy would grow further apart from his family, who had left Australia and moved to the United States so Wade, an aspiring performer, could take advantage of his connection to the pop star. And Jackson insisted that both boys not trust anyone other than he, including their own parents. Robson said that Jackson told him they would both go to jail if anyone found out what Jackson was doing. Now, Robson and Safe Chuck's testimony describes a man, if we can dignify Jackson with that title, whose alleged abuse was premeditated and carefully planned. Jackson had some sort of alarm outside his bedroom that would go off if anyone was about to enter. He'd send the boy's parents away so that he could have access to the children at Neverland sans any supervision. The men confirmed that Jackson forced them to run drills to get dressed as fast as possible in case someone was about to walk in on them having sex. Their claims are as convincing as they be disturbing. Leaving Neverland leaves no doubt. It'd be a stunning and devastating indictment of Jackson portraying this pop star as someone who manipulated young children and exploited his nature as a larger-than-life celebrity role model to prey on them over a long period of time. Jackson knew what he meant to these children, and he brainwashed them to such a degree that they didn't understand what was happening to them was wrong. In 2005, Robson had testified on Jackson's behalf, and his testimony was credited in part with exonerating Jackson. The actor Macaulay Culkin, who also had a friendship with Jackson when he was a child, was a star witness for the defense and has long said Jackson never molested him. Now, despite the denials, Culkin's testimony during the trial corroborated Robson and Safe Chuck's claims of an alarm bell outside Jackson's room. And Culkin, it be notable, was not interviewed in the documentary. Now, Safe Chuck declined to testify at the Jackson trials we all remember. He alleged in the documentary that Jackson threatened him when he told the musician he wasn't interested in appearing at the trial. Robson and Safe Chuck both recall feeling jealous when they approached puberty and were quickly replaced by other young boys as Jackson's bestest friends. And it wasn't until recently that Robson fully came to terms with the abuse he suffered. Robson told Today, a venue, back in 2013, he said, This is not a case of repressed memory. I never forgot one moment of what Michael did to me. But I was psychologically and emotionally completely unable and unwilling to understand that this was sexual abuse. So, leaving Neverland, for myself at least, was an incredibly difficult watch for several reasons. Not least because it implicitly condemned the public for watching and accepting Jackson's bizarre be public behavior around children in the open for all to see. And writing it off just as an element of his infantile, whimsical personality. Or excusing it as a result of Jackson's own long-rumored abuse by his father, Joe. Jackson constantly surrounded himself with young boys, held their hands in public, freely admitted to sleeping in the same bed with them. Whatever doubt Jackson fans have allowed themselves till now, 
The HBO documentary utterly demolishes it. The truth be in Wade Robson's eye as he discusses how the alleged abuse left him empty, distant, emotionally inert as an adult. The truth be in James Safechuk's shaking hand as he shows the interviewer a ring Jackson gave him when he was a boy during a mock wedding ceremony. And viewers are left to decide for themselves what happens next. Perhaps they'll think of Robson and Safechuck and the other alleged victims whenever a Jackson song comes on the radio. Perhaps they'll stop listening to Jackson's music altogether. Perhaps they'll retreat deeper into fanaticism, as all too many fans be doing. And once again, curse the accusers, accusing the accusers of trying to make a quick buck at a dead singer's expense. It's too early to make a grand pronouncement about what Jackson's legacy will ultimately be in light of this documentary. But I know it won't be the same the day after it was before one views it. Nor will it be the same in the longer sense of social memory as it was before the release of this documentary. So, the documentary itself focuses on the stories of these two men, Wade Robson and James Safechuck, who lay out in gut-wrenching detail stories of how Jackson lured them and their families with his celebrity and then abused them for years in his Neverland mansion. And it paints as a narrative this disturbing picture of how Jackson leveraged his fame as a cudgel against young boys and evaded the murmurs of wrongdoing that dogged him throughout his career, including throughout that very public 2005 child molestation trial. So what happens when musical fandom blurs with religious devotion to a celebrity's art? When Leaving Neverland premiered earlier this year at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah, it was greeted with trepidation, fanfare, and as a security enforcement agent, formerly of that profession myself, I found out it was also greeted by bomb-sniffing dogs. Through my professional connections, though I'm no longer involved professionally in security enforcement, I found that the festival's organizers were worried that fans of Michael Jackson, not the people who had posters of him in their room growing up or those who have warm memories of dancing to Smooth Criminal at their cousin's wedding, but those who feel personally protective of Jackson's legacy would reject physically what they had already rejected epistemically. The director, Dan Reed's four-hour-long documentary telling the stories of Jimmy Safechuck and Wade Robson, both of whom have accused Jackson of molesting them when they were boys. Now, the precautions of Park City may be considered overreactions, and I'm happy to report they turned out to be so, but they neatly presaged what would take place over the last few weekends as the first and second installments of Leaving Neverland aired on HBO. And then the Jackson Truthers emerged out of the woodwork, this time in ethereal form. The hashtag MJInnocent trended all over Twitter. Jackson State, which has steadfastly denied both men's allegations, and which has sued HBO for a hundred million United States dollars just for airing the documentary, shared rare video of Jackson in concert, and the footage, a vaguely grainy reminder of Jackson, the performer, at his most dynamic and compelling and, shall we say, creatively ingenious, it be, in all, two hours long itself, the precise length of Leaving Neverland's first episode. And the estate's implication be clear, Michael Jackson was a superstar, and superstardom be its own defense. Now, Americans be accustomed to talking about fame using the heady language of the cosmos itself, the celebrity as a celestial truth, situated above us, 
the superstar as a force in the firmament. All heat and light and gravitational demands. Now, exactly great idea. When I was younger, hard to imagine such a time, and I fell in love with Mila Yelyevich. Of course, all of you remember her from Resident Evil, which is pure shit. I adored Mila for portraying Joan of Arc. And in Joan of Arc, what I found myself confronted with was, of course, the wretchedness of the second half of the film, which, of course, focuses on her torments and her trials. But most tormenting of all is when she's visited by God. And, of course, who is God in Joan of Arc? Now, I'm going to try and remember this son of a bitch and his name. Uh, Joan of Arc film. Let's look it up because I've done my best to purge this guy with enough drugs. God of Joan Arc, uh, Mila Jojevich. Mila. Okay, so if we look up who was uh, starred in the film The Messenger, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman is this raunchy old Jew who comes in like a Yoda figure, floating above the ground to visit Mila Jojevich, this Serbian thoroughbred in prison and what he offers aside from a total contrast in, uh, in human species you can't believe they're of the same species what he offers is of course a uh, vision of absolute stupidity in which you're wondering okay why is this guy why is this guy God couldn't they just use CGI couldn't they just like do a ball of light couldn't they just do a voice why has it got to be a raunchy old Jew? And then you got another raunchy old Jew uh, who wrote the book Dancing in the Light, Meryl Streep, who in the television version of Joan of Arc looks absolutely hideous and positively frightening when she comes down as the angel who hands Joan of Arc her sword. And I said, why couldn't they just do a CGI angel looking like, you know, an angel, like, we all have grown accustomed. I don't care. You know, forget the political correctness. Forget everything for a moment. We are conditioned in general to see angels, you know, pretty much blonde and Nordic looking. You know, variants on the theme, but, you know, we tend to, like, default. And um, then we get Meryl Streep, who demanded the role. And I'm like, why the fuck? Like, okay. But then it dawns on you. The reason these atrocities of cinema are tolerated, not the film itself or the television film, either one, cinematic or televisual, neither one of them in and of itself is to be damned or dismissed as a film. What is to be damned and dismissed is those scenes in the film that have these idiots portraying divine entities. But why are they in the film to ruin it? Why is the fly in the ointment there? Because it was assumed by the producers that to the Western audiences, they were directing the film towards celebrity be confused with divinity. Celebrity be identified as divinity. So when you see someone who you recognize, of course, I thank the God my ancestors, no one today of the younger generation knows who these pukes are. They say, who's the fucking old guy hovering in front of Joan de Arc? Who's the fucking old lady that they have descending from the sky looking like it's a, a nightmare vision? Uh, all of this, of course, is not going to work with future generations because the star power is fading fast. And that's a good thing. 
Because that's the level of confusion with divinity that expedited, enabled Jackson's environmental form of faith. Music that permeated people's lives. Iconography that saturated American culture. All anticipating the infant, this intimate, falsely intimate version of celebrity that be the default today. So it be fitting in that regard that celebrity itself functions as a spectral character throughout the cinematic narrative of the documented Leaving Neverland. Jackson himself was acutely aware of the affordances of fame. He leveraged them. And ultimately, he weaponized them. Joy Robson, Wade's mother, recalls Michael Jackson making a request of her. She recalls as well that when she refused it, he cruelly informed her, I always get what I want. So, Leaving Neverland exposes that on some level, Michael Jackson was absolutely correct. Jackson was introduced to Safe Chuck and Robson because they were impersonating him. Safe Chuck in a Pepsi ad and Robson as a Jackson-inspired dancer in Brisbane, Australia. Both the boys and their families were awed by him. And he led them to believe, leaving Neverland proofs, that his fame could be made transitive. He dangled the promise of celebrity and of fruitful careers in a fickle industry. Before these families like bits of shimmering bait. In one way, Jackson's insinuation into the boys' lives was deeply personal to the extent that both Stephanie Seistruck and Joy Robson came to think of him, as they say in the documentary itself, as a surrogate son. He'd have dinner at the Safe Chuck's house in Simi Valley, California, and hours-long phone calls with both the boys and their relations. But these were the bones of show business families. Jackson told Safe Chuck, who became interested in directing, that he'd help him make the next Steven Spielberg. He'd make him such. Now, according to Robson, Jackson promised him the ability to learn the art of choreography at, literally, Jackson's own feet. And the boys at first couldn't believe their good fortune to orbit around such a cosmic force. Robson recalls thinking of Jackson, my idol and my mentor and my God! And the mingling of the social and the professional of the artistic and eventually, allegedly, horrifically, the sexual, the dynamics be similar to those described by people who have spoken out against R. Kelly and Ryan Adams and so many others. Lizette Martinez, one of the women who accused Kelly of physical and emotional abuse, recalls in his documentary or at least about him. I'm sure he doesn't want that documentary out. But it's entitled Surviving R. Kelly. And in it, Lizette Martinez, she describes lines that blur perniciously. Now, of course, Kelly denies the charges against himself. And Adam's lawyers have denied the allegations against him as well for Ryan Adams denouncing all of these as being hurled by grousing, disgruntled individuals, if you can buy that line of shit. And all of this dismissal of victims be possible only in a culture that, despite so much evidence to the contrary, continues to embrace myths of meritocracy in which a man rich and powerful a person whose whims get alchemized via fame into collective truth 
tells them that they too be anointed. So, within this prison rape culture, you have these glittering cells where the King of Pop himself promises Safe Chuck and Robson that their unique talents will be seen and appreciated and remunerated, meaning they'll make profit, they'll get rich, and above all, they'll be loved just as his own productions have been. And one of the simmering horrors of the story Leaving Neverland tells, be that through Michael Jackson's manipulations of them, Jackson was throughout promising their families a version of justice. So those who defend Jackson, even after all the new information about the singer has come to light, they attempt to turn those long-ago promises into an urgent defense by saying they're just in it for the money. That's what they say of the accusers. And this, of course, has its own resonances with many other hashtag me too stories. Leaving Neverland is not a balanced work of legal inquiry. Entertainment Weekly called it woefully one-sided. And that, its director Reed, has assert it from the beginning, be by design. He told CBS this morning, last week or the week before, that this isn't a film about Michael Jackson. It's a film about Wade Robson and James Safechuck, two little boys to whom this dreadful thing happened long ago. But that focus, however, provided some fodder for the critics by alighting some of the details of Safe Chucks and Robson's interactions with the Jackson estate. In particular, the civil suits they filed against said estate. But in an environment that conflates the seeking of justice with the seeking of money, such suits are, of course, no reason to doubt the veracity of the stories the men be telling. On the contrary, one of the gifts Leaving Neverland gives to its subjects, and to its audience. One aligned with the gift Surviving R. Kelly and other similar works have provided of late. B to help dismantle lingering and dangerous assumptions about the perfect victim. Leaving Neverland explores the deeply complicated reasons behind both men's earlier decisions to testify on Jackson's behalf when the star was previously tried for child sexual abuse. Both men suggest that Jackson manipulated their young minds so thoroughly that telling the truth simply wasn't an option. Now, in this context, try to recall the fact that Michael Jackson conducted a mock wedding ceremony with Safe Chuck when he was 10 years old. And Safe Chuck relates this experience directly to the camera, holding up with this tremulous hand the diamond and gold band Michael Jackson gave them as evidence of their lifelong romantic bond. And Michael Jackson told Robson that their sexual encounters were a demonstration of love, but that if other people found out about them, other people being ignorant and judgmental, they'd both go to prison for the rest of their lives. And these all too evident manipulations, entwining love and fear and authority and vulnerability, made for another blurring of lines. The documentary exposes that Jackson created an environment in which it became effectively impossible for the boys to tell where Jackson's welfare ended and their own began. In ignoring all that, in emphasizing the not guilty verdicts of the trial, in dismissing the allegations as defamation spurred by greed, the Jackson truthers fall prey to the same myopias that faith-based reasoning will usually involve. But their perspective has a grain of truth. It'd be much easier, after all, 
simply not to believe. It's intensely preferable to live in a world in which Michael Jackson, the groundbreaker, and the advocate, and the entertainer, and the genius, be innocent. It's much simpler when Billie Jean comes on to give way to the beats you know in your bones and to dance with joyful abandon and to sing along to the profoundly familiar voice when he intones. And mother always told me, be careful of who you love and be careful of what you do because the lie becomes the truth. Now, all of this is what I have dealt with directly on a completely different basis when I'm dealing with educating Americans about losing the Second World War. And they have gone through a Michael Jackson relationship with the federal government all of their lives in which the federal government has played the role of Michael Jackson, giving them all the social benefits they felt they deserve in exchange for the propagation of a myth that doesn't even make any sense. So anyone who, as a legitimately detached individual, first time hears the story of World War II as, as it would be relayed by an American, would understand immediately that none of this makes any sense, that everything the Americans say is a lie, that there's no way in hell the Americans could have won World War II. And yet, the Americans, of course, believe it with a fervor that is beyond religious. And that's what brings us to a directly parallel example, just as a momentary tangent, of this so-called Pete Hero Suzuki, the Jap trash piece of shit, whose family sold biofax simulacra for torture practice to the Department of Defense. And now, of course, tries to propagate the Momo Topa, a caricature of myself, as the lethal bane, literally lethal, as in life-taking, bane against children on the Internet in the name of Michael Aquino. So, when you have this idiot speaking to Peter Moon in a thread, who comes to the defense of Michael Aquino as if he's Michael Jackson and makes various statements about what I've said in the past out of context. Here you've got him saying, and I'll directly quote it, this can be found on Peter Moon's timeline. If you scroll down and look for Peter Moon speaking of the Emperor's speech, you'll see this Jap trash piece of shit and all his entries in the thread. When you open up all the collapsed entries, scroll through the thread itself. The direct quote from Pete Hiro Suzuki says, not sure about your allegiance to DDD or his to you, but he has not provided a single record or photo proving he worked alongside Aquino for a decade. He simultaneously bashes Aquino Yet claims he was out of state during the Presidio molestations. Now I've answered, again in painful detail, all the reality behind Gary Willard Hambright, who Pete Hiro Suzuki also be compelled to defend. When it comes to Michael Aquino, am I confirming that he was out of state during the height of the Presidio molestations? This was not as a child wherein I was somehow confusing morality and reality and fantasy. This came from the crystal clear professional necessity to relay what was entered on record, that Michael Aquino was stationed 
in the District of Columbia area, in the Virginias, working with the child molesters at West Point. At the time, the real shit was going down at its nadir, its most intense, at the Presidio military base for a period of a year into two years in which I was emerging to anyone who had an investigative platform what was going down. And at that time, because he was on record, not in area, stationed elsewhere in the United States, in that sense, I, due to professional necessity, was a defendant of Michael Aquino. This has nothing to do with intimidation. This is what was on the record. And then, of course, I had to say off the record that Michael Aquino had every potential for entering on base without checking in with the military police, without being authorized, without being known via the tunnels. All of this I brought up in chilling detail in Satan's Crusaders, which is on the web for anyone to access anytime they wish. So, when you watch Satan's Crusaders, and you can see me confirm all of this, Michael Aquino was on base. I could not legally say that. I could not professionally say that. But I could tell the investigators, if you want to catch him, it's going to be through the tunnels. Now, of course, when they closed the Presidio military base down, they went to great extent to bomb blast the entrances and seal with layer after layer feet after feet of concrete and steel the tunnels of the Presidio military base. Sealing in potentially for eternity the skeleton of the many children young people kept alive for years never seeing the outside world in those prisons beneath the base. And then when Michael Aquino appears anywhere today, compare the responses he gets on anything from his YouTube videos, his interviews, his appearances. Look on YouTube for Michael Aquino. Find him when he's interviewed by Stephen Outrim's affiliates. Lift the Veil, Jan Urban. Anyone who interviews Michael Aquino, you're going to see when he appears thousands of upvotes, hundreds at the least, glowing commentary like you wouldn't believe. People welcome Michael Aquino the way they do Michael Jackson. He's the Michael Jackson of the American underworld, the undercurrent of the overworld. The people in power who fuck with Epstein are the people who turn to Michael Aquino for their spiritual succor and their philosophical rationalization about what they do. Michael Aquino, like Michael Jackson, will never face justice in this world. Because, just like Michael Aquino, Michael Jackson, as the powerful predators do, hid and hides in plain sight. Jackson included kids in his music videos. Aquino worked by bringing kids on Oprah Winfrey where he could decimate them in the public eye, make them look like fools, and then take the very people he molested and turn them into whimpering worshippers before the eyes of anyone who would listen. Whether it be Christine Joanna Hart or Solaris Blue Raven. But unlike Michael Aquino, 
Jackson went further in the sense of securing legacy. Mike Lucchino has his legacy. His base is developed. His cult is always with him. Jackson, on the other hand, he had to found a charity aimed at the betterment of children. Michael Jackson took a plot of remote Southern California landscape. Its expanse walled off from windswept oaks and sunburnt grass and turned it into an amusement park and a train station and a zoo. A physical endorsement of the insidious fiction that childhood is merely a state of mind. Michael Jackson named the property Neverland. And it was a work of whimsy that doubled as a character witness. Michael Jackson, his own carefully constructed mythology insisted, was merely a boy at heart, robbed of his own childhood, a sympathetic character who had never gotten around to growing up. What cruel adult would refuse Peter Pan the gift of innocence? So one of the several gutting details leaving Neverland includes in its story be the extent to which the castle at the heart of Neverland became, for the boys, indistinguishable from a prison in the tunnels beneath Presidio military base. Jackson's residence, as recalled by both Safe Truck and Robson, featured a complex of corridors with rooms sealed behind a series of locking doors. Jackson used those architectural features to distance parents from their children and crimes from their discovery. He used the trappings of his power and fame to ensnare people who wanted deeply to trust him. Americans might talk about celebrities as celestial forces, but celebrity is also, as Jackson knew, an infrastructure all its own an architectural fact around which other truths, whether art or talent or funding or the longings of the human soul, will assemble themselves. Ancient cultures look to the stars for orientation. We denizens of the modern world do the same. What we haven't figured out yet is what to do when the ground starts to rumble and the sky starts to shake and all around us those stars begin to fall. So just like you saw with Christine Joanna Hart, concerning her inability to detach herself from Michael Aquino, a Solaris Blue Raven, wiggling at Aquino's feet when she interviewed he after her anger with my astral involvement with Christine Joanna Hart and sexual experiments and magic. Just so with all the cultists of Michael Jackson, they show us how it's impossible to leave Neverland. Just as those ladies could never leave Michael Aquino. But for we observers, for the rest of you, outside my experience with such victims, it'd be difficult for anyone to reconcile negative information with positive images. The psychologist named Solomon Osh surname spelled A-S-C-H, first demonstrated that we quickly form impressions of others that filter how we process subsequent information. We easily absorb new information that be consistent with those impressions. But inconsistent information presents more of a cognitive challenge, especially when it suggests contradictory information about a person's morals. For instance, learning that a person we regarded as wholesome has cheated. In other words, the way our brain forms impressions of people influences whether we believe new information about them. So how do you, the Hoi Paloi, reconcile the beloved MJ, one of the best-selling musicians of all time, and the boy you all watched grow up, though he never really did, with the brutality of the allegations against him? One method be to shift responsibility. It wasn't Michael, you all say. T'was his own experience as an abused child coming home to roost. However, while children who be abused, neglected, or grow up experiencing adverse events, 
incontestably have a heightened risk of becoming perpetrators themselves, the overall risk be still relatively small. A researcher named Kathy Spatz Vidom, her surname spelled W-I-D-O-M, she and her colleagues identified two large groups of children, one with abuse histories and another without, but similar demographic characteristics. When they followed these children into adulthood, they found those who had been abused were more than twice as likely to become abusers compared with the non-abused children. Eight and a half percent compared with 3.3 percent. Yet, can this be what gets lost? 91 and a half percent of those abused as children do not become child abusers. It'd be difficult to imagine how anyone who has known the trauma of child abuse can inflict that very same agony on someone else. But it'd be very important to remember that the abusers view their victims as objects. And when they engage in abuse, it'd be entirely without empathy. If we don't blame Michael, perhaps we blame the parents of the boys who failed to protect them from abuse. But countless children have been sexually abused by trusted individuals, family members, coaches, members of the clergy, while parents remain entirely unaware. Many children, such as Wade Robson and James Safechuck, have alleged they were, are being groomed by their abusers from seemingly innocuous behaviors to sexual assault and groomed so insidiously that children may not realize they are being sexually abused, even while it's happening. By the time children understand they're being abused, they themselves feel responsible or guilty for not telling or stopping it sooner, or they may become accustomed to their relationship with the abuser. Threats about the consequences of other people finding out further serve to keep the child from disclosure. Even once parents sense something be wrong, research with mothers has shown that confidence in their suspicions be diminished by many factors, including the belief that it couldn't be because they would have known, because the suspected abuser denies it, and because of what they knew about the suspected abuser, that is, impressions they had already formed. Unfortunately, child sexual abuse happens under the watch of mothers all the time. If we cannot blame someone else, then maybe the alleged victims themselves be lying. After all, why would it take them so long to come forward? Actually, the majority of children who be sexually abused never disclose their abuse as children. And this especially be the case with boys. Why? Grooming and threats play on children's tendency to be egocentric and believe the world revolves around them, that they be the cause of the abuse themselves. Boys may feel additional shame from the violation of masculine norms which I overcame a long time ago, I'm immune to such insanities. An individual named Scott Easton studied this phenomena in nearly half a thousand adult male members of sexual assault survivor groups. The majority, 62%, have been abused by clergy, 11% by family members. The abuse began, on average, at just under 10 years of age and lasted well over a year by the experience of 57% of those so studied. The vast majority of these men did not tell anyone about their sexual abuse during their lifetimes, but on average, it took well over two decades to eventually do so whenever they did so, at an average age of 32 years. Nearly three quarters, 75%, never told anyone throughout their childhoods. Spouses or partners, 27%, and mental health professionals, rating at about 20%, were the first people men would tell. Far from being outliers, Robson and Safechuck are typical for not making their initial allegations of child sexual abuse until they were adults. So in the end, y'all be left with incongruity. The person you adore appears to have been capable of shattering lives. We can all assume that Robson and Chase Chuck will be able to move forward with help. Fans will learn valuable lessons about the complexities and frailties of human beings. 
But even as Michael Jackson's estate fights the allegations, for the king of pop and his legacy, the story may end differently. But what you don't find in leaving Neverland be what I'm going to tell you now. The fact that Michael Jackson enjoyed Trump Tower playtime. Where R. Kelly lives. Pouring out his piss over young girls into their open mouths. Michael Jackson enjoyed playtime with Ivanka, Donald Jr., and Eric Trump. As exposed in their mother's memoir. Celebrities with connections to Michael Jackson... Be already reeling from explosive child sexual abuse allegation. Coming out of leaving Neverland. And these celebrities, as I've articulated, include Corey Feldman, who as a child star was one of the youngsters who, whose own company, the eccentric King of Pop, famously preferred to any and all adults. Feldman's silly... He's about 47 years old now. Still insisting Jackson never molested him. But he's also been forced to spend every day since the release of Leaving Neverland trying to publicly reconcile the sweet, gentle adult friend he claims he knew with a manipulative serial predator exposed by the victims James Safechuck and Wade Robson. And yet through all of this, noticeably silent in the post-Leaving Neverland debate about Jackson's legacy, be the motherfucking Russian-sucking Putinista presidential puppet Donald John Trump. And that silence speaks louder than words, considering that Trump and his family enjoyed a long and sustained friendship with Michael Jackson that began in the 1980s. Trump was also one of Michael Johnson Jackson's most famous defenders after the singer was accused of molesting boys in two separate cases, both in 1993 and 2003. So Michael Joseph Jackson, I said Michael Johnson there. Michael Joseph Jackson was rapidly defended in public and on record by Donald John Trump, the man who would become your puppet president. When, of course, he was on Larry King. Now, this was Trump continuing to speak up for Michael Jackson after Michael Jackson died in 2009. Very similar to Michael Aquino still defending Gary Willard Hambright to this day, decades after Gary Willard Hambright died and be gone. The man who was federally indicted by a federal grand jury for over 14 assaults, all of them against children under four years of age. Gary Willard Hambright, the Baptist minister, my commercial art instructor at John O'Connell Vocational Institute. Here we have a son of a bitch defended by Stephen Howry, who claims John O'Connell was not in the location I described it in. But of course, the original John O'Connell, in which Gary Willard Hambright kept all of his child pornography, maintaining it on-site San Francisco Unified School District property. That John O'Connell on Treat and Harrison Street in the Mission District, which people can verify was there on their own, was demolished to hide all evidence in terms of preventing scandal within the San Francisco Unified School District. John O'Connell, a new one, was built, relocated on the other side of the San Francisco Peninsula. And it's this place that Stephen Alrim claims John O'Connell has always been. A lie. as all the lies that are told by my detractors, my designated gang stalkers, the Aquino cultists. And when you find their lies to be such, take with them the attitude they try 
to pin on myself. Once a liar, always a liar. And when it comes to Stephen Outrim defending Gary Willard Hambright along his master Michael Aquino, after the death of this man decades ago, reflect now on Donald John Trump in the year 2009. Well, after that, as a matter of fact, with Michael Jackson buried in the dirt, and you've got our man Donald Trump himself, then a star in the Michael Jackson sense on the set of Celebrity Apprentice, telling Larry King that Michael Jackson was definitively, I'm going to quote this, Donald Trump verbatim. Not a molester. I'm certain of that. And Donald John Trump recalled to Larry King the times he and Michael Jackson shared at Trump Tower in New York City, where Trump confirmed Michael Jackson lived for extended periods of time. Trump also said Jackson was a regular guest at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach, Florida, where, of course, Trump said he brought in there specifically to, quote-unquote, entertain the kids. So here you have a man expediting a serial child predator and bragging about it. And about Jackson, Donald John Trump, your president, said to Larry King, he was a terrific guy and a wonderful guy. Now, it's likely that D.J. Trump and M.J. Jackson bonded over being rich and famous and their shared interest in cultivating flamboyant, over-the-top personas and lifestyles, but it's just as likely they also bonded over their love of kids. Both of them were fucking Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka. Well, Donald was. Jackson preferred the boys. So he was stuck with Donald Jr. The one they both were fucking might have been Jared Kushner, who, of course, uh, was a girl at the time, then became a man later. Now, it turns out that Michael Jackson himself, now, I want to make it sound as legal as possible, Michael Joseph Jackson. It turns out that Michael Joseph Jackson was also friendly with all the other members of the Trump family. This is confirmed by Donald Trump's first wife, Ivana Trump. During Michael Jackson's residency in Trump Tower in the late 1980s, he spent quite a bit of time in the Trump family triplex. And Ivana Trump wrote all about this in her 2017 memoir entitled Raising Trump. Now, I've actually gone to the effort of purchasing that book, making certain that I read it so I could understand where this woman was coming from. And I can assure you that it's just as disturbing as watching Leaving Neverland. Honestly, I can't really describe how repulsive an experience, a reading experience, that it proved itself to be. But I'm going to do my best to provide some justice to a subject that to me is like analyzing a stool sample, looking for traces of blood or signs of colon cancer. So in this book, Ivana Trump confirms that then 30-year-old Michael Jackson much preferred to hang out with their children Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric than he did with she herself or her husband. Ivana Trump confirms that Michael Jackson was a regular visitor during her children's play dates. At the time, Donald Jr., Ivanka and Eric were around 12, 8, and 5 years of age 
respectively. Ivana Trump wrote, I will quote this from the book, the only person who had an open invitation to come to the triplex for playdates whenever he wanted was Michael Jackson. The King of Pop lived in Trump Tower and was a good friend of the whole family. He'd stop by and chat with Donald and me for but a few minutes. And then he'd go up to the kids' floor and hang out for hours and hours throughout the night. Throughout the night. I mean, that's like, motherfuck. <laughs> like, really? Really? Now, Ivana Trump says Jackson and her children would watch MTV, play Mario Brothers, and Tetris, and use logos to build, <laughs> what else? A miniature Trump Tower. Actually, it was really a phallus, kind of like the pricks, the dildos that everybody was sending to the militia over at the Mueller Bird Observatory. But, you know, um, same difference. Now, Ivanka Trump apparently didn't see anything problematic about Jackson's interest in being with the children. She writes in this book, Michael was a, just a 30-year-old kid. He could relate to Ivanka and the boys better than to us. But given that Ivana Trump's memoir was published eight years after Jackson's death, when the child sex abuse allegations had become a regular and indispensable part of the conversation about him, Ivana Trump neglects to talk about leaving him alone with the kids throughout the night what rationalization she might have had. Instead, she relates how she remembers Jackson creating a near riot when he attended Ivanka's school performance of The Nutcracker. Oh my God. What an apropos title. Well, apparently at the <clears throat> The Nutcracker, one of Ivanka Trump's fellow ballerinas heard Jackson was coming to the show and came up with the idea that all the dancers should wear one white glove in honor of the pop star's signature style. Now, Ivana Trump writes, the teachers were horrified, and the teen dancer was taken to task for even thinking of compromising the costumes of the production. Ivanka was mortified to be the indirect cause of the tension, but she didn't let it affect her performance. <laughs> I'm sure that Donald said that in bed, too. Yeah, you know, she was mortified, but she didn't let that affect her performance. In any case, Michael Jackson told Ivana Trump that Ivanka looked like an angel that night. And, um, there we go. So, Michael Jackson's defenders are starting to sound like conspiracy theories. The Michael Jackson the Innocent Industrial Complex isn't so different from QAnon Pizza Gators. As I myself was watching Leaving Neverland, you've got this documentary rolling before my eyes, focusing on James Safechuck and Wade Robson, relating Michael Jackson's their experiences of he raping them when they're children. And through it, I most certainly experienced a barrage of thoughts and emotions, but never once did I ever think, I wonder if he really did it. I noticed that the testimony of the two accusers, plus a massive amount of supporting evidence, overwhelmingly confirms the fact that Michael Jackson did. Now, contributing to this reality be that every bit of evidence that be in any way ambiguous be easily explained sans any large logical leap. I noticed that safe Chuck and Robson be telling the truth. It's all over their faces, in their words, in the details, and in all the supporting evidence. It's also all in keeping with what we all know about child molestation, the dynamics of abuse, and the legal system, which I've articulated to you in excruciatingly painful detail. So to enumerate the three major areas of defense of Michael Jackson, one, there are many young men Jackson didn't molest. Two, Wade Robson testified under oath that Michael Jackson didn't molest him, raising the question, was he lying then or be he lying now? The answer, of course, be then, 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 motherfuckers. And three, Robson and Safechuck, be after the money. 
Now, the issue of these two accusers' financial motivations be at the center of the campaign to discredit them. Michael Jackson's defenders take the notion of a perfect victim to an extreme. They seem to demand that the only believable Michael Jackson accuser be one who suffers abuse from one of the wealthiest entertainers of all time without ever seeking any recompense for years of therapy. Costly, as you can imagine. Astronomically so, if you've ever seen a psychiatrist yourself. Throughout all the years of anguish and their personal and ultimately, what one must presume to be professional paralysis. Most people who are thus abused usually become unemployable. So the director of Leaving Neverland, Dan Reed, has acknowledged that his subjects have and are suing Michael Jackson because victims of abuse be entitled to compensation from their abusers. The wrongly convicted be entitled to money from the state. Users of defective products get money from companies. People discriminated against in the workplace get money from their employers. So the main purveyors of the money argument be the lawyers for the Jackson estate. The attorney's motivation be to protect the estate's huge pile of shit fuck money. That doesn't discredit the attorney's arguments in and of itself. But we can't think of this as a smoking gun of witness impeachment. If we believe the attorney's arguments, then we are believing the argument of people being paid to argue that you can't believe the arguments of people who are in it for the pay. Can you wrap your fucking brains around that one? Now, in addition to the attorneys, thousands of people be eager to defend their God, Michael Jackson. In some cases, these people be related to the Jackson family, like Taz Jackson, son of Michael's brother, Tito. Taj told Sky News in an interview, I can tell you I've been around people where I've just gotten that energy, and it's an energy that you're like, that's a bad person, I'll stay away from them. And if I think I ever felt that way about my uncle, just one hint of it, I wouldn't be here defending him. I wouldn't. Now, I myself have no reason to believe that Taj's motives are about anything but the sincere belief that his dead uncle be innocent. But he neatly eludes the fact that his fortunes, as well as his father's, be tied to the reputation of Michael Jackson. Taj and Tito be recording artists and entertainers. To the extent that the public has any interest in their output, it be certainly due to their association with beloved musical superstar Michael Jackson and nothing else, as they themselves be absolutely talentless. So once that association becomes connected to the reviled child molester, Michael Jackson, their earning potentials will plummet too. It doesn't disqualify them from making an argument, mind you, but it informs the argument. So far, the most prominent print piece to defend Michael Jackson ran in Forbes magazine. The people who bring you the Forbes millionaires list, among other things. And this piece was writ by the music journalist Joe Vogel. And to quote as he, as someone who has done an enormous amount of research on the artist, interviewed many people who were close to him, and been granted access to a lot of private information, my assessment be that the evidence simply does not point to Michael Jackson's guilt. <laughs> well, Vogel hadn't even seen the documentary when he wrote that. His Twitter feed be filled with people who knew Jackson well and say they never, ever thought that Jackson would in any way harm a child. In other words, he's quoting people who, if they be wrong, were blind to or countenanced child molestation. That's a motivation there. In other words, people who are child molesters themselves. The kind you find in Trump Tower, where all the alleged rapists seem to live. So Vogel focuses on the dynamic that here be a black man accused and the public, if they believe leaving Neverland, be believing white accusers. Vogel himself writing, it's no accident that one of Jackson's favorite books and movies was To Kill a Mockingbird, a story about a black man named Tom Robinson destroyed 
by false white allegations. That could be your favorite book. And you also could have abused little boys. Still, Vogel goes on to write, I quote his T, dozens of individuals who spent time with Jackson as kids continue to assert nothing sexual ever happened. This includes hundreds of sick and terminally ill children, such as Bella Farkas, for whom Jackson paid for a life-saving liver transplant, and Ryan White, whom Jackson befriended and supported in his final years battling AIDS. Okay, so Jackson didn't sexually abuse kids who would give him AIDS or who were so sick they were on life support. You know, it is hard to get it up and fuck a person on life support. I haven't tried it myself, but it looks pretty difficult. In fact, it doesn't look like it's worth the effort and that it would, you know, um, hurt, if not the recipient of the affection. It would certainly hurt the person with all the plastic pins pricking out from this person that, you know, you could prick yourself, etc. It's just not something, you know, that would be pursued by anybody seeking any gratification so uh when it comes to all of that um i myself you know it could run into my favorite porno actress and if she were in that connection where you know she had full-blown aids i wouldn't be fucking her either so it's also important to remember that jackson in not sexually abusing white or farkas the liver transplant recipient and the kid dying of aids he met these people, like, motherfucking twice. I'm talking, like, twice, if that, each. And it's like, not that he had time, aside from their baseline conditions themselves being a total turnoff, there's a sense of timing involved. So, in all of that, we are left with kind of just a, a complete befuddlement on my own part for how anyone could listen to this and not break out just laughing at the presumption that you would actually eat this shit up. I mean, how can anyone be the recipient of this level of bullshit and actually say this is even worth responding to? I myself wasn't surprised at the weakness of Vogel's argument because I myself have a pretty low opinion of Forbes magazine. And that inkling aligns with another feeling that I was having as I evaluated the arguments of the Michael Jackson defenders. Because they're all parallel the impassioned online rambling of the QAnon pizza gators or the absolutely unhinged Hillary is a sex trafficker type. The QAnon crowd, if you remember they. Their screens flash and blink. Their clip art greats. Their sentences are always ungrammatical. Their YouTube videos go on forever. And their Twitter names have four emoji in them. So it's quite telling that in these weeks in which Leaving Neverland was the dominant topic of cultural conversation, in which Slate magazine alone has published over 20 pieces about the documentary and the charges, that there has yet to emerge in any bona fide journalistic outlet even one cogent defense of Michael Jackson from the charges of abuse. Now, perhaps I myself of being a snob, an argument needn't be exquisitely crafted for it to be true. On the other hand, it's like all those miracle cures available only in this exclusive TV offer. If it really worked, don't you think doctors would use it? Wouldn't America's retailers want in on these amazing products? When an argument comes packaged in a dented and soggy box, it somehow invites skepticism. Appearances do count. So when I'm confronted with these arguments presented as they are in the most insane fashion, 
I'm left speechless by how people would eat the cereal out of this dented and soggy box. Why would they even pour it when as it comes out, as in the days when I lived in the Tenderloin ghetto, when we poured our cereal out, we'd have wriggling roaches that would come out amongst the flakes instead of raisins. That's how these arguments present themselves. And it's because of that, when I see other people eating them, stuffing those roaches into their mouths and apparently enjoying it, I get physically ill. So I'm not quite sure how all of these guys go on and they're able to keep selling what they're selling. I mean, just smell the shit you're cooking and it causes one to gag. But people keep eating the shit. Nevertheless, when the argument comes poorly packaged, it doesn't mean the argument be bad in and of itself. But if it were any good, wouldn't someone with a little more credibility put it forward? A better journalist might pursue it. It would get play in a higher quality publication. Instead, the Michael Jackson, the innocent industrial complex, be churning out medium ramblings and extensive hit jobs from YouTube, which cites a post Robson made on social media about the power of visualization and asserting that such practices caused him to concoct stories about Jacksonian abuse. In a different age, one of gatekeepers and professional standards, such ideas wouldn't be entertained, and the shoddy aesthetic around them would be an indictment of their credibility. But gatekeepers now be considered undemocratic, and professionalism itself be considered elitist. Gatekeepers kept marginalized voices from being heard, that be true. Some of those marginalized voices were and are truth tellers from oppressed community. The overwhelming majority be wackadoo conspiracists oppressed by a series of real life acquaintances who have smiled and walked away very slowly, backing away without taking their eyes off the lunatic. Now, one of the things that I need to bring to attention, of course, to um, my lovely uh, Volcano Crown Princess across the Pacific, be that she's uh, speaking to me while I'm transmitting. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I just want to bring that to her attention. I don't think she's aware of it. And uh, I should be off transmission sometime soon in the very near future. Uh, but uh, do need to bring that up right now because she is sending me some messages. Uh, so um, let's get the, that out of the way and kiss on to her. I hope, uh, hopefully that doesn't, um, shall we say, uh, put her off. I still have to, of course, uh, talk to Ramona Halifa Henry about... Uh, republishing her post and uh, making certain that I uh, uh, enter in thread the Momo uh, joke that uh, she found so offensive before. Um, so um, what I need to uh, get back into with our narrative at hand, the, the concept of our, uh, shall we say, presentation of argument. So I do believe that the vast majority of people who watched the documentary that I've been alluding to, or shall we say, uh, addressing in detail, uh, I do believe that the majority of people who have reviewed it or thought much about any of the allegations against Jackson over all these years have come to the conclusion of my own. This guy's guilty. No need to dedicate my life to it. But for people who insist on believing, and I emphasize the word belief, that Jackson's innocent, 
it's become a cause. Now, three years ago, if I had personally encountered troves of weirdly packaged, poorly argued, strangely formatted, amateurish defenses of Michael Jackson, I'd have regarded that as an indication that there aren't any good defenses for Michael Jackson. I'd have actually evaluated this evidence and found that it comes up lacking, not just in presentation, but in substance. And that's exactly what I've done with the Michael Jackson popular defense front tonight. The poor difference be that back then, I would take all these wild claims and conclude that their ungodly amateurish presentation be indicative that the Michael Jackson, the innocent side of the argument was failing. Only unserious people were taking it seriously. Now, I cannot afford to immediately come to that conclusion. The defenders, like the Pizzagate folks, have advantages in terms of virality and resilience that I had never counted on before. Connected and impassioned just might beat staid and correct factuality. So Michael Jackson's misdeeds are incontrovertibly appalling. The rebuttals to Michael Jackson's misdeeds be in shambles. But the fact that this ham-handed and tawdry propaganda campaign may very well be enough to prevent us all from achieving consensus be what actually depresses me. And that's what brings us out of the realm of the culture of our prison rape society to jurisprudence. Because this be the same reason why Trump's supporters will believe any lie he tells. From Kavanaugh to Kosoji, Trump cultists be immune to truth. President Donald Trump has been bending and breaking laws all of his life. Michael Cohen, his longtime personal lawyer, stated under oath that Trump directed him to violate federal campaign finance law. The state of New York itself has evidence that Trump and his family have been cheating on their taxes for years. The Trump dynasty's persistently illegal conduct and repeated and willful self-dealing transactions have led the New York Attorney General to file a lawsuit against the Trump Foundation. The list goes on and on forever. We don't have that long. I don't have the patience. Trump, in turn, be quite open about his disdain for law. In April, he told an audience in Michigan last year that our laws are so corrupt and so stupid, they don't need to be followed. Trump be also clear about why he'd be breaking these laws. The entire point of Trump's campaign to make America great again, hashtag MAGA, be to lead us back to a time before the civil rights movement, before laws against insider trading, before the New Deal and federal agencies that regulate the commerce of plutocrats, peoples who govern by money. This was an era of all-white, all-male supremacy. The rich paid no income taxes, and there was no minimum wage. So the wealthy lived as royalty. Trump's thinking be akin to the way past activists viewed sit-down strikes. Like these past civil dissenters, Trump views himself as breaking the laws that he doesn't believe should exist which includes most of the laws and regulations put in place since the 1930s. Indeed, instead of preparing traditional legal defense, Trump be confounding legal observers by doing things that, by all objective standards, should make matters worse. He obstructs justice openly. In fact, in vowing to fight back against the Mueller investigation, Donald Trump announced his intention to continue obstructing the probe. He also continually changes his story. First, he denies everything, 
I have nothing to do with Russia. Then he says there would be nothing wrong. Now, we had, of course, a shutdown. We are now back on, and I will continue narrative. We'll wrap this up. Uh, so, uh, basically, though I despise the uh, um, misemployment of the uh, use of the word, um, you know, the, the misuse of the word fascism, uh, it's one of those things that, of course, has become a uniquely uh, negative word in the political lexicon of the West. There is, nevertheless, a classic work that's entitled The Anatomy of Fascism that was written by a Robert O. Paxton. And in this work, he defines a cult of leadership, what Adolf Hitler termed Führer Prinzip the Fuhrer principle, is known in the West as a cult of leadership, defined by Robert Paxton as one in which the followers believe the leader's instincts be better than the logic used by elites. The followers be willing to give up their individuality and freedom in exchange for the leader's protection. So, just what does Trump protect his followers from? The scholars, Sharon Stenner and Jonathan Haidt, offer an explanation. The man, his name, Jonathan Haidt, his surname is spelled H-A-I-D-T. The lady, Karen Stenner, her surname is spelled S-T-E-N-N-E-R. So Stenner and Haidt offer the explanation in their essay entitled, Authoritarianism is Not a Momentary Madness, but an eternal dynamic within liberal democracies. Now, that's one hell of a title, and it's quite unwieldy. I will repeat it. It's authored, co-authored, by the authoress Stenner and the author Haight, whose names I've spelled. The title itself, The Authoritarianism is Not a Momentary Madness, but an Eternal Dynamic Within Liberal Democracies. Now, on reviewing this piece, it describes the psychology behind the fervor of the embrace of authoritarians. A certain percentage of the population has bias against different others. Biased against different others, inclusive racial and other minority outgroups. The authoritarian leader stokes their fears, creating a normative threat. These people then turn to the leader as a savior. The leader embraces the mythic destiny of the nation. He doesn't follow laws. He is the law. So when Sarah Huckabee Sanders defended Donald Trump's lies by arguing that his false statements actually point to something true, she herself offered an explanation for why Trump supporters embrace transparent lies. President Barack Hussein Obama was trafficking children, for example, be a provable lie. But it points towards what Trump supporters see as a deeper truth. That President Obama be black and therefore is intrinsically evil. So Sanders' argument in defense of her president be psychologically sound. Other scholars have joined in the discourse concerning this crisis, this existential crisis, via a work entitled, this is a article, not a book, it's entitled, The Authentic Appeal of the Lying Demagogue. There's no less than three co-authors, the scholars Oliver Howe, Minye Kim, and Ezra W. Zickerman. Their surnames are spelled Hal, H-A-H-L. Minye Kim is obviously Korean. The surname is spelled exactly as it sounds, Kim. And Ezra W. Zickerman is spelled 
very much as it sounds as well. Though her full name is Ezra W. Zickerman Sivan, surname spelled S-I-V-A-N, now that I remember. Uh, and in their article entitled The Authentic Appeal of the Lying Demagogue, these scholars explain that those who want to destroy the political establishment willingly embrace a liar because they understand that the lies themselves serve a destructive purpose. The people who want to destroy the political establishment today be those who be threatened by growing diversity. Trump's lies work towards that end. In a totalitarian regime, state-controlled media normalizes the leader's constantly changing stories, which serves to further obliterate any notion of a shared truth. Trump's favorite news outlets similarly normalize his changing stories, thereby undermining factual reality itself. The concept of factuality becomes non-extant. When people can no longer sort out what be factual and what be invented, they conclude that the truth be unknowable. It's the ultimate in relativism and skepticism. This is the anti-godly philosophy of solipsism, which I have exposed as the ultimate gateway to evil, the ultimate portal for warping and fraying the fabric of reality that the anti-gods may enter and impose upon us a realm of absolute chaos. Without facts and a shared reality, jury verdicts have no meaning, and the results of law enforcement investigations be easily manipulated or even dismissed. Look at what happened when Brett Kavanaugh's nomination for the Supreme Court was nearly derailed by credible accusations of sexual assault. While the confirmation was in doubt, Trump protested that Kavanaugh was innocent until proven guilty. He then ordered an extremely limited investigation of the charges that interviewed an exceedingly small number of witnesses and did not even deign to speak with the accuser or the alleged culprit. Ultimately, he falsely declared that Kavanaugh had been proven innocent by the whole charade. This false fact, Kavanaugh being exonerated, now becomes reality to all Trump cult followers. The same exact dynamic be playing out with the murder by Saudi Arabia of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. It played out months ago. Trump applied the innocent until proven guilty notion to the Saudi state even directly comparing the case to Kavanaugh's. Despite the reported audio evidence of Khashoggi's brutal dismemberment at the hands of Saudi officials, physical evidence of an attempted cover-up, and the plain fact that Khashoggi entered a Saudi consulate never to be seen again, Trump treated the case as a stone-cold whodunit. Don't be surprised, as I was not, that when in spite of all available evidence, the cover story eventually manufactured for the Saudi crown prince Mohammed bin Salman and all other probable culprits was ultimately accepted by, as fact by Trump himself and then by his followers. So once again, the lie became the fact. That is the thematic of Michael Aquino's detractors in forging false documentation involving my military service, and then insisting that this fabricated documentation, this fabricated evidence, be condemnatory of myself. The lie becomes the fact within the mind of the cultists of Aquino and the cultists of Aquino's own cultist, Donald Trump. Steve Bannon explained a broader administration strategy for dispensing with the facts. He said, the real opposition be the media, and the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. This is his exact quote. So in his groundbreaking book, The Road to Unfreedom, Yale professor Timothy Snyder, surname spelled S-N-Y-D-E-R, explained the details of how leaders like Vladimir Putin and Donald John Trump, Putin's puppet, undermine factuality by flooding the zone with shit. 
And in this very sewer shit, Putin dominates Russia by propagating grand lies that take the entire society off balance. For example, when Ukrainians protested against Putin's puppet ruler, Viktor Yanukovych, Putin's press reported that the protesters were organized by a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer group attempting a homo dictatorship. Enough people believed the lie, or pretended to believe the lie, that a shared reality became impossible, as it has here in these United States. This is Russian sewage that we are all drowning under. We're opening our mouth in disbelief and swallowing turds by the hole as we do so. The turds are sliding down our throat, and people are still swallowing them. Part of Trump's defense against his various investigatory pursuers be to persuade his followers that all politicians be corrupt liars, which be one reason to lock her up. And the lock her up chant has proven itself so devastating and never stops. If people believe this, all politicians be corrupt, going after Trump becomes political persecution of a singular man, a witch hunt. Trump's final aim isn't simply to escape accountability for his crime. The final aim be to replace democracy itself with a form of autocracy under which he and his cronies be forever unaccountable for all their criminal actions. Their test case was Jeffrey Epstein. So just as Jeffrey Epstein normalized child rape for Donald Trump and all his friends, Donald Trump normalizing lies and flooding the zone with, as Steve Bannon said, pure shit shatters the public sphere upon which democracy depends. Without that shared reality, Mueller poses no threat to Donald Trump. Similarly, without the shared public sphere, Trump doesn't have to worry about resistance. As the Yale professor Jason Stanley has observed, Without truth, it'd be impossible to speak truth to power. So there'd be only power. The United States is now on a very steep learning curve because truth, factuality, and our very public sphere be under attack. Therefore, our democracy and the constitutional republic itself be in danger. This attack be devastatingly effective partly because we have never experienced anything like this before, and thus largely unprepared. Our task now be to save our public sphere. The way to do this was demonstrated by how the Chileans got out of the far more extreme Pinochet regime and reinstated democracy. All sides opposed to authoritarianism and committed to democracy worked together. That means they actually started talking and listening to one another. In the United States, this would mean that all groups that claim to be committed to continuing our democratic republic, from supporters of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to never-Trump Republicans, would need to join forces. Now, we're going to find out all too soon if our nation be up to this task. And I feel it will come to civil war. That's what brings us to the last man who took us down that trail to alumni and perdition, Andrew Jackson, the closest we have to an experience with Donald Trump. If it were possible to have a bromance across the centuries, Presidents Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump would almost certainly qualify. This takes us from the black Jackson, Michael Jackson, the child abuser, to Andrew Jackson, the slave-owning genocidal. Because Donald Trump, who's praised Michael Jackson and defend him beyond death, has done the same beyond death to Andrew Jackson. Throughout 2017, the year before, the year before yesteryear, Trump repeatedly invoked and praised his predecessor in the White House, who served from 1829 through 1837. And in addition to various mentions and remarks and on Twitter, Trump placed a portrait of Jackson 
in the Oval Office and made a pilgrimage to the late president's tomb in Nashville less than two months after being sworn in. Now, per J.M. Opal, surname spelled O-P-A-L, a historian at McGill University, the author of a book entitled Avenging the People, Andrew Jackson, The Rule of Law and the American Nation, says he, Trump be the first president to so openly admire and point to Andrew Jackson as a model and to borrow so clearly and explicitly from the language of Jacksonian democracy. It has been more common for 20th century presidents to model themselves on recent leaders whom they personally knew. For instance, Lyndon Johnson admired Franklin Roosevelt, and William Jefferson Clinton made his childhood meeting with John F. Kennedy a touchstone of his career. Trump's affection for Jackson drew new attention on May 1st of 2017, when during an interview on Sirius XM's POTUS channel, the President of the United States' own channel, the President told the Washington Examiner's Selena Zito, he said, I mean, had Andrew Jackson been a little bit later, you wouldn't have had the Civil War. He was a very tough person, but he had a big heart. He was really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War. He said, there's no reason for this. Now, almost immediately, critics took issue with Trump's historical accuracy. The Washington Post, Aaron Blake, called Trump's grasp of history totally bizarre, noting, among other things, that Jackson died a decade and a half before the goddamn Civil War. Now, Trump responded with a tweet on the evening of May 1st, writing, President Andrew Jackson, who died 16 years before the Civil War started, saw it coming and was angry, would never have let it happen. Uh, at times, Jackson was a popular figure and considered one of the nation's greatest presidents, and those were dark days indeed. For generations, many state and local Democratic parties held Jefferson Jackson dinners to celebrate two of the biggest names in their party's history, and some still do. Now, per Harry L. Watson, a historian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the author of the book entitled Liberty and Power, The Politics of Jacksonian America, stated he, and I quote as verbatim, patrician historians of the late 19th century saw Jackson as ignorant and destructive, but praised him as a strong supporter of the Union. Progressives of the early 20th century saw him as a popular hero who fought special interests. New Dealers praised him as a strong president and a champion of working-class democracy. But Trump's fondness for Jackson comes at the nadir of a low reputational ebb, a historical moment now when all too many Americans, for Trump's days, have begun to focus on the darker side of Jackson's record. And high on that list be Andrew Jackson's personal history as a slaveholder, and his implementation as president of a policy of Indian removal from eastern lands that culminated in the Trail of Tears, which led to the deaths of an estimated 5,000 Cherokee Native Americans. In recent years, Jackson's offenses against Indians and blacks and his propensity for personal gun violence have overshadowed his economic policies amongst liberals and progressives. H. Lee Cheek, Jr., a historian at East Georgia State College, who has written about early 19th century American history, has confirmed that Trump has not paid enough attention to the more problematic sides of Jackson's legacy. To quote as he, the Trump endorsement of Jackson follows from his very limited understanding of Jackson as a man of action. Trump has no knowledge of the misdeeds of Jackson that be central to a complete understanding of Jackson's political career. Emblematic of this modern-day discontent with Jackson be the move by Barack Obama's Treasury Department in 2016 to take Jackson off the front of the $20 bill, making way for a portrait of abolitionist Harriet Tubman. Jackson was ultimately to appear in a less conspicuous spot on the back of our $20 bill. The move drew criticism from Donald Trump, then already a presidential candidate, who saw it as an example of political correctness. So on NBC's Today Show, Trump said, well, Jackson, Andrew Jackson had a great history, and I think it's very rough when you take somebody off the bill. I would love to leave Andrew Jackson or see if we can maybe come up with another denomination. Now, this wasn't the first time Trump had cited Jackson. He did so in passing in a July 10th, 2013 tweet in which at real Donald Trump, he said, interesting, the last time a Democrat succeeded a two-term Democratic president 
was in 1836 when Martin Van Buren succeeded Andrew Jackson. Now, Martin Van Buren's birthday was December 5th, the same birthday as my late and sainted Cyrus, my mother, Diana Zuchin Lynn Dietrich. So I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Martin Van Buren. But the $20 bill redesign seemed to kick off a period in which Donald Trump and his circle increasingly associated the candidate himself, Donald Trump, with the former president, Andrew Jackson. And after Trump's election, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, a Trump advisor, compared Trump favorably with Jackson, saying, this is like Andrew Jackson's victory. This is the people beating the establishment. And that's how he, Donald Trump, posited right from the beginning. And another top Trump advisor, the Steve Bannon we all know and hate, also compared Trump to Jackson on two occasions. And the New York Times' Peter Baker offered a side-by-side comparison of the two presidents, including seemingly strong similarities in their man-of-the-people styling, their pugnaciousness, and even their eccentric hairstyle. Per H.W. Brands, a historian at the University of Texas, Austin, and the author of the book entitled Andrew Jackson, His Life and Time, says he, President Trump seems to like the tough guy persona of Andrew Jackson. There'd be no question that Jackson was decisive and that he cared nothing for political propriety. But some historians also see an intriguingly shared dichotomy. Both Jackson and Trump professed to care about the ordinary man, yet both came from great wealth. They each railed against political elites, but were less outspoken in their criticism against other types of rich and powerful Americans. You see, they only hated the educated. Jackson had been a large import-export merchant, an attorney and a judge, and was, as of the 1820s, one of the largest slave owners in central Tennessee, a man of immense power over the days and hours of even the lives of whether someone could live or die, that he held over approximately a 1,000 enslaved blacks not to mention dozens and dozens, hundreds of white debtors. Yet in his idea of the people, Andrew Jackson presented himself. In other words, he personated himself as an ordinary fellow, a regular Joe. That's a very strange kind of populism. Still, several historians have cautioned against going overboard in comparing Jackson and Trump. For instance, Trump a real estate developer, never served in the military and never served in elected office until he won the presidency. Whereas Andrew Jackson, by contrast, was a celebrated general, genocidal though he was, a member of both chambers of Congress and a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court. So Trump supporters don't know it, but they are losing the war. Now, there'll be several foolproof tests for an ignoramus. Spending your life savings on Powerball tickets, be one. Honoring an email request that opens with dearest one and asks for a hefty loan in fractured English, be another. And as, of course, we mark the first full month of Donald Trump's third year in office, we have another indication of intractable stupidity, crowing about how Trump won the election and liberals need to get over it. You can find such sentiments to cite, just by example, on any of my own Facebook timelines, comment threads, following comment columns that I myself writ and published that be critical of the president. Now, Trumpish triumphalism betrays buffoonery for a simple reason. Any general knows the difference between winning a battle and winning the war. The drunken euphoria over November 2016 has left many Trump voters too tipsy forever to see the evidence that their side is forfeiting the war for the future. Whatever Trump's personal prospects in 2020 and his party's prospects as they were blown to smithereens in November's midterms last year. If Trumpism and the Republican Party were patients, they'd be on suicide watch now. Trump lost the popular vote in 2016, 
by many hundreds of millions of votes, hardly a promising springboard to re-election. That might matter less if he spent more time in his first year addressing real problems and less time potty-mouthing immigrants and throwing in with his party's ossified plutocrats in a fossilized Congress. He chose otherwise that year to open his administration. And meanwhile, all those plutocrats, rulers by money, repaid his support for the supply-side tax cuts by shelving conservatives' traditional concern for manners and civility, accepting wholeheartedly a thug in the Oval Office. And the result was that millennials and all people of color who had a cell of brain in their body, the voters of the future, have found the Republican Party radioactively unsupportable. If you back the president and think the foregoing point be just sour grapes from a never-Trumper, you should stop listening now. You should never have been listening in the first. Because there's survey evidence long ago corroborated Republicans' long-term peril from yesteryear. Online pollster Survey Monkey last year asked over 600,000 Americans their view of Trump. Matter of fact, this was their second polling. They had done the same in 2017. And the results, in line with all other polls each year, showed more people disapproving of the president's job than approving. But it was the breakdown of precisely who approved and disapproved that'd be revealing. Survey Monkey found that among most white millennials, disapproval of Trump ran a staggering 62 to 76 percent, over three quarters. Among white male millennials without college, part of Trump's base, Trump's approval disapproval rates were an underwhelming 50 50 tie. To be precise, it was 49 49 with 2 percent abstaining to comment. Overwhelming majorities of African Americans disapprove of Trump's performance. Among Hispanics, his highest approvals come only from men over 50 years of age. Among Hispanic women of all age groups, Trump's pure toxic shit. In short, Trump hasn't solved the demographic dilemma that troubled Republican pollster Whit Ayers even before the billionaire Trump declared his own candidacy. And Ayers at the time said groups that form the core of Republican support, older whites, blue-collar whites, married people and rural residents are declining as a proportion of the electorate. Groups that lean Democratic, minorities, young people, and single women are growing. Now, for now, many white voters fear the inevitable browning of America. And that fact, plus Hillary Clinton's shortcomings and the idiosyncrasy of the Electoral College, all handed Trump victory only with the decisive intercession of Russian hacking. Even with all that, it took a Russian hack to make this punk president. But SurveyMonkey found Trump's antics over the last two years cost him support among two groups critical to his 2016 coalition. That year, 66% of whites without college degrees voted for him. But his first year in office shaved 10 points off that support. Meanwhile, white voters with four years of college gave Donald 48% of their votes two years ago. But even prior to the midterms last year, only 40% were approving of him within a year and a half of his administration. So if those comparatively current events suggest Trump's movement doesn't have legs, so does history. Some analysts have seen the 45th president's supporters as revanchists, seeking territory lost by the 19th century know-nothings, the xenophobes who won congressional and gubernatorial elections but never the presidency. The Irish and other immigrants they sought to keep out of America came nonetheless and assimilated despite the haters. Know-nothingism hit its expiration date quickly. Others have compared Trump's minion to those of segregationist George Wallace, after Wallace lost his third-party presidential bid in 1968, there was no talk of repealing that era's historic civil rights laws or otherwise accommodating his Jim Crow-loving voters. 
Wallace's crusade fell into history's trash can, too. The closest analogy would be the country's seventh and first elitist president who personified, personated himself as populist, Andrew Jackson, who, like Trump, actually captured the White House. Now, as a racist racist, Andrew Jackson owned slaves who moth died under his torment. And he signed the law that forcibly cleared Native Americans off their lands. Trump adorned not only the Oval Office with his hero's portrait, but also with pathological insensitivity. He dressed as Andrew Jackson during an award ceremony for Native Americans in the November of his first year in office back in 2017. Jackson's own populist, as he called them, actually elitist endeavors, included abolishing the Bank of the United States, which did very long-lasting economic harm. It was tremendous in its repercussions, making generations of recessions worse before the Federal Reserve was finally created to take its place in 1913. For the thousands who died during the Trail of Tears, removal sparked by Jackson's Native American removals, Andrew Jackson as president was lethally, permanently effective in his genocide. They would never see amends because they would never live to see them, nor would their generations to come thereafter. Hundreds of thousands of Native American children who would have been born were never born because their mothers died on that trail of termination. And a far more prosperous America never came into being because of Andrew Jackson actually bragging on his tombstone, on his headstone, B, chiseled the boast, I killed the Bank of the United States, thereby killing the financial future for generations of Americans condemning the United States itself to a third world misdevelopment for well nigh a hundred fucking years. But all these tragedies and travesties aside, our nation did expunge Jacksonian politics. We abolished slavery. We created the Fed. And we advanced the still unfinished business of civil rights for all, a work in progress. And like old Hickory, as Andrew Jackson was wont to be called, our current president has done enormous damage. Torturing immigrants, succoring white supremacists, obstructing the fight against climate change and inequality. Republican politicians at the state level, unlike their craven counterparts in Congress, distance themselves from Trump as they're forced to proclaim We're the Republican Party, but we're not crazy. So those politicians can read the tea leaves in a country that's decreasingly white and where the young shall inherit the franchise. In the short run, Trump may be elected in 2020. With Russian hacking, due to his total destruction of our cybersecurity infrastructure, with his attacks on the FBI and his government shutdowns preventing any budgets from being run, to be dedicated to such tasks, it will happen. And, of course, the Republicans held on to half of Congress November last year. All that leads to a second Trump term. But in the longer term, however, Trump's America, like Jackson, cannot survive. And that's why, in closure to the night's transmission, it's so important to emphasize the words of Danny Deutsch, who just, some 72 hours ago, on March 7th, said, I believe Donald Trump is not beyond starting a civil war to keep power forever. Now, Danny Deutsch, the a New York City ad executive and a longtime friend of Michael Cohen, And he's told MSNBC's Hardball 
Wednesday night last week that he believes President Trump is not beyond starting a civil war to keep himself in office. To quote his team, he said, I believe whether he's going to be impeached, whether that is qualifying him for running for office, even if he gets elected out, he will tell his people to take to the streets. Adding that he's known Donald Trump himself for 20 fucking years. And he said, I know that sounds extreme. That's who this man is. So, Johnny Deutsch, to quote his team verbatim, in his final warning that he himself was quoting verbatim from Michael Cohen, in Michael Cohen's own testimony, According to Donnie Deutsch, he said, and I thought this and said this before, Donald Trump, we will not have a peaceful transition. And that's the words of Michael Cohen coming from the mouth of Donnie Deutsch. And as for Donnie Deutsch himself, to quote as he verbatim, he said, Donald Trump, I believe, whether he's going to be impeached, whether they're disqualifying him for running for office, even if he gets elected out, he will tell his people to take to the streets. I know that sounds extreme. That's who this man is. There's 30% of this country that he believes he owns. And he does actually own them. The normal things we see, peaceful transition, I believe Donald Trump is not beyond starting a civil war. Chris, I've known this man for 20 years. If you watch every one of his plays, he tees off what he is going to do. I know we're headed for a very ugly time in American history. I'm sad to say that. Well, I'm not sad to relate that because that's what I've been relating for years now. And if we're headed in the direction of civil war and the nation as we know it will come out a very different form, it's going to be the enemy that pays the price. It will be the Republicans who will be deported en masse as a single party state based on true democracy under the Democratic Party rebuilds America and reconstructs in aftermath of the coming civil war. But the only way you're going to win that civil war, the only way you'll survive, is via your Vulcan intervention. And your only Vulcan interventionist be myself. Douglas Dietrich, the son of Adolf Hitler, the man on Russian Hill, guiding you through this time of Russian occupation and satanic machination. So with that in mind, we close transmission tonight. My love unto all who support me. Our damnation on all those who attack myself the damnation they seek as Satanists, be theirs eternal. And unto those in between, guide them down the right path towards the man who stands against the alternative right, Douglas Dietrich. No one else will hear me otherwise. They literally murdered the man who would have made my film. There may be others in the future, and I may meet them. Through Peter Moon, we'll see as our work continues. But the one thing all of you must see is that I'm the one option you have to get out of this alive. So with that in mind, good night be unto thee, and join us, of course, on Wednesday. And from there, we'll see where we go next. I, I presume we're live. I presume we're live. And uh, what I'm going to count on is a stream link. There we are. We've got a link. I should be hearing an echo soon. And what I'm going to wait for is an echo. I'm hoping there's a delay. Wow. All right. Already got five thumbs down. 
that's uh, all my gang stalkers are here tonight. That means at least three people. And uh, so that's going to. There are. Okay. So, uh, and uh, so counting on Daniel, Rolla, and Paul to put their likes in here as well on the stream. They can go to the live stream there. And our man Daniel can start talking. He can take over for a period of time. I must be really tripping these fuckers out to get all of them to gang up at once. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so there we are. And um, so let me get that link. And I'm going to be taking care of that while our man Daniel kind of takes over and does whatever he wants to do. I think um, the best thing to do is have him start talking about, um, what is that rapper's name, R&B, uh, the guy who used uh, to R. Pick. Kelly, R. Kelly. R. Kelly. He's a, he's a, yeah, he's an R&B singer. Okay. Yeah, take over. Talk all about him, how he lives in Trump Tower and how... Um, you know, you wonder if he's been urinated on by Donald Trump as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's one of those what if stories because uh, after that interview that uh, Artelli was featured on, when he started uh, screaming and yelling and uh, you know started, he's making all these fake cries. You know, playing the victim in, in other words because. The interviewer, I forgot her name, but he she, he she had just called him out right on time for it, and uh, so um, basically these story these stories about R. Kelly have been going on for years and years. It was just a matter of time until this documentary surviving R. Kelly came out, but the stories have been constantly circulating throughout the hip hop scene. I mean that's that's just been his reputation. He's openly been known about it, you know, by by fans and all that for many years, it's just a matter of time when uh, it just kind of surfaced more on the media. Cool. Yeah, keep going. You're doing great. Yeah. And your own impression. But other than that, mm -hmm. but other than that, uh, the vi videos about him circulating uh, throughout the internet, they actually had been going on through, um, through like uh, those uh, old, uh, those old file search engines like LimeWire back in the day. Uh, yeah, I mean that the, the he's he's been known way back then, you know, for you know for pulling all that stuff, you know, for urinating on uh, underage chicks and all that, and uh, and the fact that uh, he had a private marriage with uh, the the uh, singer and actress Alia, who is uh, dead now, and um, at, well, at at the age of fifteen, yeah. She had married her when she was 15. I forgot how, well, the marriage ended up getting annulled eventually. I forgot how or why, but, uh, well, why, I mean, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's been known, for, he's been known for having a, a, a harem doesn't come close to the description, but whatever it is, uh, he's basically pretty much these poor girls captor, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so he runs a private sex cult in which he's the uh, domin dominator. Uh, so uh, go on, uh, give us some observations about how he's protected by his celebrity and his infrastructure and shit. Uh, well, uh, a lot of it has to do with a lot of with with the the, the um, uh, not just the amount of money that he had, but his power and his leverage. You know, in in the as a celebrity in, in the hip hop music scene. You know, uh, plus, you know, there's also, there's also aspiring recording artists, artists having to kiss up to him and having to, you know, comply with uh, whatever he wants, you know, just so they can get a step up. So, you know, they, they used him for that as a stepping stone as well, you know, but, uh, not, not all, not all the girls did that, but there, it's been known that there have been a few. I can't remember any names, so I don't qualify to name them at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, don't worry about the names. Uh, tell us about, uh, compare him to uh, Michael Jackson and uh, Epstein and all the rest of the scumbags. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well uh, I can say that R. Kelly was the champion when it came to um, raising his voice and raising his volume uh, when it came to playing the victim, you know, which was a complete dead giveaway. You know, but other than that, I think everybody else who have been accused, such as the others that you have named, they've uh, they've managed to do a good job at holding themselves up, even though even though um those that who know that they're guilty know it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and uh, I definitely hear you on that. So uh, hey, keep going, and uh, I mean, you're doing great. Carrie, it's the top of the hour. Thank goodness that you're here. <laughs> well, other than that, previous to all that scandal stuff, I also have a stack of memes, R. Kelly memes. Uh, <laughs> More, more or less, it's having to do with the sexual fetish that he was, uh, you know, reputed for, just, just to just just to kind of mess with people over. But now I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to start learning how to tone them down a little bit, to just to shade them off a bit, or or know which know which right Eric R. Kelly needs to share now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah he that, that guy's one nasty motherfucker. In other words. Yeah. So, no, by the way, I noticed that you uh, had uh, published our uh, uh, conversation that we had prior to going on live at the top of the hour, uh, you know, last time we were on, which was, fuck, it was Wednesday, right? And yeah. uh, And, and I, I noticed that, um, you know, that you've got that on Taboo Bros, too, so everybody can tune into that. My question is, mm-hmm. what, what, what the fuck is that worth tuning into? I can't remember us saying anything before the top of the hour. I mean, th- then, of course, you know, I never remember anything from uh, before the top of the hour because it all kind of escapes me once I start talking. <laughs> so what exactly well, did we talk about? I don't even remember. Well, actually, uh, well, it, was, it was relating to the subject. I mean, it, it, was, it was relevant to the post. I mean, you know, I was, I was telling you about, you know, all the – the shit that people were talking and then you know we just expanded on it later on in the program okay cool yeah. that's, that's great and uh thank you thank you for clarifying that and uh, okay and uh again good thing that we have our man with us he's going to carry on for the next five minutes uh and i'm going to uh, be putting the link up at that time he'll actually take us into the top of the hour yeah. uh so um let me uh let him take over and um so um while you do that my dear brother uh i'm going to put this link up and uh you know these things take time and they are a royal pain in the ass uh so i'm doing this during the last few minutes but I have a lot of reference videos I've got to stick this link into as well. So uh, take over. And um, if you want to, uh, you can bring out what I reference as your silver string coconut and cut loose. Uh, I do know that, um, you, you know, you've worked with um, children who've had um, some developmental impact, uh, autism and the like, and they respond very well to your music. Tell us about why you think that's the case. Mm, well, I'll see. The first time, the first time I volunteered to perform uh, for a group of autistic kids at their school, uh, right after the show, I, I was overheard a few teachers saying, "Oh my God, they actually sat still for for a half hour straight and just watched and paid attention to someone." I was like, "Oh, hey, th- this is cool. I think I can. I think I can uh, do something with this." And uh, every time I uh, volunteered to guest somewhere at some school, you know, for these kids. I mean, the result was the same. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, I would get I get asked about it's like, "Hey, is Daniel coming back in again?" You know, and when they come to when they go to music class and all that. <laughs> oh, and, by the way, I do need uh, to interrupt. I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, we are getting a notice from our executive producer Pavel Edward since we have to know how the stream is doing. Well, we must be being heard because Ramona left a comment about uh, R. Kelly marriage to Alia. So they've got to be hearing us. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can start. Yeah, so go on. Yeah, we're being heard. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so go on, please. Yeah, talk okay, about the kids. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, anyway, these kids, uh, yeah, they they, they uh, somewhat find me interesting in some way or another. It just kind of just kind of went without saying. Uh, they remember my name. They ask about me, you know, which I think is pretty cool. I just I just like to show up and, you know, do a little show for them, and uh, they – they seem to they seem to enjoy they seem to dig it and yeah a lot of them will ask questions and uh, and they are fun to interact with when it when it's uh, when it's in the right place and time to to talk to them where you can actually you know uh-huh. at the same time you get curious enough to want to listen to them you know for some of those small moments that's great that's great you it's really touching uh, I am so impressed. And uh, so uh, just go on, uh, take us into the top of the hour. There's just two more links up to. So his browser died. Um, so what does that mean? It, it, fuck. <laughs> I guess got mm. taken out of the group call. So what does that mean? Does that, uh, does that mean we're still on or we're off? 
that we that we have to call back. Mm, who knows? Uh, yeah, this this is we are on. Okay, so keep going then. So how do I get back into the uh, group call if, if this guy's browser has died? Uh, Pavlo, everything is good and okay. All right. Well, I'm glad that reassurance is there because usually what I have is the ability to get into uh, a kind of a, um, a an overall um, screen that um, has us, and I do not have that. <laughs> so. Uh, oh. Uh, Douglas, uh, yeah. you mean you might you might um you might incidentally hear some background noise because I'm moving around the house. Like uh, if you hear running no water on the back no patio with water fountains at and the dogs. <laughs> okay, so uh, all right, so everything is good. Okay, I've got the that uh, screen back. We are uh, pretty much at. I monitored the last day on the browser. It has nothing to do with Skype. Okay, that's good. So uh, what uh, we're going to do is have you, it's, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, I am going to let people continue to respond with the quality of our audio and how it sounds while I put in a kind of corrective, not a corrective, but an updated uh, content to my uh, shares. And um, I have to do that because um, otherwise people are going to uh, not tune in. Uh, so, uh, I want everyone to know that, uh, that this is what they're hearing. Also, I want people to know that sound is good and perfectly clear for Ramona Halita Henry and her golden star. Uh, it, Havel cannot do this because his browser has died, but I want everyone who can to go to the Douglas Dietrich, uh, personal friends page and share um, especially you, Pavel, because you see it. Now I see Pavel's acknowledged it. Pavel can share, if at all possible, his browser must be on if he can acknowledge it. So uh, share the golden star of Ramona Halita Henry. This will provide on Pavel's timeline a ability for people to follow the thread as it's ongoing. Now, uh, good, and Ramona says she can still hear us, and um, we are officially on, but um, I want everyone to uh, basically listen in on Daniel Arola for several moments, because Daniel Arola is going to take us into the first several minutes of this uh, program as I change the content on uh, my shared post so that people can um, uh, tune into the right place at the right time, so to speak. So, Daniel, take over again. And tell us a little bit about your impression of uh, if the rapper uh, R. Kelly lives in Trump Tower. Do you know if he has any uh, personal uh, connection to uh, Donald Trump uh, in some way? Are they friends? Is he like a Trump supporter, a tr another Trump cultist who says that Trump is cool and all that bullshit? You know, um, <laughs> give us any uh, impression you have about whether or not that's the case. Uh, I... I, I, I only heard it from that from that interview at the end of the interview where uh, where the where the interviewer was talking about uh, well well adding adding more detail to follow up on the story where she just mentioned casually that he lives in the Trump Tower in Chicago and then I just speculated from there but I didn't I I actually didn't bother to you know really look up to confirm anything else but it just did not surprise me one bit I instantly thought about Kanye. And all these other guys, you know, I guess trying to cash in on their same or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, it it does leave more for open speculation because of uh, Trump's alleged, uh, you know, sexual fetishes about being urinated on by Russian prostitutes or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. it gets deeper than that. I'll go into that in this transmission. And uh, because this transmission actually gives me an opportunity to address uh, child molestation in a way that I haven't before uh, because of the Michael Jackson subject, uh, which was uh, essentially directed uh, onto myself by our brother in battle, George Knight. And uh, tell us about the George Knight post and your impression of it uh, concerning leaving Neverland and the kind of conversation you had along with Pavel, who can't unfortunately speak for himself tonight. So we need you to kind of represent Pavel in his interactions. A shout out to Chris Patrick, by the way. I see Chris Patrick just entered in on uh, one of our uh, posts. So a shout out to uh, Chris Patrick, who's been around forever. Good man. And I want you to uh, describe the George Knight post about leaving Neverland, the interaction between Pavel and yourself and George Knight, if you would. Well, actually, I really, I, 
I uh, actually don't really qualify to talk about that since I've never really seen the show. And uh, I, I've seen, you know, a few a few headline articles and other people talking about the, the show and, uh, you know, what they think of Michael Jackson now because of the movie that's coming out. But other than that, I really, I really don't really have much else to add other than the other than uh, bringing up old memories of how I was fond of uh, all the Jackson, Michael Jackson dance moves that I still somewhat remember from back when I used to move. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, I, I really don't know what else to say about it. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, but it, it's still disturbing nonetheless. 